Before the video begins, I'd like to address a personal matter. Please join my Discord, where I regularly share smaller updates throughout the day about my new videos. Thank you, and now enjoy the video. This video falls under the fair use law. The following is a fan summary, for entertainment purpose, only which is not intended to replace the original series, we do not own the anime, manhwa, or any of the artworks all rights reserved to their respective owners, please support the official release of this series, this is for people's enjoyment only. This video is not meant to infringe any of the copyrights. Our story begins with the birth of a little boy who was hanging on his mother's umbilical cord and had golden hair. This little boy wondered where he was and if he was in heaven. When he opened his bright blue eyes, he saw the light of the world for the first time and noticed that it felt quite warm. He quickly closed his eyes again and enjoyed the warmth surrounding him. His mother held him in her arms, cuddling with her newborn son, and gave him the name El. As he continued to sleep in her arms, she expressed her love for him and hoped that he felt safe and secure. However, El's thoughts revolved around where he might be. A few years passed, and our story took a little leap, it was night. And the loving mother had just come home, calling out to her son, but using a diminutive form of his name, Ellie. The house had a blue roof and looked neither too big nor too small from the outside, giving an overall cozy impression. The light from inside the house shone out through the windows, illuminating the surroundings. Elle's mother entered the room, greeting her son with a wave and asking if he had been good and looked after the house while she was away. Elle sighed and told his mother that his name was Elle, and he was not pleased that she kept using the diminutive form of his name. He turned to her and explained that he didn't want to talk to her anymore if she didn't call him by his proper name. His mother was shocked and didn't want to believe it. She knelt down dejectedly and told Elle that she called him Ellie because she found it endearing. Shocked and sad that he yelled at her, Elle approached his mother, touching her shoulder and trying to comfort her. His mother had to hold back tears. Elle told her not to cry and that she could still call him Ellie if she wanted to. Overjoyed, she hugged her son and asked him if he meant it, emphasizing how incredibly sweet he was. After the hug, Elle went to his room, opened the door, and stood in front of a large bookshelf. He realized that whenever he spent time with his mother, he became too relaxed and lost track of time. He found this adaptability frightening and gazed thoughtfully into the distance. L had been living in this world for seven years but didn't know why he was here. He also had memories of his previous life and knew that he was reborn in this new life. In his old life, L had lost his parents at a young age and led a busier life than his peers to pay off the debts they had left behind. He wondered if he would now have the chance to live a more beautiful and peaceful life, now that he was reborn, and he wanted to seize this opportunity. Back then, as a student, he didn't have many opportunities to make money and ensure his survival. His thoughts revolved around odd jobs, and after a while, he had completed all sorts of jobs once. One of them was being a professional gamer. Back then, L didn't want to reveal too much about his private life and used a pseudonym. By winning prize money, he could easily earn some money, and he realized that this was also his best way to make money. It was a beautiful day back then, the sun was shining, and the sky was clear of clouds. One could see a beautiful school building in L's former self, sitting at his desk in school, looking into a book. His former name was Kim Junsung, and he was 19 years old. He wore a headband, had slightly longer dark hair, and was in a school uniform. There were also a few handkerchiefs on the windowsill, which he had brought for whatever reason. As he was jotting down some notes in his book, a young woman appeared before him, and Kim greeted her. The young woman glanced at his notepad, praised him, and said he was truly amazing. She was genuinely impressed and mentioned that the current coursework was quite challenging, but she expected nothing less from the top student in the class. Additionally, she asked if he had changed his headband and complimented him on it, finding it cute. She was curious about where he had bought it and wanted to try it on herself. She desperately tried to strike up a conversation with Kim, but he simply replied with a simple, no, when she asked if she could try it on too. This response nearly brought tears to the eyes of the pretty young woman. 
Kim had not anticipated this reaction and jumped up in surprise, waving his hands, and asked her to wait so he could explain why he said no. Meanwhile, another person was walking behind him, feeling a bit bewildered by the situation. Kim explained to her that there was a reason why he didn't want to give her the headband and looked somewhat sad. Then, the person behind him simply took off his headband, surprising him because he didn't expect someone to remove his headband without asking. Both young women looked at Kim and told him that he looked much better without the headband. Their eyes sparkled, and they both said simultaneously that they needed a moment to think. They realized that Kim looked exactly like Lee Junhook. His pseudonym. While Kim tried to rearrange his hair slightly to maybe get out of this situation, one of the women turned back to the class and asked another girl if she was right, seeking confirmation. But the girl said that he didn't really look like his pro-gamer pseudonym, while one of his male classmates noticed a resemblance. The pretty redhead classmate who had just claimed he didn't look similar then mentioned that she had the same glasses as his pro-gamer pseudonym and asked him to try them on to compare better. Kim did this, and his classmates told him that he couldn't lie to his fans' eyes, and they realized that he and his pseudonym looked remarkably alike. His classmates were astonished and couldn't believe it. Some girls cheered, and a few male classmates recognized that they not only looked similar but were one and the same person, which naturally led to loud chatter in the class. The hearts of his female fans raced with excitement, they could hardly believe that they attended the same school and class as their idol and were surprised to discover that Lee Junhook was hiding behind the persona of Kim Jun sung Subsequently, everyone accompanied him, pestering him by expressing their plans to follow all his games or asking if he would play a game with them. Exhausted, he went to the school rooftop, seeking some peace from the classmates who had gotten on his nerves since they discovered his true identity. He sat down and pondered that he had actually wanted a quiet life and hadn't intended to make his pro-gamer career so public. The reason he wanted to keep his identity secret and become a pro-gamer with a pseudonym was that he wanted to save money quickly and didn't want too much attention. Suddenly, shoes appeared in front of him, and his classmate with yellow hair stood before him, apologizing and saying that it was all her fault, and she hadn't expected the situation with his headband to escalate like that. Kim reassured her that everything was okay and she shouldn't blame herself but rather Mitz Chuller and Miji, who had set the whole event in motion. His classmate asked for something else besides the apology and requested a romantic date with him. Kim was already looking forward to the meal and thought that his life would finally take a turn for the better. He imagined the delicious food in his mind. However, in the end, it was futile, and he got hit by a truck coin. He had fought so hard to survive and lead a happy life and couldn't have foreseen that it would end in such a tragic way. At the end of his life, one thing came to his mind, in his next life, he wanted to be reborn as a wealthy person and lead a happy life. He wondered if his desperate plea had been heard. Not long after his birth, he realized he was reborn in a new world. At the age of four, Bell read the books he found in the library and learned that he was born into a world with a feudal system similar to the Middle Ages. Where there were ranks, classes, and noble titles. Bell sat once again under a tree in a shady spot, reading one of his many books, when his mother looked out of the window and told him to stop and come inside as the food was ready, and he must be hungry. It was another sunny day, and the sun shone on their cozy house. L was fascinated that this world had magicians who could use magic, knights who mastered aura, and priests who wielded the power of divine magic. There were so many fascinating things to discover in this world. However, L believed that the best part of this world in his current life was having a loving mother who cared for him. Moreover, he knew that his mother was a magician who had reached the third level of magic at a young age. L's mother had lost her husband early on, which made her cherish and love her son even more. To meet her expectations, Elle trained diligently. As the magic formulas in this world were similar to mathematics, and he excelled in math in his previous life, he already mastered the second level of magic within seven years. Despite his limited mana, he expected no problem reaching the third level in three years. Looking out of the window, Elle saw his mother receiving a basket of leaves from an older man. 
He knew it was the one day each month when his mother went to the large village to sell risotto tea leaves. His mother knocked on El's bedroom door and informed him that she would be heading to the village. She wondered what he was doing in his room and if he might be asleep. Announcing her entry, she opened the door. El had also prepared himself and expressed his desire to accompany his mother. He wore a white coat and had a small bag with him. El's mother looked at him with her big blue eyes, amazed at how adorable her son was. It took her a moment to realize what El intended, and she shook her head. She didn't want her son to expose himself to such danger. She feared that a dangerous monster might appear on the way to the village and attack her beloved son. In her mind, the image of an orc with red eyes, a pig-like nose, a drooling tongue, white hair, two horns, and long, unkempt fingernails emerged. El felt a bit down as he considered that his mother always had to walk this path alone, and he thought about not having told her yet that he could also use magic. He wanted to learn more about magic quickly and advance to the next magic class. Reaching the fifth class would earn him the title of count appointed by the king, treated accordingly. If he managed to go further and reach the seventh class, he would be considered one of the strongest magicians and could lead a very prosperous life. El's goal was to become the strongest and, above all, the richest magician on the continent and lead a happy life with his mother. But first, he had to start small. He pleaded with his blue eyes and tried to act like a normal little child. He said he could protect her. His mother was deeply moved by his cuteness and had to give in since El was so sweet. However, to be allowed to come along, El had to promise to listen to her and under no circumstances do anything dangerous. El enthusiastically agreed and assured his mother that he would abide by these rules. His mother told him that she would protect him under any circumstances if a dangerous monster were to appear, and he could trust her. Overjoyed to have such a caring mother, he assured her that he had already been doing so and would entrust his life to her. El and his mother walked along a narrow, small path with occasional small stones. The sun was shining. And a forest lay ahead of them. At the end of the horizon, they could already glimpse the mountains. His mother turned to him and asked if he was tired, as several hours had passed since they left the house and set out on their journey. El told her that he was okay and that he had trained hard before, so a little walk didn't bother him. His mother agreed and admitted that he had not only been observing the magicians but had also been diligently training. El explained that aspiring great magicians needed a healthy body and a healthy mind, so one should start training their body rigorously at an early age. His mother realized that those were the same words taught by the Magician Academy about strengthening the physical body. She praised him and told him he was very clever and would definitely become a great magician. On the edge of the path, El picked a flower and showed his mother that they could use it to heal wounds and use it as a medicinal herb. She agreed and praised him again for how smart he was and how proud she was of him. As they continued on their way to the village, they passed by a small place with a bench and a table where they could take a little break and rest. El's mother told him that she had created and placed those benches and the table when she passed by this area before. El was delighted and found this little resting spot truly fantastic. His mother asked him if he liked this place. To which El responded affirmatively. Suddenly, he noticed something and pointed with his finger in a direction. He told his mother that something was there. Three orcs appeared and said they could smell humans and were looking forward to devouring them. El's mother also noticed that the orcs were approaching them and immediately stood protectively in front of El. She was somewhat shocked that three orcs were coming towards them at once. She worried that her son might be overwhelmed and frightened during this first encounter and could potentially be traumatized by it. The orcs stood directly in front of El and his mother, pointing at them. They were already eager for their meal and were hungry as they hadn't eaten for a while. One of them prepared for a fight and twirled his weapon around, creating a small gust of wind. El's mother recoiled slightly and quickly turned to El, intending to eliminate the orc swiftly as she feared El might panic. However, El stood calmly beside her and fearlessly asked if what they were seeing was an orc, comparing them to pigs. 
The orcs were not pleased, instead, they were angry and somewhat bewildered, just like El's mother, who noticed that he remained remarkably calm given the situation. The orcs grew even angrier and screamed through the forest, claiming that they did not look like pigs. In response, El's mother focused on the fight, extending her hands forward and channeling some mana in them. Creating a small flame that quickly grew larger. She agreed with El that there was no reason to be afraid and promised him that the orcs would not come near them. The flame continued to grow, forming into a large fireball. El's mother looked confident and strong, calling forth her magic, saying, Fireball. El was quite amazed when he saw his mother's magic and realized that this fireball spell was a class 3 magic. The fireball grew larger and flew towards the orcs, engulfing them in flames. El's mother couldn't help but laugh when he repeated his son's words about the orcs looking like green pigs. The orcs lay on the ground in pain, realizing that the fire magic was quite terrifying, and they better run away. And so, they promptly fled, running for their lives. El was astonished and praised his mother for being strong and cool. She wanted to hear more compliments from him and asked him to say it again since she didn't quite understand him earlier. He repeated once more that she was a cool and amazing magician. His mother was very happy to receive such a nice compliment and felt a bit embarrassed. While his mother set the food on the wooden table, they continued their well-deserved break. She asked El why he wasn't afraid of the orcs. He explained that they looked like green pigs, and he had no reason to be afraid as they appeared quite funny. His mother explained that the orcs ran away because of the fire magic and their fear of it. She also warned him that there were even scarier monsters out there, so he should continue to be cautious as they moved forward. El listened attentively to his mother's advice but also enjoyed a delicious sandwich she had prepared for him before they left. She also informed him that there might be trolls nearby, known for their great regenerative abilities, making them difficult to defeat. Besides trolls, there were also ogres, rumored to be as strong and sturdy as castle walls. El asked his mother if she could easily defeat these types of monsters, and she confidently confirmed. She provided El with more information, such as the value of troll blood as a valuable potion ingredient due to its regenerative properties. As for ogres, their leather was highly valuable but challenging to obtain due to their strength. El's mind started to picture the potential earnings he could make from these materials. His mother cautioned that these monsters were rare and not easily found. But he should still be cautious. El, still enthusiastic about the money he could potentially earn, assured his mother that he would be careful. She touched her son's nose with a finger and playfully booped it, assuring him that she would always protect him, and he didn't need to be afraid because she would be there for him. She mentioned that their destination was a city called Bankark, and it would take about three more days to get there. She tucked a strand of hair behind her ear and asked if he could hold out that long. El confidently said he could indeed endure it and that she shouldn't worry because he was strong. His mother praised him and thought he was cool. So, the two of them continued on their way towards Bankark. During the night, they made a small fire and told each other stories. During the day, they leaped over obstacles like logs, stones, and rivers, enjoying their mother-son time together. The three days passed quickly, and as the sun rose over the mountains on the horizon, they could already see the city of Bankark from a hill. El and his mother looked down from the hill at the city, and El was glad to have finally arrived. He gazed at the place where he wanted to take his first steps towards becoming a prosperous person. Excitedly, he looked down and beamed with happiness alongside his mother. Together, they entered the city, and for the first time, El felt as if he had been reborn into a different world. In front of him was a small, majestic fountain, and a little further ahead of the fountain stood a larger, round building with white and blue accents and a horse as its emblem. People were bustling all around the city, also appearing genuinely content. El looked around with excitement and couldn't stop marveling at everything. His mother reminded him to look straight ahead while walking and led him in the direction they needed to go. They arrived at a shop with a green roof, similar to their house. The store had a cozy ambience and bore the name, Dival Store. 
Its owner was a blond man with green eyes, coincidentally named Dibel. He looked cheerful, greeted El and his mother, and mentioned that he had been expecting them. El's mother replied that it had been a while and that she was also delighted to see him again. El peeked shyly from behind his mother and formed his first impression of the shop owner. Dibel looked past El's mother and asked who the little man behind her was. She hugged her son and introduced him as her son, her little reliable companion. Furthermore, she showered him with compliments, praising how smart and adorable her son was. El felt a bit uncomfortable being suddenly pulled into her arms. Dibel bent down slightly to get a closer look at El and said he was very pleased to meet him. He also mentioned that he had heard a lot about him and how brilliant he was. Suddenly, something clicked for Dibel as he observed El. Dibel looked into El's eyes and noticed that the color of his eyes was somewhat different from other children his age. Dibel felt as if El's gaze was assessing him and seeing only money. El's mother called Dibel's name, snapping him back to reality as he looked up again. Dibel apologized for being somewhat rude and lost in thought for a moment. He praised El's mother for having such a wonderful son. El's mother put her backpack on the ground and opened it, revealing many small green tea leaves that shone and sparkled, the quality of these leaves was exceptionally good for this time of year. Dibel took the backpack and examined the leaves closely. He remarked that the quality was truly astonishing and that he hadn't expected such high quality. He offered five more gold coins than the last time he bought from her. He also mentioned that currently, nobody else could sell such high-quality leaves as hardly anyone could achieve this level of excellence. El's mother admitted that she actually had no idea about tea leaves but thanked Dibel for his generosity. While El enthusiastically examined the books in Dibel's store, Dibel explained to his mother that nowadays he was more profitable thanks to her. He emphasized that they both benefited from each other and she need not worry if he paid her a little more sometimes. El picked up a book and pretended to read it but continued to observe the interaction between Dibel and his mother. He noticed that Dibel knew exactly how to assess the products he purchased and how to speak with his customers to build a good rapport with them. El also wanted to establish a connection with a store and realized that this store would be perfect for that purpose. His mother said her goodbyes, telling Dibel that she would see him next time. She asked her son, El, to accompany her, and he put away his book, saying he would come along. Dibel sat down in his chair and pondered. He thought about El and his eyes and how he would become a great person in the future. El and his mother continued through the city, and El asked where they were going next. His mother held up a small bag and explained that they were now on their way to the mage tower to sell small mana stones engraved with runes. Mana stones allowed anyone to use magic effortlessly, but these stones could only be used once. Their production was challenging, hence their high price. El immediately thought about how he could simplify the process of creating these mana stones with his improved magic techniques. However, he also had to consider that the materials were very expensive, and he didn't dare to try it himself. While contemplating what he wanted to do next, his mother told him that the mage tower was known for selling grimoires and various other materials. El snapped out of his thoughts and asked his mother if he heard correctly, if he could buy grimoires there in the tower. In the mage tower, it was possible to buy grimoires of higher classes that were not readily available in the village. There were even grimoires of the ninth and tenth class, although no mage on the continent had ever reached the tenth class. El was shocked to hear that there were books of the ninth and even tenth class there. Usually, he wanted to grow up quickly and lead a happy life with his mother, but now his plans had slightly changed. He told his mother that he would like to buy books of the eighth and ninth classes at the mage tower, and his mother began to laugh and praised him for always working so hard. It didn't take long until they arrived at the mage tower in Banzark. The vice master of the tower warmly greeted El's mother and him. The vice master wore several golden rings on his hand and a purple robe. El's mother bowed and greeted him as well, while El wondered who this man might be. The vice master explained that he had been wondering when they would arrive and that he had been expecting them. El's mother handed him an engraved mana stone, 
which the vice master examined closely. He praised El's improved skills and was impressed with the quality of the offered stone. She thanked him for the compliment. El attentively watched the vice master inspecting the stone. When the vice master noticed that El was listening, he asked who the child was, grabbed El by both cheeks, and almost squeezed his face together. He realized that El was his mother's son and understood why he looked so good. El didn't look very happy and didn't want to be touched by the vice master. Finally, the vice master decided to let go of El, introduced his own son, and called him Cedric. Cedric turned around, wearing a small cap and red clothing. The vice master mentioned that Cedric was twelve years old and had already mastered the first level of magic. He was visibly proud of this fact. El's mother also expressed excitement and remarked that it was amazing, as strangers often say to not offend their children. The vice master asked Cedric to demonstrate his magic and use a spell called Energy Ball. Cedric reluctantly performed the spell, but he visibly struggled to conjure something in his hand and had to exert a lot of effort. Nonetheless, El's mother was impressed and said she was looking forward to the future, believing that Cedric had a great destiny ahead. Suddenly, the vice master began making inappropriate advances towards El's mother. He said that if she submitted to him, he could teach her son the same things and that El could achieve the same as Cedric. Of course, she rejected this inappropriate offer. After being turned down, the vice master said she shouldn't take it so seriously and that it was just a joke, like someone does when they face rejection. El became angry that someone was making advances towards his loving mother and couldn't accept her rejection. Originally, El hadn't planned to showcase his abilities until he turned ten years old. But under these circumstances, he couldn't hold back any longer. He declared that he was capable of doing the same thing Cedric had just demonstrated, which surprised everyone and turned their attention to El. Shocked, El's mother, the vice master, and Cedric looked at him. El's mother asked him what he meant by that and urged him not to lie and explain why he would say such a thing. Suddenly, a strong manna gathered around him. He stretched out his hand and cast the same energy bolt spell Cedric had shown earlier. But unlike Cedric, El wasn't as exhausted, and his energy bolt absorbed more and more mana from outside the tower, significantly enhancing his spell, making it larger. In control, El then halted the spell, astonishing the vice master and scaring Cedric. El's mother sat shocked on the floor, unable to believe what she had just seen. She immediately got up, hugged her son, and said he was the best. She asked him when he had learned it and how cool he was, showering him with many compliments. Suddenly, the two of them heard something and fell silent for a moment. Another person opened the room and entered, where all the other participants were present. This person asked loudly who had just cast and demonstrated that magic. The vice master explained that it was the tower master. El was astonished that this old man was the master of the tower. He sensed the incredible amount of mana surrounding the tower master and realized that this was the strength of a seventh class mage. The tower master looked down at El and asked if he was the one who had just cast the magic. He referred to El as an odd little rascal as his eyes were not typical for a child his age. El asked what the tower master meant by that. The tower master explained that a wise man could see the inner self of a person just through their eyes. El pondered over these words, the inner self of a person. Then, the tower master turned to El's mother and asked if she was the one who had brought him. She bowed and confirmed it. The tower master then said he would borrow her son briefly and disappeared with El into another room above the tower. Both sat at a table in the midst of a large library in the master's private chambers. The tower master wanted to get straight to the point and explained that the magic El had just cast corresponded to the first class. However, he also recognized that El's mana response was at higher classes. Furthermore, he noticed that the casting time was extremely short and asked how El had achieved it. The Tower Master explained that the seventh class of magic was comparable to a swordsman but had to admit that magic during a battlefield fight was limited. El listened intently, and the Master continued, 
explaining that mages would be helpless and quickly die if a knight was fast enough. Then he asked El if he would reveal his method to possibly prevent this. El grinned and asked the master if he thought he was an idiot. Laughing, he asked him if he would simply divulge such a significant secret technique he possessed without getting something in return. The master stroked his long beard and said that El was a cheeky child but considered what an appropriate payment might be. El folded his hands in front of his face and asked eagerly if the master had already thought of something he might like. The tower master told him that he would give him 10,000 gold pieces, which should be enough for even his descendants to live on. However, El didn't want such a large sum as he currently didn't need it. Instead, he wished for help here and there and, therefore, declined the tower master's offer. He said that he would prefer books of the 8th and 9th class and also a few mana stones. As that would be sufficient for him. The tower master was surprised that the mana stones would suffice and asked if El was serious. El confirmed this and explained that this was what he needed the most at the moment. The master considered what El could be planning to do with the mana stones, and while he didn't know exactly, he recognized that there must be a reason for it. Therefore, he agreed and prepared 100 mana stones along with the books. They shook hands and confirmed the deal with each other. El thanked him with a smile and affectionately called the tower master, Grandpa. He was a little surprised and called El a clever fox as a large amount of mana swirled around them. The tower master wondered why it was so difficult to deal with a young child who was only seven years old and noted that it felt more like he was talking to a great mage. El looked up at the tower master, listened to him, and couldn't help but laugh when he said he was talking to a great mage. El placed a finger on his lips and asked the tower master to keep everything he had seen today a secret. When El and his mother returned home, she asked him where he had learned that magic and how he had learned to cast it so quickly. El explained that he had learned the magic using magic books at home and, additionally, through mana response training. He had also developed his own formula to cast spells faster. In his previous life, he had used the time after work, when he was supposed to sleep, to study because he didn't just want to go to a good college but to lead a better life. Of all the things he had studied back then, he had enjoyed mathematics the most because it was something concrete, and he found joy in solving difficult problems and feeling satisfaction afterward. However, magic formulas were much more challenging than math problems. At that time, he had been able to reduce the casting time with the acquired knowledge. But since he couldn't teach his mother earth mathematics, he had to teach her a modified method that was still very effective. She was amazed at how quickly the spell casting time could be reduced without losing strength. El's mother hugged him and asked him to teach her even more so she could become an excellent magician. Thus, two more years passed, and his mother became a fourth-class magician. They had also moved closer to the magician tower in Banzark. One day, as they were heading to the magician tower as usual, they had an unusual encounter. They saw a group of people in black robes, leading two girls on chains. One of the girls had white hair, and the other had red hair. They overheard one of them saying that today was a good day because they had captured two at once. Both girls wore metal collars around their necks with chains attached. One of the men, holding one of the chains, became impatient and struck the white-haired girl. Suddenly, a stone flew from behind and hit the man who had just tried to hit the young white-haired girl on the back of the head. Angrily, El and his mother stood there, and El asked what they planned to do and ordered them to stop immediately. The men in the robes asked who they were and told them to stop interfering in their work. However, El's mother was not one to simply walk away after witnessing something like that. Both girls wore simple brown garments, and the red-haired girl looked desperate as she touched the white-haired girl lying on the ground and anxiously checked on her condition, tears in her eyes. El's mother gently touched his shoulder and asked him to move aside for a moment. She realized that words wouldn't help in such a situation and cast her fireball spell. This made El happy, so he supported his mother and also fired his energy bolt, which drove the men in black robes away. They freed the two girls and asked if they were okay. El's mother couldn't understand why someone would do such a thing. 
L reached out his hand to the two girls lying on the ground and assured them that everything would be fine now. The girls looked at L's hand in disbelief and couldn't believe their luck. Tears filled their eyes, and they grabbed L's hand. At first, they wanted to find their families, but when L and his mother learned that the two had nowhere to go back to, they decided to take them in. And so, the rest of the two years passed, and the everyday life with L, his two new sisters, and his mother settled into a regular routine. The sun rose, and their new house glowed in the morning sun rays. L was still comfortably asleep in his bed. Over the past years, his hair had grown a bit longer, and the sun rays from outside streamed into his room, gently touching his face. The door to his room opened, and the white-haired girl they had adopted quietly entered the room, calling his name to check if he was awake. She raised her hands and conjured a small golden bird on her palms with her magic, lovingly urging Elle to get up. The golden bird then took flight in the air, slowly soaring higher through Elle's room. Leaving behind its warm feathers. The feathers gently brushed Elle, and he slowly woke up, cocooned in the warm sun rays and the warmth of the golden bird. Elle sat up, stretching and yawning, fully waking up. He noticed that his white-haired sister Serena was also in the room, having woken him up. He praised her for her impressive progress in magic in such a short time, particularly admiring her recent wind magic spell. He asked her if she wasn't exhausted from spending the whole day observing and learning magic from him. Serena explained that it had been challenging at first, but once she realized that magic was enjoyable and she took pleasure in learning new spells, it became much easier and less tiring. Especially now that she had found a rhythm. Serena then turned around and suggested that L should come downstairs. L agreed and made his way downstairs. Serena was already waiting with a tray and a cup in hand. L looked around and asked about his other adopted sister, Kana, and if she was outside again. Serena confirmed that Kana was indeed outside and had been going out in the mornings lately. A few minutes later, the front door opened, and Kana stood in the entryway, holding a sword in her hand, peering into the cozy home. She asked her new brother L if he had slept well, to which he wished her a good morning and praised her incredible patience and endurance during their sword training. Kana looked down at her sword and explained that she had done just that because she felt that the more she swung her sword, the better she would become and the more progress she would make. Moreover, she thoroughly enjoyed the training. She took up a combat position and suggested that they could have a practice fight to personally demonstrate her progress. However, L explained that he would rather see it next time when they were outside and not fight inside the house. L, Serena, and Kana were all of a similar age, with L being the oldest, and Serena two years younger. They had been isolated from the outside world from a very young age, making it challenging for L and his mother to teach them everything. Nonetheless, they had succeeded, and now both Serena and Kana had their lives well under control, having adapted well to their current life. L had mainly tutored the two of them. Serena possessed a great talent in magic and had already reached the first class. Kana, on the other hand, showed exceptional talent in athletics and was primarily taught swordsmanship. The result of their diverse training was that they complemented each other, balancing their strengths and weaknesses. As L looked at the two of them, he felt immensely proud of their rapid and positive development and of what he had taught them in such a short time. Suddenly, L's mother appeared and greeted her children with a cheerful, good morning. Her good mood was evident. As she passed by L, humming happily, he realized that something special must have happened. She turned around and asked her son if it wasn't obvious to him, showing him the peace sign with great pride and explaining that she had mastered the fifth level of magic yesterday. L was astonished and happy for his mother. And Serena and Kana also congratulated their new mother, addressing her directly as, Mother. L's mother was deeply moved by this and thanked everyone for their well wishes. L contemplated how to appropriately celebrate this event, and all three women looked at him inquisitively. However, he already had an idea and turned around. The evening gradually approached its end, and the sunset bathed the entire city of Bangkok in a beautiful violet light. 
even the mage tower glowed in the lilac brilliance of the sunset. The old tower master was astonished by El's appearance and how much he had grown in the last two years. He noticed that it had been impolite and made him appear unsympathetic that El had only reappeared now. While El's mother and sisters were still climbing through a portal, El explained that he had come personally to him for this reason. He also asked the tower master if it was true that he had defeated a sword master in combat, and he realized that the tower master was continually becoming stronger. The tower master confirmed this and invited El and his companions to take a seat at the table. El took one of the chairs, while his mother stood behind him and asked her own son why they were suddenly going to the mage tower and if there was a reason for it. The tower master was also curious and asked El why he had come so unexpectedly. El explained that he wanted to show his new innovation and poured a few red magic stones from his bag onto the table each of which had a small magical inscription. The tower master took one of these stones, which at first glance looked like ordinary mana stones, but he recognized that they were actually magic stones, one of the most challenging things to find on the entire continent. Furthermore, he realized that this meant that El was the inventor of these stones. A magic stone held almost as much mana as a high-ranking mana stone. However, the difference lay in the fact that these magic stones could be easily recharged within three days after being used once, and they could be used ten times. In contrast, conventional mana stones had to wait for several years before they could be used again. The Tower Master also explained that many people from other mage towers were sent, which had resulted in recent reports of unusual individuals lurking around El's new house. El's mother asked her son if it was true, to which he confirmed that it was, but fortunately, those people hadn't dared to take further action. Additionally, El thought that these stones would also interest the Tower Master. The Tower Master's eyes widened briefly, but then he realized that El was still a child, even though he behaved like an adult, and he asked what El wanted. El raised his hand and said that he had four things he wanted in exchange for handing over the production and sales rights of the magic stones to the mage tower. Firstly, he wanted to ensure the safety of him and his family. This would be easy since other major term would learn that this tower held the rights, causing those people lurking around their house to simply give up and disappear. The tower master agreed and recognized that he was probably right. Secondly, El wanted sword and magic books thinking about his two sisters and how excellent they were and how they needed new books. The tower master also agreed to this and told them that he had countless books, so they could take whatever they wanted. He asked what other conditions El had in mind. El told him that he wanted the tower master to show him a good inn, which puzzled the tower master. El explained that his mother had reached the fifth level of magic, and he wanted to celebrate that. The fact that El wanted to see a good inn and gave up one of the conditions he could have had for the magic stones astonished his family. Furthermore, he expressed his wish to have a luxurious vacation with his family, without anyone else accompanying them. His mother was moved to tears and embraced him, calling him such a good son and thanking him. His sisters also joined in the hug, and El realized that he wanted to protect this place, whatever might happen. The tower master reluctantly interrupted the heartfelt hug of the family but was curious about the fourth condition L wanted. L became more serious and squinted his eyes. He said that he wanted a book that contained instructions to create a golem, essentially a golem-making book. The tower master repeated L's words, shocked, and asked him why he would need a golem and if he didn't know that even with a blueprint, he couldn't create one. El just chuckled at these two questions and said that he was merely interested. In reality, he had a different purpose for needing a golem. For more years passed. The moon shone in the sky, and it was another clear, starry night. Two male figures stood in front of El's house, knowing that it belonged to the inventor of the magic stones. They explored the surroundings and discovered that there were no magic traps set around the house. They thought that the residents of this house in the city of Bankark, along with their magic tower, were perhaps too trusting and had neglected their defenses. They hid behind a narrow hedge and discussed their further plans. One of the men initially believed that the mission would be difficult, 
as they were supposed to capture the inhabitants alive and unharmed. However, now that they had observed no defensive spells, he thought it would be a straightforward task. The other man asked what would happen if the residents resisted. In response, his comrade drew his sword, making it clear that it wouldn't end well in such a case. He stated that he would kill them all like assassins, regardless of the mission's objective, and his face bore an intense warning expression. Suddenly, L appeared before them, stating that it was a good idea, leaving the two observers shocked. Before they could react, they noticed something behind them and turned around. They saw several armored golems already surrounding them. Panicked, one of the attackers jumped up and screamed, attacking one of the golems with his sword. The golem remained unfazed, and the sword shattered into smaller pieces upon impact. The man looked down at his broken blade, realizing he was in a hopeless situation. His friend also observed the failed attack and recognized the dire circumstances. In desperation, one of the attackers fell to his knees, and both wondered how such an overwhelming defense force in the form of these combat golems could be standing in their way. The golems took care of the attackers, removing their bodies from the house. L praised the golems for their performance and watched as one of them carried the bodies away. He then turned to the other two and realized that his golems, even in their unfinished state, were relatively strong and agile. He briefly remembered when he had requested the golem-making book from the tower master in the past, retreating to the workshop to focus entirely on golem production. He also recognized that these golems were more suitable for defense and could already handle individual tasks well, but seeing the blood on the floor made him aware that they were still a bit far from perfection. L raised his hand and performed some magic, creating a blue magic circle around him, lifting and vanishing the blood on the floor. He shook his hand slightly, stating that it should be enough, as he didn't want his mother or his sisters to notice anything. His sister was busy preparing some eggs in the pan. Getting breakfast ready. She greeted Elle, who thanked her for making breakfast. As Elle leaned on the counter, Serena said it was no problem and that she enjoyed cooking. Kena also greeted them, and both Elle and Serena turned to look at her. They greeted her too and asked if she had just returned from training. Kena, just like four years ago, got ready for a fight, grasping her sword and asking if L wanted to see her progress. He said he would like to see it later, but it wasn't the right time now. L was glad that both of them hadn't changed over the years, but he looked around, wondering where his mother was. Suddenly, he and Serena noticed something. L's mother lifted a small flame in one of her hands and then raised another hand, transforming the small flame into a larger fireball. She realized the fire was getting out of control and tried to regain control before it disappeared. However, she couldn't manage it, and the fireball returned to its initial small flame, causing her to fall to the ground from exhaustion. Suddenly, L's mother heard L's voice, and she was somewhat surprised by where it was coming from. She looked up and recognized her children standing before her, informing her that breakfast was ready and that they wanted to have breakfast together. Elle's mother apologized and said she wanted to do some more training first. However, Elle told her that, despite the training, she needed to pay attention to eating properly to become stronger and avoid overworking herself. He also praised her, saying she was incredible. However, Elle's mother disagreed, stating it wasn't true and expressing her desire to quickly rise to the level of a sixth-class mage. When Elle told her she didn't have to work so hard, she turned around, interrupted him, and tearfully insisted that she had to. Elle was shocked and wondered why his mother suddenly acted this way. He realized that his mother wasn't behaving normally and wondered if something had happened. He recalled a technique he had used in his previous life to increase his focus. Although he had intended to keep it hidden from his mother and sisters, he realized he couldn't do so any longer. He told his family, who looked puzzled, that he would show them the hypogastric breathing technique. Elle explained the hypogastric breathing technique to his family, instructing them to concentrate on a pressure point a few inches below their navel. They were to inhale through their nose and exhale all the air in their body through their mouth. 
By mastering this technique, they could gather their energy at a single point and increase their strength. The three women tried the technique immediately, synchronizing their breathing. Serena turned red and had to stop first, saying she couldn't breathe under these circumstances. Elle advised her not to overdo it and take it slowly by breathing calmly and steadily. Kana followed next but also had to give up. Holding her stomach and saying her abdominal muscles were cramping permanently. Elle corrected her mistake, stating that she was breathing too forcefully and using too much force. Both of them lay exhausted on the floor after completing the breathing training. Serena said that she usually didn't pay much attention to her breathing and admitted that this method was very challenging to learn. Kana agreed with her, stating that the human body and its techniques were a mystery to her, and this technique was also difficult to master. Elle's mother was still standing there, breathing calmly in and out. A bright blue manna surrounded her. Elle, Serena, and Kana looked at their mother in astonishment. Fascinated that she still had an incredible focus. L realized that nearby Mana was gathering around his mother, and she felt her senses improving. She, too, could feel the Mana slowly enveloping her, and her magic kept growing stronger. It was something she had never felt before. Suddenly, she thought about how her son, L, had discovered and developed all of this on his own, without the help of others. It reaffirmed her belief that he was a genius. That's why she wanted to become stronger, to create a better environment for Elle and return to a specific place that looked like a large, beautiful estate. Elle's mother suddenly opened her eyes, and the mana now gathered even more around her. It flowed slowly into her body, giving her an incredible strength unlike before. She raised her hand again and tried once more. This time, she started with a small flame, but it was much more powerful than her first attempt. She intensified the flame and effortlessly controlled a massive fireball with just one hand. Elle and his sisters continued to watch their mother's experiments, and when she transformed the fireball into various animal forms, they were even more amazed. They congratulated their mother. Serena told her that she could feel her mana had become stronger and that she had accomplished an incredible transformation. She wiped the tears from her face and said that she could definitely reach the sixth class now. She thanked her children, explaining that she had made these advancements thanks to them. L was happy to see his mother smile again and look happy. He wondered if he could find another clue to help his mother reach the next level. However, for his main goal, he needed to figure out how to awaken a night golem. His mind was filled with thoughts of how to achieve this goal. He wondered if he had recognized and not ignored the change in his mother earlier, and if he had been attentive and communicated with her back then, whether it would have been possible to continue living peacefully. As El got lost in these thoughts, he saw the faces of his sisters Serena, Kana, and his weeping mother. His sisters embraced their mother, while El stood apart, deep in thought. His mother apologized to her children for holding them up all morning and only now could they eat together. Kana reassured her that it was okay and she shouldn't dwell on it. Serena also told her it was fine and what mattered more was how amazing it was that she had advanced a class. Elle's mother had tears in her eyes as she expressed her gratitude for her children being so kind and understanding. However, she couldn't help but wonder why her biological son, L, finished his meal and immediately retreated to his room, leaving her alone. She felt sad that L spent all his time locked in his research lab, working alone, and she couldn't even say anything about it. Serena and Kana didn't know what to say to their mother. L sat alone in his research lab, surrounded by several books and papers. He held his head in his hand, visibly pondering the fact that creating the continent's strongest golem wasn't as easy as he thought. He knew he wanted to create a golem capable of independent thinking and action. To do this, he needed to create an ego, but that wasn't an easy task. Thought magic was on the eighth level of a mage's skill, and it was known to be one of the most challenging magic arts. L lay back on the floor and held a book in his hand. He understood the knowledge theoretically but couldn't apply it practically, even though he was now a sixth-class mage. He wondered if it would work once he reached the seventh class. 
but he knew that wouldn't happen any time soon. If he couldn't attain the enlightenment of the seventh class, he couldn't master it either. So he asked himself how he could achieve this enlightenment. He remembered when his mother had used hypogastric breath for the first time and created a fireball from it. He wondered if he had missed something important during his own development that could support him in this process. Suddenly, his sister entered his room and apologized for disturbing him while he was so focused. However, she reminded L that it was time for him to oversee her training and asked if he could come. L quickly stood up and said he would come right away to monitor her training. As he walked to the door with her, he asked if that was what she had asked him about earlier, as she was having some problems. Serena confirmed it and explained that she was currently struggling with the basics, apologizing for needing his help with something so simple. She told L that she didn't understand the nature of mana, which puzzled him. He asked her if she could feel the mana, how it reacted, and how it permeated her entire body. Serena said that she did feel something similar, but it wasn't her main concern. She wasn't sure how to explain it properly. She placed her hand on her body and tried to explain to Elle that she meant more the temperament of the mana. She sensed a variety of different types of mana that seemed to blend together within her. And she couldn't decipher their differences, let alone their powers and characteristics. She wondered if Elle could possibly help her understand what she was feeling. L was amazed as he listened to his sister's description. He too began to wonder about the nature of mana and its properties. He asked, mana properties, while contemplating Serena's feelings and whether he had ever experienced something similar. L turned around and went to a small box on his desk, rummaging through it until a few blue mana stones spilled out. He placed one of his hands over the stones, closed his eyes, and used some of his magic. He noticed that each stone had distinct properties, not just one or two. But every single one had its own set of qualities that mixed together to form a type of mana. Excitedly, he looked up and wondered how he could have overlooked something so fundamental, considering that mana had various attributes. He moved his hand to his body, eager to learn more and experiment. He once again channeled his magic, and when he opened his eyes, he was utterly amazed. He saw a starry sea-like landscape in his mind. He recalled a revelation he had in a game he played in his past life, where understanding the properties of each unit during a raid was crucial. By grasping these attributes, he could utilize their strengths perfectly, creating powerful combinations with other traits. It had been his specialty at the time. He realized that the same principle applied to mana as it did to the units in that game. He recognized that he should be capable of crafting potent magic depending on how he combined the individual properties. Lost in thought and completely ignoring his sister, he mumbled to himself that he needed to try it out immediately. Serena was somewhat puzzled and wondered what he meant by that. L extended his hand again and once more channeled his magic. A magical circle appeared beneath his hand, and the mana stones began to levitate, emitting a soft glow corresponding to their attributes. Slowly, the different properties of the mana stones started to attract one another. And they converged at a single point. Now, L raised his other hand, intending to merge the mana stones together. However, it proved more challenging than he anticipated, and he visibly strained to maintain control. He realized that if he continued in this manner, the uncontrolled power of his unfinished spell would rebound on him. He needed to calm himself and apply hypogastric breath to regain control. L knew that reaching the seventh grade wouldn't be easy, but he was determined to give his best for his ultimate goal and would put forth everything in his attempt to achieve it. Suddenly, his spell broke, and the mana crystals floated aimlessly. L collapsed to the ground and was momentarily knocked out. When he opened his eyes again, he saw Serena's small golden bird. Reflexively, he slowly reached out to catch it. Serena repeatedly called her brother's name, hoping he would wake up. Eventually, L opened his eyes and saw his sister's tearful face above him, asking if he was all right. Rubbing his face to clear his head, he asked why he was lying on the ground. She explained that the wind had gathered around him, causing him to collapse. 
She had been very worried as he was lying motionless and unresponsive. Serena asked again if he was really okay. L had fully regained his composure and assured her that everything was all right. He informed her of the more important news that, thanks to her help, he had managed to become a seventh-grade mage. Only because she made him aware of feeling different types of mana, he was able to combine them to fill in the missing piece. L thanked his sister. Serena looked at her brother with fascination, unable to believe that his class had increased because of her seemingly trivial question. She had to admit that her brother was truly remarkable and worked very hard. L already had the next book in hand and was reading again. Serena approached him once more, curious about what level of magic he had mastered. As she looked into his eyes, she felt a magical power from him that was even greater than their mother's. L asked her to keep it as a secret and not tell anyone about what she could feel. Without revealing the exact class. Serena understood that it must be about a pretty high class, which astonished her even more. Now that L had reached the seventh grade, he knew he could proceed with his plans to create a golem that could think and act independently. He was now much closer to achieving his goal of creating the strongest knight golem on the continent. L's mother sat on a small rock on the hill in front of their house, looking down at her home. She brushed a strand of hair from her face and realized it was a beautiful and peaceful spot where they had spent some lovely times together. However, she couldn't help but think that they might have to leave this place soon. She held a small pendant in her hand and looked at a picture inside it. With tears in her eyes, she addressed the image of her husband, Riyan, in the locket, asking him to continue watching over their son, L, as he would soon turn seventeen, and she had to make a decision for him. Fully focused, L was carefully portioning something, sprinkling smaller particles from his hand. Serena watched the whole spectacle, holding her breath in anticipation. She was also curious to see if L could execute his plan perfectly. Suddenly, he called out that he was done and proudly presented his perfectly salted soup, simmering away in a black pot. The steam rose beautifully, and its aroma spread evenly and gently throughout the room. Serena expressed her excitement, saying that the soup L had cooked looked really good, and she couldn't wait to try it. Serena, Kana, and L's mother sat at their table, enjoying the soup L had prepared for them, with L's seat being the only one empty. L's mother was also delighted with the soup her son had prepared and complimented him on the taste. She also asked if there was anything he wasn't the best at. Kana was equally thrilled and wore a very contented expression as she focused entirely on the food. L's mother turned to him, and he turned back to her, even though he was in the midst of preparing another dish for his family. His mother told him that she actually wanted to cook something for him on his seventeenth birthday. L, still preparing his dish, replied that it was okay. He really enjoyed cooking and had fun doing it. In his previous life, he had to take care of himself and cook alone for ten years, so it was a change of pace to cook for someone else. Which could be enjoyable at times. Besides, it made his loving mother very happy, which was another reason why he did it. He looked genuinely happy as he told his family that the new dish was ready, and they should try it. It was fried rice with egg, beautifully presented. L had to pause for a moment because it wasn't easy to prepare kimchi fried rice in that place. He had to search everywhere for rice, cabbage, and the right spices, but once he found everything, he used some of his magic to create the kimchi in all its glory. L wondered how his sisters and his mother would react to his home-cooked meal and turned to them to see their reaction. Everyone was delighted, with smiles on their faces as they enjoyed the dish. L was also thrilled and happy that his home-cooked meal was so well received by his new family, and he cheered in response. Even though it was a bit spicy and hot, his family couldn't stop eating and wanted seconds. Once everyone was finished, L set about washing the used plates until they sparkled. He looked at the clean dishes in the sunlight streaming through the window above the sink and realized that it was a truly wonderful feeling that everyone enjoyed his food and had fun eating it. Suddenly, L's mother stood behind him and told him that she needed to discuss something important with him. L turned around, 
shocked, and noticed that his mother had a serious expression. He wondered what it could be that she wanted from him. He said he would listen to her and followed her into her room. L stood by the window while his mother sat on a chair. The atmosphere in the room was heavy, not as cheerful and affectionate as usual in their house. L looked up, wondering why his mother wasn't saying anything. He wondered if it was about a difficult topic and she needed time to gather herself before addressing it. He gazed at his sad, silent mother, and a thought crossed his mind that she might know about something he had done back then and wouldn't approve of it. However, he quickly dismissed the idea, knowing that couldn't be the case. L's mother clenched her fists and confessed that she had been keeping something hidden from him. She continued, revealing that it was about her past and his father. Now that he was old enough, she wanted to tell him the whole truth. With courage, she explained that she was actually the daughter of the Marquis Einhardt family from the Blyard Kingdom, and her full name was Silfer von Einhardt. This news astonished L, and his facial expression showed a shocked reaction. He couldn't believe he had just heard the words, Blyard Kingdom, and Einhardt. Among the hundreds of nations on the continent, the Blyard Kingdom was one of the five strongest nations. Moreover, the Marquis Einhardt family was a family of magicians that produced countless excellent mages. The head of the family, Marquis Einhardt, was almost reaching the eighth grade, while his son, an expert of the seventh grade, also held power over the kingdom. L knew this family was a true elite family. L stood at the open window, looking at his mother's pendant. He had to admit that he had been wondering where she got it all this time. It was an artifact that only magicians of the seventh grade or higher could create. Moreover, all the books in this house were very difficult to obtain unless one was an aristocrat or a mage from a renowned family. L's mother continued her story, revealing that she lost her mother just four days after her birth and was raised by her much older brother and strict father. She also explained that she was promised to the prince of the Blyard Kingdom at the age of seven. But all she wanted was freedom, she didn't want to be restricted by anything. She just wanted to live as she had always wished. At that time, she met Rian Luvius and fell in love with him. Rian was a magician for her family, though not particularly outstanding or handsome. Still, he was someone who gave her hope and made her dream of freedom. Rian also told her back then that she should have more confidence in herself. Normally, Silfer was supposed to marry the prince once she reached the age of sixteen. However, she chose to run away with her new lover, Riyan, and finally follow her dreams and be free. Even when they were pursued by her family during their escape, they were happy as long as they were together. They led a simple life but were captured by her family relatively quickly within a year, and Silfer ended up in a small, uncomfortable cell. She sat huddled on a small bench inside the cell and was deeply unhappy about her current situation. Her father visited her then, looked at the untouched food, and asked his daughter how long she planned to stay like this. Furthermore, he asked her if she loved Riyan so much that she would lead such a life for him, imprisoned like a rat in a small cage. Silfer looked at her father disdainfully and demanded that he should set her beloved Riyan free, otherwise, she would want to take her own life. Her father just grinned and said that she was just as stubborn as he was. Being his daughter. With sarcasm and irony, he remarked on what a perfect couple his daughter and Riyan would make. He also told her that Riyan worried about her just as much as she worried about him. Meanwhile, Riyan was in a much worse condition than Silfer. He was chained to a wall and couldn't even take a few steps. Moreover, he was wearing only old, tattered, dirty rags and looked visibly exhausted from standing for so long. However, the only thing on his mind was Silfer, and he kept asking if she was okay. Her father wasn't entirely sure and asked if they always thought of each other like this. Then he revealed that he planned to let her friend go. This surprising turn of events astonished Silfer. Her father said that she was still a part of his precious family, after all. Silfer believed her father and looked at him with shining eyes, as if he were a knight in shining armor, and she had hope again that she would be reunited with her friend Riyan. Shortly after, 
two guards brought Rian to the garden of her family's estate, and there was a touching reunion between the two. Silpha ran to her friend immediately, and they couldn't believe they were seeing each other again. Silpha apologized to him for the situation he had gotten into because of her and asked how Rian was doing. He said he was doing all right but questioned whether he heard correctly that she would stay here because of him. Rian didn't like that and remarked that it sounded like she was being held hostage. Silfer put a finger to his lips, silencing him. She said that thanks to his help, she could live a free life, and even if that freedom was only temporary, she confessed that she had been truly happy with him. With tears in her eyes, she pleaded with her beloved Rian to leave this place and live a happy life because she didn't have the confidence to live in a world where he didn't exist. Rian was moved by Silfer's words and looked at her affectionately. He gently placed his forehead against hers, and both of their tears ran down their cheeks, shining like stars in the night sky. Rian told her that even if they were to part, they should be forever connected no matter what happens. Suddenly, a sword swung down and beheaded Rian right in front of Silfer's eyes. Completely in shock, Silfer stood there and couldn't immediately comprehend what had just happened. Blood splattered everywhere, and a few drops landed on her face and clothes. Stuttering, she stood before Rian's lifeless body lying on the ground as one of the guards who had led him to the garden held his bloodied sword. Her father told her that he had kept his promise and had put Rian out of his misery, while the guard aimed his blade at Silfer. He went on to say that he even showed the magnanimity to let Rian say goodbye before executing him. Such was his love for his daughter. Silfer was still in shock and didn't know which way was up or down, she simply stood there. Amid her father's screams, Silfer fell to the ground, covering her ears to minimize the noise, and wept for her beloved Rian. She explained that the reason for all this was that Marquis Einhardt never forgave them for running away together, breaking off the engagement with the prince, and bringing shame upon the family. L had to process all of this and couldn't stop marveling at the revelations. With eyes wide open, he still stood by the window, looking down at his loving mother. She continued to explain that she was excommunicated from her family, but to preserve the family's reputation. Her father allowed her to live here and told her to return once she had mastered the sixth grade of magic. The warm sun shone through the small window behind El as he listened to his mother. She said that after Rian's death, she initially thought of ending her life here but then realized she was pregnant with his child. This shocked him once again. His mother went on to say that this was the greatest joy she had felt in a long time and that she wanted to do everything to make her beloved son happy. She wanted to give her son all the good things in the world, and that was what she wanted to live for. With a very determined look in her eyes, she told Elle that she intended to reclaim the name Einhardt. Elle was once again a little surprised but didn't say a word. His mother stood up from her chair and explained that she had now mastered the sixth grade and that her family would take her back. She extended her hand to Elle and continued to explain that the Einhardt family estate was the best place to learn everything about magic and that she could provide him with a better learning environment there. She asked him to come home with her. Elle didn't know what to say and was still completely in shock. It took a moment before Elle asked his mother why she wanted to go back to her terrible family. He told her that she could stay here as she was a sixth grade master of magic and could receive a title. He asked her again why she wanted to return to the Einhardt family. Clearly, Elle didn't understand why she was so eager to go back to her terrible family. His mother then explained that aristocrats here in this nation were treated somewhat differently, but the Blyard Kingdom was the strongest nation on the continent, and the Einhardt family was on a similar level to the royal family. Moreover, she told her son, as she clenched her fist resolutely, that she wanted to make sure he could reach his full potential and that she could provide him with the best possible environment. She looked at El more self-assured than ever and asked him to think about her decision. El had to consider it for a moment. Then calmly exhaled and said with a smile on his face that he would accompany her. This visibly pleased El's mother, and her face lit up as she looked at her son with her blue eyes and heard his decision to accompany her. 
Silver embraced her son and told him that she loved him very much, to which L replied that he loved her very much too. He also said that he would need to get ready to prepare his things to leave. L opened the door to the hallway and left his mother's room. Suddenly, he looked to his left and saw his two sisters, Serena and Kana, standing there. Both looked anxious and unhappy. Serena spoke with a trembling voice, apologizing that they didn't mean to eavesdrop. But they overheard something. As the midday sun shone through the hallway window, illuminating the space, Serena and her sister Kana hesitantly asked Elle what would happen to them now. Serena fought back tears as Kana tried to comfort her, gently touching her arm. Serena questioned whether they were technically still slaves and if they went to the Einhardt family, they could no longer be with them. L, however, wasn't concerned about that and was relieved that the issue his sisters brought up was only about this matter and not a bigger problem he had to solve on the side. He assured them that they were a family, and that meant they would be together forever. This surprised his sisters. As they had never experienced such love in their lives before. L told them that he would think of a few ideas to give them new identities. He had already come up with a couple of options, such as registering Serena and Kana as traitors or mercenaries. He told them not to worry and not to hang their heads low. This made Serena and Kana very happy, and with tears of joy in their eyes, the two sisters gratefully thanked their brother for being willing to do so much for them and that they wouldn't have to part from their loving new family. L told them that he needed to visit someone, and his mother shouldn't know about it. However, they should start packing their things and prepare for departure. His sisters agreed and promised not to tell their mother about L's visit to a place she shouldn't know about. L turned around and left with a happy expression, which he put on for the sake of his sisters. He left the house and realized that he couldn't change his mother's mind. So, he understood that there was only one thing he could do. With a determined look in his eyes, signifying that L had also made a decision, he went to Dybul's shop. Dybul greeted L, saying it had been a while since they last saw each other. Dybul extended his hand and asked L to take a seat at a table. Once they were both sitting at the table, Dybul thanked L for the rights to sell his magic stones. Explaining that his business was flourishing thanks to these stones. L said that he had come to ask him a favor today. He assumed that Dybul would know, given that he ran a business and had access to an excellent network of information. Dybul said that this was definitely the case and explained to L that he had some partnerships with information guilds that spanned across the continent. If L wanted, he could even tell him about the royal secret treasures and riches. However, when L expressed his interest in knowing everything about the Marquis Einhardt family from the Blyard Kingdom, Dybul was shocked. He looked at L and wondered what had suddenly changed the atmosphere. L appeared completely serious and focused. Unlike anything Dybul had seen before. Dybul had to swallow hard as he realized how serious the situation was and how important this one question was to L. He began to tell him about the Marquis Einhardt family. The Marquis Einhardt family had a history of over 700 years and was one of the most prestigious families in the kingdom. They produced three eighth-class magicians and had hundreds of magicians connected to the family in some way. The Marquis wielded considerable influence and could easily summon thousands of magicians if he wished. Dybul also mentioned a notorious incident involving an engagement with the Crown Prince of the Blyard Kingdom. Shortly before their wedding, the Marquis's daughter eloped with another man, which aligned with Elle's mother's story. Dybul explained that originally, such a crime would have resulted in beheading, but according to his information, the Marquis and the Crown Prince forgave the daughter and her lover, earning them the respect and praise of many other aristocrats. L sat tensely in his chair, unable to believe what the hell he had just heard. He knew the true story and was astonished that his mother was used as a political tool. However, Dybul also mentioned rumors that the Marquis was a cold, ruthless man who would do anything to preserve and enhance his family's reputation. He advised L not to get involved with them. L stood up and told Dybul that he understood his advice and thanked him for the information. L realized that if they were to return to the Einhardt family, they would likely take his mother back and accept her. 
However, he also recognized that there was a high probability his mother would be used for political purposes. Therefore, he made the decision that if this family dared to harm him or his mother in any way, he would make them pay for it. Daibel mentioned that he felt the tower master had been feeling somewhat lonely lately. L turned around, feeling somewhat puzzled, and decided to visit his old friend at the mage tower. The tower master was sitting at his desk, resting his head on his hand. Contemplating that it was indeed lonely, but it was not uncommon for an old man to be forgotten at times. L stood behind him and said that was why he had come to visit him today. The tower master looked away, appearing somewhat offended. L then said that he had also come with a gift, piquing the old man's curiosity. L took out a few papers and explained with a smile that they were blueprints for a night golem. The tower master jumped up excitedly and couldn't believe what his old ears had just heard. However, L also explained that it wasn't possible to create a golem with its own consciousness, and that it would require a knight to control the golem. He also expressed his doubt that any magician could create a golem with its own consciousness. The tower master took the papers in his hands, pondered, and asked L if this was really the case, suggesting that he didn't entirely buy his statement. L asked what was on his mind. The tower master then said that he believed L had something else on his mind. L managed to dodge the question and said he was just exhausted from all his experiments, which the tower master believed. L was relieved that he believed the explanation, but he had to acknowledge that the tower master, despite his age, was sharp and had a keen perception, not easily fooled. He also told the old tower master that he would be leaving this place with his family soon and didn't think he would be coming back any time soon. The master was surprised and asked why he couldn't return. He pondered for a moment and stroked his long white beard. He put L's papers aside and said that considering L's serious demeanor, something significant must be the reason. He approached L, placed his hand on his shoulder, and told him to go ahead. He was sure that with his talent, L would be able to make a name for himself across the continent one day. He looked deep into L's eyes and assured him that he would hear news about him someday. L looked touched by his master's words and thanked him for everything he had done for him so far. He promised that he would definitely visit him again someday. With the tower master's last words. Stating that he would be waiting for him, the two bid farewell to each other. As night approached, the moon rose over L's family house in the night sky. L found himself back in his laboratory, a few papers flying around on his table, and some magic stones in a small container. Having said goodbye to everyone he wanted to, it was time for him to make his final preparations. He stretched out his hand and used some of his magic, causing a large magical circle to appear before him. From within the circle emerged a large golem dressed in golden armor, standing before El. Despite what he had told the tower master, El had managed to create a golem with its own consciousness. As the golem stood before El, he called out loudly for it to awaken as the golden knight. A shining golden light emanated from the small opening in its helmet, and the golem bowed before its new master, greeting him with dignity. L rubbed the back of his head and realized that something wasn't quite to his satisfaction as he hadn't put his best ego into this golem. He told his golem that he would soon have a suitable task for him, but until then, he should wait and be ready for his assignment. The golem said he understood his orders and would wait for his deployment. Then, the golem stood up, turned around, and walked back through the magical circle into the interdimensional space from where he had come. Once the golem had completely passed through, the magical circle disappeared as well. The golem was the crystallized creation of all his magical knowledge, always appearing when he called for it. He hoped that he wouldn't need to see its full power any time soon. Now that El had finished this final task as well, he was ready to leave. Meanwhile, in the very large estate of the Einhardt family, the Marquis and his son were playing a game of chess. The son told his father that the investigations of the magic stones were complete. The Marquis explained that these stones had earned them a lot of money by avoiding any negative consequences for the Einhardt family. 
The son then revealed that he had found the source of the stones and placed his chess piece on one of the squares. The Marquis destroyed the piece his son had put there and with a greedy expression said he was delighted that he had finally managed to find the source. The Marquis and his son sat across from each other, a small table with a chessboard and a small tea set in the middle. After calming down a bit, the Marquis asked his son why it had taken so long to find the source of the magic stones. He was sure he had given him this task a few years ago. His son explained that the golems that were developed to protect the stone's creator and provide security were quite powerful. Even the best, strongest, and most infamous assassins of the Brad family had no chance against these golems and were defeated and killed one after another by them. The Marquis picked up one of his chess pieces, stroked his beard, and contemplated. He realized that they were dealing with a formidable opponent who had achieved something that no one else could replicate in any way. His son, who was about to make his move in chess, said that even the other magical towers had struggled to find the origin of the magic stones. He told his father that he knew for a fact that the production cost of such stones couldn't be very high and that if they were able to manufacture them, they would have a magical item that could generate a lot of money. The Marquis looked down and continued to think. He had to admit that the magic stones would indeed be a very valuable item. He planned ahead and told his son that if they were able to sell these stones in their top ten largest stores across the continent, the Einhardt family businesses should become the best in the entire continent. His son was somewhat surprised since he knew his father and knew that he didn't give many compliments. Therefore, it surprised him that his father would give so many compliments to these magic stones. This illustrated to him what a fantastic item it must be. In any case, the son continued and informed his father that he had found out who was behind the magic stone source and admitted that he was surprised by the name of the creator. He told his father that the manufacturer of these stones was a magician named Silfer. Which immediately brought flashbacks of his daughter to the Marquis, leaving him with an astonished expression. He further explained to his father that it was actually her son who officially developed the stones but also mentioned that he was only seventeen years old and he didn't want to believe it for that reason. The Marquis placed the chess piece he was holding back on the chessboard and couldn't believe that his own daughter Silfer should be the one who developed such a wonderful item. He immediately ordered his son to send someone to bring his daughter directly to him. The Marquis stood up, turned his back to his son, and also said that the people who would bring his daughter should present her with the condition of being readmitted to the family. And if she agreed, they would also accept her son, as the Marquis knew his daughter and considered her a useless, stubborn person. He knew that she would say yes to the condition of also accepting her son. Greedily, he only saw the red magic stones and desperately wanted to hold them in his hands. He believed that once he possessed them, he could bring the family back to the top. His son also stood up and asked his father what he intended to do about the crown prince. He said that the crown prince would surely be angry if he found out that Silfer was returning. However, the father only said that they should leave him alone as long as he wasn't hostile towards them. As long as he remained peaceful. There was no reason to act against him. The Marquis contemplated that in the past, his daughter had been nothing but a useless scum to him. But now, he wanted to exploit her for his own goals, the daughter he had once discarded. Elle's mother stood in front of her house and looked back sadly. Elle told her that they were all ready to go and leave. Then, his mother turned to him and his sisters. She apologized and said she didn't know they would leave so soon. Now, as this moment had come, she noticed that her heart was getting heavier. Both Elle and his mother were sad, with a heavy atmosphere in their faces. Actually, L was also content not to return to such a place where terrible memories awaited his mother. Besides, he had wanted to tell her for a while that he had become a seventh-grade magician. However, he also knew that in this world, one was considered a genius if they reached the seventh grade of magic at the age of forty, and he didn't know how to explain to her that he had reached this grade at the age of seventeen. He didn't want his loving mother to look at him as if he were something abnormal. With his two sisters, Serena and Kena, in his arms, Elle's mother took step by step, moving a little further away from her house. 
L clenched his fist and felt somewhat angry, but at the same time disappointed that he couldn't tell his mother everything. He also didn't know how to handle it if his power were to be revealed in a difficult situation. L and his family then set off, for now, the last time, towards the nearby city of Bankark. L's mother led the small group and explained to him and his two sisters that they were standing in front of a gate that would take them directly to the capital, Kefermil. Cautiously, Silfer approached a man sitting in front of the gate and apologized. She said they would like to go through the gate to Kefermil as a group of four and asked how much it would cost. The man, bored with his job, said it would cost 200 gold per person, totaling 800 gold. L's mother repeated the number 800 gold loudly and with surprise, which echoed throughout the building, finding it too expensive. The guard grabbed Silfer's hand and asked if she couldn't pay. Gripping tighter and telling her that usually only noble and wealthy people passed through this portal and that she should leave if she couldn't pay. When her mother was roughly handled, Kana immediately sprang into action. Before the guard could realize what was happening, Kana halted her attack just a few inches from his head. With an angry look, she warned the guard not to dare touch her family and demanded that he let her mother go immediately. This surprising reaction not only stunned El but also his sister Serena and their mother Silfer. Even the guard was taken aback by the sudden outburst but subsequently released Silfer and stepped back slightly. Suddenly, another guard appeared in the small room with the portal. Surprised by how his colleague had quickly caused a problem and started a dispute. He apologized for his colleague's behavior, acknowledging that he had been very rude. He then instructed him to leave and keep his head down. After that, he explained to El and his family that it would take half a year to walk to the Blyard Kingdom, and therefore a total price of 400 gold was initially set. To their delight, he informed them that for four or more people going through the portal, a discount would be applied, and they would only have to pay 360 gold. El could hardly believe they almost paid 800 gold. His mother told him that she already knew the price would be around 400 gold. Subsequently, El handed the agreed price to the friendly guard, who immediately got everything ready. The guard asked El and his family if they were visiting the Royal Blyard for a vacation, to which they explained that they were moving there. The guard remarked to Silfer that she must feel safe being a part of such a reliable family, at which point everyone looked at Kana, who had just defended her family like a protective mother lion, just in a different way. After the preparations were completed, the guard asked them all to stand in the middle of the magical circle as they were about to be teleported any moment. L, his mother Silfer, Serena, and Kana gazed at the magical circle, eager to see what would happen next. A small blue beam of light descended upon them, causing them to dissolve into smaller blue sparks that rose into the air, where the blue light originated from. Together, they landed at a small location in the middle of Kefermil, right at a teleportation gate. Upon their arrival, Serena asked if that was all, to which Kana replied that it certainly seemed so. L and his sisters marveled at the sight of a small city with a large bell tower, realizing that it must be Kefermil. Their mother pointed to a building and said they would stay there for the day. As they approached the building's door, she explained that before they could reach the Marquis' estate, Serena and Kana needed to register as mercenaries first. Cheerfully and with a smile on her face, Silfer led her children into the building, confident that their skills would easily qualify them as high-ranking mercenaries. She urged them to unpack quickly so they could go out together and looked forward to showing her children around. Suddenly, she heard her name, and a shiver ran down her spine. Silfer turned pale and went into shock. She looked ahead and recognized Crown Prince Al-Qaeda, who was passing by with his guards. With a slight smile on his lips, he expressed his delight at seeing her again. El was equally surprised to see the crown prince, his mother's former fiancé, in person. He knew from his conversation with Daibel that after extensive investigations, it was discovered that his father, Rian Luvius, was murdered on the crown prince's orders when his mother was captured after they had left her family and run away. El immediately remembered his mother's distraught face as his father died before her eyes, and the tears she shed afterward. 
The crown prince greeted Silfer, stating that she looked well, and he was relieved to see her in good health. Politely but still in shock, Silfer responded that it was true, addressing the crown prince as, Your Highness. However, to Silfer's surprise, the crown prince told her to relax. He explained that they had been separated due to an unfortunate event but expressed his happiness to see her again. He then inquired about the children hiding behind her. Silfer answered hesitantly that it wasn't easy to explain and searched for a way to tell him. Kena whispered to her sister that he seemed like a gentleman, and she had imagined the crown prince to be different. However, Elle could see beyond the cheerful nice facade and realized that the crown prince wore a mask, and his true face was much uglier than his sisters could imagine. The crown prince scrutinized Elle's mother and found that she still looked as beautiful as ever. Despite being in her thirties now, he believed she still radiated and remained the most beautiful woman in the entire Blyard kingdom, in his eyes. He was still convinced that she was the right woman for him. No matter what might have happened in the past. Greedy, he still wanted to possess her. L became angry as he could see the crown prince's hidden desire, given that he was at the seventh level of magic. He had to bite his tongue to keep from losing his temper. With a smile, El inserted himself into the conversation between the crown prince and his mother, asking how he knew her. In response, he also put on a false mask, extended his hand, and said it would be a pleasure to meet him. He introduced himself as her son, El. The only thing El aimed for was to prevent the greedy crown prince from eyeing his mother with impure intentions. The crown prince was somewhat surprised to hear that he was supposedly her son. And so El and the crown prince faced each other. The crown prince quickly composed himself and asked if he understood correctly that he was Silfer's son. However, he soon remarked that he now saw a certain resemblance and that El looked quite similar to him. Internally struggling, El managed to maintain his cheerful smile and composure. Still wearing his false mask, the crown prince cheerfully said that he would love to stay a bit longer and continue the conversation, but he had other important matters that couldn't wait any longer. He asked if there would be an opportunity to seize the chance to have a drink together. Silfer said she would eagerly and happily await such an opportunity. As the crown prince departed and passed by Silfer, he whispered to her with his true face that she was actually his wife. She fell into a shocked state again and turned pale. Elle turned around and, like his mother, couldn't believe what he had just heard. Furiously, he managed to hold back any insults that came to mind and kept them to himself. The crown prince realized that Silfer would return to her family, meaning she had succeeded in mastering the sixth level of magic. As he continued on to his other important appointments, he recognized that his beloved was not only beautiful but also possessed talent in magic, making her even more of a perfect woman in his eyes. With his true greedy face. He thought it wouldn't be bad to take her as his mistress, and he realized her family would have no objections, in fact, it would make Marquis Einhardt equally happy to get rid of his useless but beautiful daughter. However, before that happened, the crown prince wanted to get rid of the children she was accompanying, especially her son. El grew angrier and clenched his fist as he glared at the crown prince with disdain. After regaining his composure, he asked his mother if everything was all right. She apologized and told herself to pull herself together. She suggested they go directly to the mercenary guild to begin Serena and Kena's registration. Silfer cheerfully led the way, pretending to be as happy as the crown prince had interrupted her. However, El, Serena, and Kena knew that their mother was playing the act for their benefit and was not as happy as she seemed in that moment. They set off together for the mercenary guild, which was located in a beautiful building with a blue roof. Their interior was simple and clean, quite different from what one might imagine. Behind the counter, there was a man with little to do since everything was empty. Silfer approached the man at the counter and apologized for the interruption. She explained that her two daughters would like to sign up for the mercenary recruitment process. The man at the counter welcomed them and explained that there were different ranks among the mercenaries. Ranging from F rank to B rank. He also told them that to determine their rank, they would have to fight against the guild master, 
who held an A-rank position. Soon after, a middle-aged man arrived, giving off a very pleasant impression as he hummed and laughed cheerfully. He recognized that the two young women wanted to fight against him today to be assigned a rank. He asked if they were sure and really wanted to take the test since they were too sweet for it. He said it was okay, though, and they could go ahead with the test. However, he made a suggestion that they both fight him simultaneously, as he was not convinced of their strength. Moreover, he further infuriated them by saying he would go easy on them so as not to hurt the two lovely ladies. Serena and Kana were not pleased with how they were being treated and became a little angry. They both called out each other's names and agreed to give it their all to show the arrogant guild master that he was wrong and they didn't need any special treatment. They entered a sort of coliseum or arena and prepared to begin the examination. The guild master stood in front of them and said they could start any time they were ready. He also told them to do their best. Though he might have been somewhat arrogant, he was by no means a bad guy. Serena and Kana asked if he was serious about them giving their best. He replied that he was sure, and they shouldn't worry about him getting mad at them. At the same time, Serena and Kana were ready for their test and began it. Kana unsheathed her sword and charged at the guild master, enveloping her sword with fire and hitting him. But before he could recover, Serena was also preparing an attack, using her wind magic, which also hit the guild master and sent him soaring into the air. When their magic had dissipated and Serena and Kana waited for their evaluation from the guild master, the sun shone down on them, and they glittered in the sunlight. Completely overwhelmed and utterly surprised, the guild master lay on the ground and awarded both of them the B-rank. L was visibly delighted and congratulated his two sisters on achieving the highest possible rank. Telling them they did a great job. Serena then said they were really relieved that things went so well. Kana asked L if this would be enough and if they were good enough to protect their mother. However, their mother was completely lost in thought and didn't even pay attention to her daughters. It was only when they called her name that she suddenly turned to them and asked what was going on. Without having seen anything of the test, she said that the two had done a great job and were truly amazing. L knew that his mother wasn't doing so well and had a small trauma caused by the crown prince. It was nighttime, and the lights from the houses shone outside. L's mother sat on her bed. Contemplating the crown prince and the fact that he hadn't changed over the years. She realized he was still obsessed with her and would do anything to make her his lover. She also knew that if that were to happen, L would end up just like Rian. L meant everything to her, and she would sacrifice anything she could to protect him. She couldn't bear any harm coming to her own child. Originally, she had planned to secretly return to her family without drawing much attention. She never could have anticipated running into the crown prince in a place like this. She also recognized that her Einhardt family would prioritize the crown prince's desires over protecting L. She knew she had to somehow make her family prioritize L's protection over him. So, she wanted to come up with a plan to achieve this. Suddenly there was a knock on the door and L told his mother that he would come in now. L looked at his mother, who asked him what he would think about offering her method of creating his magic stones to her Einhardt family. L looked at his mother and listened further. Silfer explained to L that the entire continent was currently obsessed with the magic stones, and she was sure that the Marquis would want to have that information for producing the stones. She explained to L that if he gave him his method, the Marquis would protect her in return. L told her that he was capable of protecting her without giving his method to anyone. Serena and Kana also looked into the room and said they were still there and would protect their mother too. Suddenly, L, Serena, and Kana brought out some drinks and food from behind their backs, trying to cheer up their mother, and suggested she have a drink to forget the bad experiences she had today. L also said that now he could have a drink with her too since he was officially 17. His sisters said they had also prepared something and looked forward to enjoying it together with their mother. L's mother then realized that she had gotten too caught up in things and that she had a new family now, one that was much better than her old one and would protect each other. She had tears in her eyes and felt grateful for this small, kind family. 
They all ate and drank together in Silfer's room, had fun, and forgot what had happened in the city that afternoon. L thought about his deceased parents from his previous life who unfortunately died, and he never had the opportunity to have a drink with them. Even when things got tough due to debts, he couldn't do anything to help back then, even though he wanted to. But he wanted to change that in this life because here, he could do something for a family. He could become faster and stronger than anyone else in this life through his own efforts alone. He wanted to ensure that in this life, he would do everything he could to help his family, something he couldn't accomplish in his previous life. L smiled, holding a small cup in his hand, and expressed his love to everyone. They jokingly asked if he was already drunk, but he stated that he wouldn't forgive anyone who dared to make his happy family unhappy. His golem stood motionless in the interdimensional space, awaiting its master's command. Suddenly, its eyes glimmered as it received and accepted an order. The next morning, L stood by his window, looking outside, hoping that the day ahead would be better than the previous one, with fewer problems. He stayed there for a while, contemplating how to proceed and enjoying the morning sun on his skin. Soon after, they headed to the Einhardt family estate and marveled at its grandeur. They stood before a massive gate adorned with golden accents. Serena and Kena were in awe and expected nothing less from the most prestigious family. They compared the surrounding fence to the walls of Bangkok City, noting that they were just as large. El's mother, however, had a bad feeling about returning to her family and realized that nothing had changed over the years. She took a deep breath, changed her expression, took a few steps, and was determined to gather herself and not show any more weakness. One of the guards at the gate asked her what she was doing there. Silfer explained that she was here to speak with the Marquis, to which the clueless guard inquired if she had an appointment, or else she couldn't be allowed in. With confidence, she told the guard to inform the Marquis herself that Silfer had returned after seventeen years. The guard suddenly recognized her and stammered her name. He immediately apologized and said he would report it right away. Then he opened the gate and ran inside to deliver the news. Elle's mother thought about how the power of her Einhardt family supposedly declined after the annulment of her engagement. She also recalled that when she was expelled, her father was so devastated that he refused to eat or drink for a month. She looked through the open gate at her family's estate and tried to see the good in her father. She knew that her former lover, Riyan, was executed on the crown prince's orders, and her father didn't really want it. She remembered how he had screamed, saying she should be grateful that he had killed her beloved, and she wondered why he had said such a thing. Suddenly, El touched her shoulder. Offering emotional support. She turned around and saw her son, knowing that everything would be all right with him by her side. She also touched his hand. Then her father and brother came up the driveway, calling her name. Her father immediately touched her shoulders with both hands, pushing Elle aside, and said that he was sorry and had made a terrible mistake. Silfer couldn't believe that her father, who had always been reliable and sought glory and power for the family, was apologizing to her first. She immediately sensed that there was more to it. Nonetheless, she also apologized to him and expressed regret. However, her father's attention quickly shifted to his son L. He asked her if L was her son and sought confirmation from Silfer. She immediately understood her father's intentions, and a chill ran down her spine. She affirmed that L was indeed her son. They introduced themselves to each other, and L played along, introducing himself with a friendly demeanor and affectionately calling the Marquis grandfather. Silfer's father smiled as well and expressed his pleasure in meeting L. He found L to be very amiable, but he also noticed that L's eyes had changed the moment he recognized him and that he had examined him and his manna with incredible speed. He also recognized that L was on the fifth level of magic. He immediately realized that L should actually be over seventeen years old, and he was already surprised that his daughter Silfer had reached the sixth level but he had not expected such a young genius. El knew that the Marquis was a person of great power, but he also knew that even the Marquis shouldn't immediately recognize that he was on the seventh level. 
Silfer's brother then suggested moving the conversation inside, and they followed his suggestion. It was another sunny day, with only a few clouds scattered across the sky. The Marquis sat at a table with Silfer, her son, and her daughter. Silfer immediately asked him what this conversation was about. Her father wasted no time and responded to his daughter's question by asking if it was true that she was the developer of the magical stones. This surprised Silfer visibly, and she looked at her father. Who wore a cheerful expression, as he thought he already knew the answer. The Marquis could only think about how he could quickly sell the stones and double the family's fortune. He also thought about how much influence it would give the family over the mages in the kingdom. His only interest was to make the Einhardt family even more powerful to the point where they could even rule the kingdom as a royal authority. He was practically obsessed with not letting this grand opportunity slip away. L recognized that the Marquis's eyes were solely focused on his greed, and it was evident what he was thinking. Continuing, the Marquis expressed hope that now that his beloved daughter was back, they could be open with each other. He also stated that it was her duty to contribute to the improvement of the family. Silver clenched both hands into fists, unable to believe that she had heard the words, duty, and, family, in the same sentence. However, she composed herself and told her father that there was a condition for her contribution. The Marquis was curious and asked what condition she had in mind. Silver loudly exclaimed that he should make her son L the Marquis. This astonished everyone present, including her own son. They all couldn't believe what she had just said and asked her if she was serious. Silfer said she was serious and explained that L was actually the one who had developed the method for creating the magical stones. And she had done nothing herself. She also told her father that he had noticed it himself when he examined L's mana and knew that her son was at the fifth level of magic at just seventeen years old. L was surprised that his mother had found this out as well. Silfer further explained that among all ten mages on the continent who had reached the eighth level, no one had reached the fifth level at such a young age. She also said that soon her son L would become a very powerful mage who would shake the entire continent. She continued to emphasize that the magic stones and their value were recognized throughout the continent and, combined with the fact that he was the world's greatest mage prodigy, would be enough to make the Einhardt family the largest family not only in the Blyard kingdom but also in the entire continent. Silfer continued to put pressure on her father, asking him with all the confidence she had built up if he would accept her condition. However, her father said that he couldn't make such a big and difficult decision on the spot. But Silfer didn't want to hear that answer and directly told her father that she came here with the plan to designate her son L as the successor, and he had to make a decision now. Her father was surprised by her confidence and strong words, as he had not expected this from her. But Silfer wasn't done yet. She told her father that L would eventually become a much better mage than he was. And if he didn't give her a positive answer to her question, she wouldn't reveal the secret behind the magic stones to him. Her father was completely bewildered. He had never seen his daughter like this. Normally, Silfer obeyed him and was as docile as a little kitten, but now he was witnessing a different side of his daughter, the one of a lioness defending her newborn. The Marquis said that he needed some time to think about this proposal and wanted to do so right away. Silfer told her father that she would look forward to his answer if it turned out positive, and that she would be waiting for his decision. Then she and L left the room and walked along the hallway. L looked downcast and wanted to talk with his mother about what she had just proposed to his father. However, his mother turned around cheerfully and reassured him not to worry. Suddenly, Serena and Kena came out of their room, having heard their brother and mother's voices, and were quite curious about what important family matters were being discussed. Silfer embraced her other two children and apologized for leaving them alone in the room. L stood apart and continued to think about what had been said during the conversation with the Marquis and his mother. Kena asked Silfer if she was okay, and Silfer confirmed it. She then asked if they had already received a detailed tour of the rooms. If not, she would now take on that task. L then made his way to his room, his thoughts still revolving around a conversation with the Marquis and his mother. 
He had never expected his mother to say something like that and set such a condition. However, as L entered his room, closed the door behind him, and leaned against it, he also knew that the Marquis would never agree to this condition. He realized that he had to look further into the future and plan ahead to stay a few steps ahead. L used his summoning magic to summon a magical pair of glasses that appeared directly on his nose. He adjusted them and said that he didn't actually need glasses, but they would help him concentrate better. They reminded him of his past and his previous life. With these self-created glasses, L could better sense the flow of mana, and he wanted to go and see what the Marquis really thought about him and his mother. L raised his hand and used his magic to cast invisibility once again. Within seconds, L became invisible, and he couldn't be seen anymore. He opened his room door and slowly made his way to the room where Silfer's father, the Marquis, would be. From outside, one could hear his son asking him what he intended to do about Silfer's child and if he would seriously consider appointing this child as his successor or new family head. L stood in front of the door, eager to find out what the Marquis and his son were discussing about him. L made his way into the room where the Marquis and his son were and continued to listen as the Marquis advised his son not to make any inappropriate faces. Both of them stood in front of a target and took turns throwing knives at it, keeping themselves occupied during their conversation. L remained invisible, hiding behind a small partition in the room to better eavesdrop on their conversation. The Marquis had to admit that L was undoubtedly qualified for the position his daughter had claimed for him. While playing with one of the knives they were throwing at the target, the Marquis continued to praise L, acknowledging his talent and impressive achievement of mastering fifth-grade magic at the age of seventeen. However, he doubted whether L was suitable to lead this family, given that he had grown up in a foreign nation for seventeen years. Moreover, the Marquis recognized the possibility that L might have come here only seeking revenge. As the Marquis threw another knife, it almost stuck in the center of the target and wobbled slightly. Silfer, the Marquis's son, mentioned that his sister was a sixth-grade magician, which could pose a small problem. After his father was in the process of taking out another knife from a pile, he said that they had twenty mages here who were at least in the sixth class and that they would never lose in a direct fight against Silfer and her son L. Furthermore, the Marquis turned to his son and asked him if he remembered the letter from the Crown Prince. He reminded his son that in that letter, the prince expressed his willingness to accept Silfer as his lover again, should they agree. The son questioned if it would work and raised the objection that his sister might already know and resist again. He further raised the objection that if she were to become the prince's new lover, she could find out that they secretly abduct talented people from other countries and brainwash them to become their allies. Suddenly, the Marquis shouted at his son to shut up, shocking him. The Marquis explained to his son, while playing with the knife again, that even if they remain silent, anyone who uses magic could still listen to them. L noticed that they had set up multiple devices to conceal their conversation. Something even a sixth-grade magician wouldn't easily bypass. However, he was surprised that they were so cautious and didn't always speak openly, even with this security measure in place. Furthermore, L was shocked to learn that they were abducting and manipulating people to turn them into their allies. If this truth were to come to light, it would trigger a massive scandal that could bring down the entire Einhardt family. The Marquis' son then promised never to speak about it again, and his father reassured him that he need not worry about the prince either, as he was also involved in the events and would not harm him. As L listened, his thoughts became more tangled. The Marquis listed all the past events. From the prince's proposals to the magical stones to L's extraordinary talent. Then the Marquis asked his son what he would do in this situation, holding the knife he had been playing with before and handing it to his son. Silfer's brother recognized that it was a test, and that he could make up for his mistake by acting smarter. Under the pressure of the situation, he took his father's knife and stated that he would first respond to the prince. He would tell the prince that he would gladly accept Silfer as his lover. Then, he would capture L to learn the method of making the magical stones from Silfer, which could be used to save L's life. His father asked if that was all he would do. 
With a skillful throw, the son hit the center of the target with the knife and continued explaining. Once he had the method of making the stones, he would send Silfer to the prince, whether she went willingly or not. Even if he had to use force, he would seal her ability to use magic. L listened in disbelief as Silfer's brother went on to explain that once his sister was with the prince, he would also subject L to brainwashing to make him a loyal member of the family. After that, they would show the prince a body that resembled L closely, claiming that he tragically died in an accident. The Marquis clapped his hands in delight, praising his son Glutton and assuring him that he was a worthy successor. They decided to proceed exactly as planned and expected to see results soon. Glutton promised to do his best to satisfy them. L was consumed with anger but had to hold himself together. His teeth clenched, and his hand formed into a fist. He realized that this family was even colder and more heartless than he had ever imagined. He wondered why he couldn't stop or prevent his mother's suggestion to be in a place like this. Instead, L realized he was intoxicated by his superiority over others and thought he wanted to make everyone happy, regardless of the circumstances. Additionally, he wanted to respect his mother's decision, and this was now the result of that. L could live with them trying to use him. He had already suspected something in that direction. However, he couldn't forgive them for wanting to hand his mother over to the prince. L grew angrier, causing him to become somewhat careless. The Marquis recognized that someone in the room was under the influence of an invisibility spell. Surprised, he wondered if this person had been here the whole time and was astonished that he hadn't noticed or recognized them. He asked aloud who was hiding in the room. L then extended his hand and prepared a spell. The Marquis and his son Glutton noticed the surge of magic, but they had little time to react because L had already finished casting his modified spell, Endless Flame Seed. And unleashed it. L revealed himself, which visibly surprised the Marquis and Glutton, wondering if he had overheard their entire conversation. As the spell had a slight delay, it exploded a few seconds later. The Marquis looked shocked as he realized what was about to happen. There followed a massive explosion, and a large fireball soared through the roof of the estate into the sky. Right after the first explosion, another one followed, just as big, tearing everything apart. The ground was completely scorched from the tremendous explosions, and ashes and smoke filled the air. However, the Marquis and his son didn't appear to have any visible direct injuries from the explosion. The Marquis was astonished at the spell L had cast. Any other magician would need more than half an hour to execute such a spell. Furthermore, it was a seventh-level spell, effortlessly capable of killing thousands of people at once. Immediately after the explosion, guards of the family estate rushed into the room where the two family heads were and inquired if everything was all right and who was responsible. Looking down at the small crowd of soldiers and the two leaders, L was surprised that they were still alive. One of the soldiers recognized him and said he was obviously Silfer's son. L floated slightly in the air and said he was glad they were still alive, as his anger was too great to end their lives so quickly. Once again, L extended his hand, not giving them much opportunity to react. Under his palm, a small orb formed, surrounded by a magical circle. L told the small group standing below him that he wanted to ensure they would suffer endless torment and beg for forgiveness, repenting their deeds for daring to raise their filthy hands against his family. He raised his hand, and the small orb expanded into a large magical circle behind him. L invoked a summoning spell, declaring that misery and destruction awaited those who stood in his way. His eyes were filled with focus and hatred towards the individuals present. He completed his summoning, and his knight golem in golden armor emerged from its interdimensional space. Standing behind L. The guards couldn't believe what they were seeing, wondering how such a creature could be present here. The Marquis started laughing, prompting Glutton to ask if everything was all right and why he was laughing. With gleaming eyes that hadn't quite grasped the current situation and a brain the size of a pea, oblivious to how dire the situation looked for him, the Marquis stated it was great and the best thing he had ever seen. 
The few guards who mustered their courage didn't believe the golem was real and vowed in the name of the Einhardt family that they wouldn't let El do as he pleased and tried to push back the golem. They rushed towards El and his golem. Through the slits in the golem's helmet. A small bright light blinked, signaling it was fully operational. With a single quick but incredibly powerful strike, the golem attacked the guards who dared to charge at El, sending them flying into the air. Glutton couldn't believe what was unfolding before his eyes and seemed to have an even smaller brain than his father. He looked down at the falling bodies lying motionless on the ground, succumbing to the injuries inflicted by the golem's attack. Frenziedly, the Marquis declared it was undoubtedly not a fake and stated that his family could now become the strongest family ever, with such a golem on their side. He pointed at El with his finger and ordered the new guards who had gathered behind him to kill El and force him to reveal the secret of the golems. El's facial expression remained terrifying, clearly indicating that he hadn't shown everything he was capable of. He told the Marquis that everything he knew served only greed. Moreover, he pointed out that the Marquis already lived an extravagant lifestyle and questioned if he didn't have enough money for retirement and why he would want more. The Marquis looked visibly confused. El floated next to his golem, observing the attacking guards and the devastated, charred ground. Another magical circle hovered in front of his golem, deflecting the attacks directed at him. El began positioning himself behind his golem and channeling more of his mana into it. As a result, his mana spread out in waves around him. Pushing back all the present individuals slightly. The guards recognized the extreme power of this mana and realized they couldn't contend with it. Even Glutton had to defend himself somewhat against the mana controlled by El through his golem. The Marquis was also surprised and realized that this mana couldn't belong to someone who had just mastered the fifth stage of magic. It seemed to be on par with that of a sword master, perhaps even stronger. He remembered how he had examined El's mana during their first encounter at noon and pieced a few things together. He realized that El must be the mage who had caused the two massive explosions. He pondered if it was possible that El was actually on the seventh stage of magic. When El realized that the Marquis had finally figured out how strong he truly was, he couldn't help but grin self-assuredly. The Marquis grew angry, clasped his hands together, and prepared a spell as well. Shortly after, he launched his spell at El, who appeared completely unfazed, continuing to float in the air without being disturbed. Calmly, El raised his hand, channeled some mana, and effortlessly created a spell to repel the attack. The ground beneath him burned, and flames raged on the battlefield. Once again, El looked down from above at his grandfather and uncle, realizing that they were unworthy of being called that. Just as El was about to say what the Marquis intended to do to them. He heard his name as only his mother called him, Ellie, on the battlefield. His mother, now joined by his sisters Serena and Cana, looked up in disbelief at El and couldn't believe what she saw. She asked him what had happened. El looked sadly down at his mother and called her name. He wondered why she was here and didn't want her to find out what was happening and the terrible plan her brother and father had for her. El still floated in the air, looking down at the two family heads, his sisters, and his mother. Lost in thought, he couldn't help but recall the plan his mother's brother had devised to extract information about the magic stones from him and what he intended to do with his mother afterward. He also thought about how their father, as the family head, applauded and praised him for it. El's mother shouted up to him again, asking him to please respond. She saw how angry El looked and realized she had never seen him so furious, knowing that something must have happened to make her son so agitated. El continued to silently gaze at his mother and his siblings, then let out a deep sigh, realizing he had no other choice now. Once again, he raised his hand and formed a small sphere with many magical circles rotating around it. These magical circles grew larger and pulsated outward. The Marquis recognized this as capture magic. He was alarmed, wondering if El had recorded the conversation he had with his son where they had hatched their plan. If that were the case, he knew his family was doomed, and no one should ever hear those plans. Panicking, 
the Marquis quickly turned to his son Gleton and ordered him to kill El immediately, explaining that he was the one who had caused the explosions just now. Angrily, and because she hadn't received an answer from her son, Silfer asked her father what was going on and why he was ordering El's death without reason. He told her to shut up. The Marquis found himself in a predicament and took a moment to adjust to the situation and think. Silfer told him that El was his grandson, appealing to his good heart, hoping he would reconsider killing him. However, the Marquis seemed unfazed and instructed his guards and his son to hurry. He warned them that El was a high-ranking mage. The guards once again stood in a larger group before El, pointing their swords at him and preparing for battle. El appeared relatively unfazed and simply commanded his golem to overpower the guards without killing them. The golem extended its hand, conjuring a golden sword and assuring its master that it understood and accepted the command, and would execute it to the best of its abilities. The summoned sword of his slightly plump golem shone as brightly as the sun and sparkled like the stars in the night sky. He held it in his left hand while El floated slightly to the side to give his plump golem some space. The morale of the guards and warriors of the Einhardt family had not been broken. Together, they raised their swords and proudly shouted their battle cry. Their first mission was to destroy the summoned sword. However, El knew that this endeavor was impossible, for the golden sword was a symbol of his golem. It was forged from pure dwarven steel with very few impurities and coated with magical metal for enchanted seals. The front of the blade was also coated in gold and imbued with a spell to deflect impact upon striking. Moreover, it had been reinforced with a special sharpening magic to further enhance its existing power. Thus, the golden sword resembled more of a divine sword than a mere one. El realized that, much like in his previous life, it was essential to regularly upgrade his strongest unit to keep it effective. He was more realistic than idealistic and knew he had to push his golem's capabilities to their limits. The guards and knights of the Einhardt family remained in their battle formation, continuing to point their swords at El and his golem while channeling their energy. El's golem swung its flame-enchanted sword, creating a massive golden shockwave that broke through the ranks of knights, forcing them to defend against the backlash of the swing. Even the Marquis and Gleton could not believe what they were seeing, astonished by the power of El's slightly plump golden golem. One of the guards warned not to underestimate it, assuming his battle stance once again. The golem executed a golden cut and flew towards the army of guards, splitting the sword in two and disrupting their combat formation. The golden golem continued to build up, and its shadow loomed over the heads of the guards. Seeing the golem up close, they realized its true size and the overwhelming force they were truly facing. However, some guards had not given up hope and urged their comrades to obey their master's orders absolutely, not to panic or give up. Another guard caught sight, after his friend's brave words, of their fighter who had managed to ride onto the battlefield inside the house on a horse. His horse was also adorned with lightweight golden armor, and he himself was dressed in a silver, typical knight's armor, embellished with a red cape. El recognized that this knight must be the leader and captain of the knights. Furthermore, he realized that this captain should be at the end of the swordmaster rank. The captain knelt before the Marquis and apologized for arriving late. However, the Marquis urged him to get to work immediately and defeat El and his golem. The knight captain raised his head, said he would do so right away, saluted, lowered the visor of his helmet, and introduced himself. He explained that he was the knight captain of the Marquis Einhardt family and drew his sword. He enveloped his sword with a kind of mana, raised it, and thus boosted the morale of his subordinate knights. He called out to them that they would now destroy the enemy together. El recognized that things were about to get more serious, but he spoke quietly and calmly to his golden golem, asking it to switch to its level 2 mode. The golem responded that its seal had been successfully lifted and covered itself in golden light. First, its hands and arms became slightly slimmer, followed by its shoulders, head, and finally the rest of its body. It now looked much more flexible, faster, and stronger, ready to continue defending L. Additionally, since it was now somewhat thinner, 
it appeared even more fearsome and aggressive. The guards who had risen against El and his golem knight were surprised by the sudden transformation. However, El already knew that this wasn't all that had changed about his golem and that the real change was yet to come. As the sword had disappeared during its transformation, the golem had to call it again, and it reappeared, enveloped in flames, in its hand. It grabbed the sword and prepared for battle, assuming a combat position as well. The blade of the sword had undergone some changes and was infused with much more energy than before. The leader of the knights realized that it must be an aura blade, which was the actual much more powerful power-up. El's golem swung its sword to the side and stepped forward without apparent protection, heading towards the army facing it. The captain did the same, also swinging his sword, and asked if he looked so weak that he could approach without any cover. He also claimed that even if the golem now had an aura blade, it still posed no threat to him. Both prepared for a strike and simultaneously clashed their swords, causing a tremendous recoil and shaking the ground. The impact of the two swords illuminated the surroundings, forcing everyone involved to shield their eyes from the bright light. Only El continued to watch the spectacle, completely focused, and still filled with immense hatred towards the Marquis and his son, Gleton. As the bright light from the clash of swords dissipated, the knight captain was left bleeding, while El's golem stood before him unharmed. The bloodied blade of the knight captain was lodged in the ground, and he succumbed to his injuries, falling to the floor. He couldn't believe what had just happened and that he had been defeated. His injuries were so severe that he died in that moment. The guard standing under him couldn't fathom how their leader had been easily taken out with a single strike and lay on the ground. This visibly shook the morale of the army. However, the golem didn't pause and immediately launched into the next attack. It swung its sword, unleashing a flaming energy blade, and once again attacked the Marquis, Gleton, and the army standing behind them. The Marquis managed to shield himself and his son with a protective spell that intercepted the golem's attack. However, the attack was so powerful that the shield only held up once before shattering. Nonetheless, the army behind them was still hit by the attack. And soldiers were sent flying across the battlefield. The Marquis and Gleton were forced to look down at the bodies of their guards and realize that these weak guards had died too easily and quickly. El also noticed that reinforcements for the family heads were approaching again, and he saw some mages in black robes moving forward on the battlefield. However, this didn't surprise him, as the Einhardt family was known to possess an army as vast as a mage tower. Nevertheless, he wasn't willing to let the matter rest and was already planning his next moves. Before he could put these plans into action, he turned to his mother and summoned a sphere containing his recorded memories. He explained to her what he intended to do with it and asked if she was ready to see the truth. She replied that she was indeed prepared and knew that her son L had a good reason for acting the way he was right now. She understood that something important must be contained within her son's memories, prompting him to attack the entire Einhardt family, including her father and brother. L handed her the small sphere with his memories, and the Marquis observed this. However, he knew he had to intervene, and his daughter mustn't see it under any circumstances. He glanced at El's golem and realized he couldn't get past it, as the golem's abilities far surpassed his own. Only one of the ten grandmasters should currently be able to do something against this golem. Anything else would be impossible. Furthermore, he realized that even if El were a seventh-tier mage, he and Gleton, along with the family's magicians, only had a slim chance of stopping him. Desperately, he understood that even if he managed to escape and elude El, his own family, which he had built up with his own hands and strengthened at any cost, would be destroyed. El cast a protective spell to shield his mother from external influences, allowing her to peacefully observe her son's memories. Magical circles appeared around El, as with any other spell. His mother was then enclosed in a square cube meant to protect her from all dangers. Panicked, Serena and Kena called out to their mother, but they couldn't see the interior of the cube as its walls were obscured. Meanwhile, Silfer held El's memories in her hand, and they expanded around her. 
she saw the memory of her father and brother discussing the prince's letter and deciding to present her as his lover. Additionally, she realized that the Einhardt family had abducted many promising talents from other countries and subjected them to brainwashing to serve the family loyally. She came to understand that the prince was aware of all this and involved as well. Then she saw the memory in which her own brother explained his plan to their father, which involved delivering Silfer against her will to the prince. Perhaps they intended to seal her magic and capture El, and then use him as leverage to force her to reveal the method of making the magic stones. Silfer couldn't believe how shocking these revelations in El's memories were for her. Through further memories, she learned that her father and brother also planned to subject El to brainwashing to make him loyal and show the prince a different body resembling El's to fake his death. When Silfer saw her own father praising her brother for such a plan, she clasped her hands over her head, and her world crumbled. She was on the verge of tears and fell to the ground. She tried to hold back her emotions, recalling the first words her father said to her upon her return, expressing regret for sending her away. She had thought that deep down, her father still retained some familial feelings for her and that they were still father and daughter. However, Silfer couldn't hold back her tears any longer and let her emotions flow freely. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she wept. She couldn't help but think about how happy she was with her son, El, and that she should have known better than anyone how terrible this family truly was. She now blamed herself for bringing her beloved son here. Thoughts of her father and her brother came back to her, and she realized that there was not a hint of warmth or love in this family, only wicked individuals. She thought that she should be indifferent to how these wicked people would use her however they pleased. But now, knowing that they not only wanted to use her but also planned to subject her son, L, to brainwashing, she couldn't simply forgive them as she initially wanted, even though they had already killed her beloved husband. She recognized that she had never truly hated them for that because she always believed that the prince had forced them to do it. However, now she realized that this was not the truth, it was simply that these people knew no love or family, and they acted purely out of self-interest. Silfer bit her lip hard, trying to forget her inner pain and pull herself together. She clenched her fists and also realized that for her father, her brother, and the prince, everyone else was nothing more than tools to increase their own power. Silfer understood that this was the true nature of these people, which she unfortunately never fully realized before, but now she knew. When she came to terms with what had happened and gathered her courage, the cube that had imprisoned her for protection began to glow and shattered. El looked a little sad, knowing that it wasn't easy for his mother to accept the truth. His mother folded her hands, with a few tears still in her eyes. However, she made the decision that no matter how painful it might be now and no matter how much she wished to forget everything, it was essential to accept the truth. Serena immediately called out to her mother, who was floating in the air, to ensure she was okay. Her mother landed and was ready to face reality and confront it. With a determined expression and a clenched fist, she told her son that she would no longer run away and was prepared to fight. El looked down at his mother, relieved by her resolution and her ability to withstand the truth. He also noticed that a few tears were still running down her cheeks and that, despite everything their family had done, she didn't succumb to hatred because they were still a part of her family. However, this was not the case for El, and he gazed back at the Marquis and his son, Gleton, with all his hatred and anger, as they still stood together on the battlefield, doing nothing to change their situation. El raised his hand into the air and conjured another magical circle, which looked slightly different from his previous ones. He wanted to show the Marquis and Gleton the Iron Mace of Justice. A large black phoenix, engulfed in black flames, appeared before the magical red circle. The phoenix immediately started screeching loudly, causing the guards and the rest of the Einhardt family's army to cover their ears as the sound was too deafening. Even Gleton had to shield his ears and couldn't withstand El's magic. The Marquis realized that El had employed sound force magic to lower the morale of his subjects and that El was even capable of overwhelming his son, who was also at the seventh level of magic, using this magic, despite Gleton being at the fifth level. 
Then, the Marquis looked up at L with his glowing red eyes and used a magic that directly infiltrated L's mind. L heard a voice in his head praising him, saying that he had done well with what he had done. The voice lauded his great talent and assured him that it wasn't too late and he could still join the family. However, L remained entirely unimpressed and rather bored. The Marquis greedily eyed L and continued with his magic, attempting to manipulate L further with his voice. He claimed that it was a great loss not to welcome someone as talented as L into his family. Furthermore, he offered L a deal, if he switched sides, the Marquis could arrange for his family to forget everything that had happened that day. They could lead a normal life, and he would guarantee the safety of L's mother and his two sisters. Then he asked L what he thought about this idea. L still looked down at the Marquis, feeling a strange sensation as he heard the voice in his head. He wondered if this was the brainwashing spell. Floating in the air, L couldn't believe that the evil old man not only wanted to enchant his father, the other magicians, and his mother but was now attempting it on him as well. L addressed the Marquis and asked him a question. As the Marquis looked up at L from below, he realized that his brainwashing spell had no effect on him and that L was indeed at the seventh level of magic. In response to L's question about how he could do something so cruel to his own family, the Marquis was initially taken aback and briefly shocked, but then he began to laugh. He raised his hands up and laughed like an old comic book villain. The Marquis explained to L that many aristocrats would sell their own children for the sake of the family, and that this was actually a normal thing. L continued to look down at him and realized that this man was no longer human but more like a monster. The Marquis then asked L where he had learned such magic and praised him for reaching the seventh level at the age of seventeen, which was an impressive achievement. L understood that he was actually speaking to a monster. Only interested in extracting his secrets. He floated down a bit, still above the Marquis, and told him that he had learned everything on his own and no one else had taught him these skills. The Marquis couldn't believe it and expressed his doubts. However, L reiterated that this was the truth, and he had truly learned everything by himself. The Marquis still didn't want to believe him and stated that it didn't seem like he would learn the truth from him. In response, L said that he detested and hated people like the Marquis the most, people who viewed their family as tools and treated them accordingly. Nevertheless, L raised his hand and made a proposal to the Marquis. Curiously, the Marquis asked what it was. L asked him if he would be allowed to leave with his family and spread the truth about what he, Glutton, and the prince had done. In that case, the Marquis would be in trouble. The Marquis wanted to know where L was going with this. L held a small golden coin in his hand and explained that this coin contained his memories, which he had captured using his magic. The Marquis was shocked. L knew that this truth would threaten the Einhardt family but he also realized that the fact that the prince was involved in the kidnapping and brainwashing was equally severe. If it came to light that the prince was involved, countless battles against the kingdom would be waged by various families. Which could possibly lead to the downfall of the mighty kingdom of Blyard. L looked at the coin and saw the reflection of the Marquis and his son. He said that they could prevent him from spreading this information and thus the truth by fighting against each other without interference from outsiders. He explained that he believed he could only feel better if they had an honest fight with each other. He also assured them that if they managed to defeat him, he would destroy the coin and disappear. The Marquis told his son to prepare himself, leaving the son somewhat shocked as he turned to his father, not quite understanding what was going on. The Marquis explained to his son that it would be more advantageous for them to attack simultaneously and urged them to do their best. His son had the same insane grin on his face as his father and agreed. L looked down at his two opponents and realized that it was time to get serious. He touched his head with a finger and used some magic. Then he prepared for an attack, holding an orb in his hand. He told the Marquis and his son that they were underestimating him greatly and angrily fired his magic at them, showing them what desperation feels like. However, the Marquis and Glutton were able to directly counter L's first attack with a counterspell that looked much darker than the spell L had cast. 
when the two spells collided, there was another tremendous explosion. Meanwhile, elsewhere, a person knelt before their king and greeted him. The king told the person that they probably had already heard, but still informed them that there were witnesses reporting the use of seventh-level magic. The man with red hair, Duke Klyon, who was kneeling before his king, confirmed that he had also heard about it. The king explained that this was a very serious matter, and if a member of the Einhardt family was responsible for the seventh-level magic and the resulting explosion due to an experiment, he would hold them personally responsible. However, he added that if there were problems in the Marquis residence, he should leave them there as long as possible and only then address the situation. The red-haired man asked why he should intervene at the end. To which his king explained that the Einhardt family had become far too powerful, and this was a good opportunity to weaken them a bit again. Duke Client agreed with his king and thought that his majesty was a very intimidating man. He knew that his king had spoken with the Marquis of the Einhardt family back then and had told him that in an empire, there must always be a sufficiently strong opposing force, and had secretly helped the Marquis of Einhardt come to power. But now, with the Marquis becoming much more powerful than he had planned, the king wanted to try to damage him a bit to minimize his influence. Duke Klyon had expected nothing less from his king, who ruled over everything. The king told the duke that he would lend him ten men from his royal knights and a hundred men from the central knight order, knowing that the duke would lead and deploy them properly. He entrusted the mission entirely to the duke. The duke looked up and accepted the assignment he had received, intending to carry it out to the best of his ability. As he was about to take his leave, another person joined the conversation. It was Prince al qaeda The king asked the prince what he wanted. The prince said he would like to ask a favor and inquired if he had heard correctly that the duke was now heading to the Marquis of Einhardt. The duke confirmed this immediately. The prince then asked if he could accompany him. Expressing the desire to seize the opportunity to diminish the Marquis' influence and power. He looked at the duke and the king with a conflicted expression, as his real goal in this journey was silver. He wanted to ensure that he would take advantage of this opportunity to win her over. The king asked the prince if he believed he could handle the Einhardt family and overpower them. The prince responded to the king's question, saying that he thought he could handle it and that it would be a good experience for him. The king granted permission and told both the duke and the prince to proceed cautiously to the Einhardt estate. Both understood the order and prepared to ride out. They were each on their horses. The Duke and the Prince The Prince told the Duke that he was already excited to work with him. The Duke replied that now that the Prince was joining his mission, he wasn't sure if he had anything left to do. The Prince laughed amiably and agreed with the Duke's words. However, Klyon was still unsure about the Prince accompanying him and looked at him questioningly from behind. The Prince shouted loudly for everyone to show their enthusiasm prompting the knights accompanying the prince and the duke to cheer loudly and display their eagerness. They set off for the Einhardt family estate to investigate and weaken the Marquis' power. Meanwhile, the battle between the Marquis, Gleton, and L continued, and the earth trembled repeatedly. L was still hovering in the air, in the process of creating a cosmic hand with his magic, ready to attack the Marquis. However, the Marquis laughed in the face of the danger posed by L's spell and was astonished by how fast and powerful L's spells were. As L continued his attack towards the Marquis, the latter couldn't help but think that usually none of his opponents got the chance to launch an attack against him, as he would have defeated them the moment they prepared a spell. Gleton was in the process of preparing a spell, lifting his fingers like in Naruto and chanting an incantation. Runes appeared around him, forming a magical circle of fire magic around his fingers. Shortly after, he cast the spell, Flame Storm, and sent it towards L. Smiling, he was curious to see how L would handle his attack. Gleton was quite arrogant, proud that he could cast this sixth-class magic so quickly. L prepared to counter the attack and also used magic to create a massive earth wall to block Gleton's swirling fire attack. The Marquis, Still unaware that he shouldn't engage in battle with L, took the opportunity to use his light magic, lightning arrow, and attack L. 
However, El effortlessly countered the Marquis magic with a few deft steps and repelled his attack. Now it was El's turn to strike back. He extended both hands forward, creating a magical circle around them that formed a kind of magical armor around El's body. El controlled the elements of fire, light, wind, water, and earth magic around him, similar to the Avatar from Avatar, The Last Airbender. He combined these magics and hurled a few stones at the Marquis and Gleton, who couldn't believe what they were seeing. But El wanted to show more and took it further by using the same technique as his uncle Gleton and launching a second attack directly at the Marquis and Gleton without giving them a chance to counter. Gleton couldn't believe his eyes, he was surprised that El only needed to see his secret technique once and could now use it even faster than him. This was a technique that set him apart from other magicians on the same level. As he could execute it in a flash and defeat his opponents despite being on the same level. He cursed but still managed to cast a defensive spell and shielded himself with three magical barriers to counter El's attack. However, the flames were too strong and destroyed each shield. Just before they could reach Gleton, he managed to teleport to safety, evading the flames. Gleton teleported high into the air and then planned to surprise El and launch a counterattack. Gleton, however, couldn't locate El's position and frantically looked left and right to find his opponent. Suddenly, El appeared behind his uncle and told him that he was way too slow and would never surprise him as he just did. Gleton turned around and saw El, realizing that he was moving much too quickly. El extended his hand again, preparing to finish off his uncle. Shocked, Gleton used magic again and swiftly flew to the ground to escape El's grasp. El cast a sort of Japanese, hentai, spell, with tentacle-like magical manifestations trying to ensnare his uncle. He remarked that his uncle was far too slow and wouldn't have a chance to escape at that speed. The Marquis recognized the spell El was casting and knew that the net spell was meant to restrict the opponent's movements, but he also knew that his son would handle such a spell with ease. Gleton raised his finger, releasing a small orb that generated a whirlwind of fire, pushing back the net-like tentacles. Gleton was confident that such a spell wouldn't do much against him. El then charged towards Gleton with his magic, but Gleton continued to defend against El's attack with his fire magic. The Marquis observed the spectacle from a safe distance and was pleased that El's tentacle net attack had failed, knowing that net magic was at a disadvantage against fire magic. He smugly grinned. Meanwhile, El and Gleton continued their intense battle, with neither willing to give in. Gleton was clearly on the defensive, while El, who had to conserve some of his powers and couldn't fight as ruthlessly as his opponents, was on the offensive. The Marquis saw another opportunity to launch a surprise attack. The sky darkened, and lightning flashed through the dark clouds. The Marquis extended his hand toward the sky, and mage runes formed around it again. He praised his son for holding El back, allowing him to prepare his spell. Everything was going exactly as he had planned. He looked to the sky, confident that the next attack would defeat El. When he was ready, the Marquis shouted, Thunderstrike! And a massive bolt of lightning crashed through the cloud cover, heading straight for El. Gleton and the Marquis had already put on the victorious smile, knowing it should be over any moment. The lightning continued to approach El, who stood motionless and made no attempt to defend against it. He faced the lightning with the same look as a deer facing car headlights at night. But at the last moment, he grinned and summoned a massive lightning rod using his magic, intercepting the entire lightning bolt before it could touch him, rendering the Marquis attack completely ineffective. The Marquis couldn't believe it and found it impossible what had just happened before his eyes. It made no sense to him. El told him that his attack wasn't bad, and he had indeed surprised him. Still unable to believe that El had successfully defended against his thunderstrike, the Marquis asked what kind of magic it was. El then turned around and asked him with a smile on his face why he should reveal it to him. He said it would be foolish to share such important and valuable information with his enemy. This arrogance, the grin, and the fact that he couldn't harness that power infuriated the Marquis. El looked at his lightning rod with pride, realizing that it was highly effective, 
successfully absorbing all the light magic. He knew that normally, fire magic is considered the opposite of water magic. But as a defensive method, water magic wasn't very effective, as fire magic could boil the water and burn the water magic user. From a young age, L had conducted a lot of research because he was curious about the different types of magic. He discovered that the best way to counter fire magic was with earth magic, and water magic could be best fought with plant magic. Against wind magic, stone or iron magic would be most effective. Only what to use against lightning magic had puzzled him, as it was more complicated than the other types of magic. He knew that weak lightning magic could be easily stopped by stone or iron magic, but if it were strong lightning magic, simple stones or iron wouldn't suffice. That was when he remembered his old readings about lightning rods in his world. This was the first time L had tried this kind of magic, and for a first attempt, the result was impressive, it had worked perfectly, neutralizing a seventh level lightning spell. L took the opportunity to look down at Glutton, who was also surprised that L had countered his father's magic with his unknown magic. For a second, Glutton forgot that he was in the midst of a life and death battle. L seized the moment and shouted to Glutton that this would be his end. He conjured his cosmic hand again, which appeared from a portal right in front of Glutton and delivered a powerful slap, sending him flying to the ground. Defeated and bloodied. The Marquis looked shocked at his son lying on the ground and couldn't quite grasp what had just happened when L already declared that it was now a one on one fight. L looked down at Glutton and realized that he would likely be bedridden for a year and unable to move. He pointed at the Marquis and told him that he would be next. L used his flame arrow magic, creating a large number of magical arrows in the night sky, illuminating it, and ready to descend upon the Marquis. Fearfully, the Marquis held his hands forward, realizing that L's magic was no joke, and his situation was more serious than ever before. He tried to cast a shield like he did before to defend against L's attack and then countered with his flame burst spell, hurling it directly towards L. However, L easily deflected this spell as well and responded with his Infinity Magic Arrow spell. He created arrows in the sky, directly targeting the ground beneath him, only much smaller, but as the name suggests, an infinite number of them. L explained to the Marquis that although these arrows might be smaller and weaker individually, their infinite quantity made them extremely powerful. The Marquis didn't know how to respond and simply looked amazed into the air. As the arrows descended upon him, he once again used a shield magic to protect himself. L's arrows rained down, one after another, on the Marquis's shield, visibly putting it under pressure and pushing him back. The arrows kept coming, and the shield was on the verge of giving in to the enormous strain. Even in his current situation, the Marquis couldn't believe he was struggling against such inferior magic. He wondered how he could be struggling so hard against a second rate magician and realized that he was supposed to be called the most powerful magician on the continent. He looked at L and realized that he was merely fighting against a 17 year old child. Suddenly, an idea came to the Marquis and he questioned whether L was really only 17 years old. He thought that this understanding of magic and these sophisticated strategies should come from someone much more experienced and older. He wondered if this might be a prank by another great magician. He had no way of knowing that L was already in his second life and had lived a previous life as Kim Jun sung He looked at L and wondered who he could be and why his family had been completely destroyed thanks to him, and cursed him. Finally, the Marquis's shield broke like a shattered mirror into many small pieces. He looked through these shards and saw L's attack still coming towards him. The many arrows continued their path, and now they finally hit their target. The Marquis bled from several direct hits and fell back to the ground, lying there defeated and bloodied, just like his son. His guards couldn't believe what had just happened before their eyes and called out the Marquis name to see if he was still conscious. Finally, L landed on the ground. His anger had not subsided, and he looked at the fallen Marquis with rage and hatred. He said that he wouldn't kill him and his son, as it wouldn't be an appropriate punishment for them. Instead, he wanted to take away their ability to use magic, 
just as they had intended to do with his beloved mother. The weight bearing down on the Marquis increased, pressing him further into the ground. L explained that he wouldn't kill them but still wanted to inflict more harm upon them. Runes formed around him, and he was about to unleash his spell, Bone Break, when suddenly, a loud bang echoed across the battlefield, and L came back to his senses. He turned to his mother and saw her, along with his sisters, still standing at the edge of the battlefield. L looked at his family with sorrowful eyes. At Serena, Cana, and his mother, who told him that it was enough. She asked him to stop. L wasn't sure why she said that and remained silent, gazing at his mother in astonishment. His mother knew the talent of her son and how great it was, but she could hardly believe that at the tender age of seventeen, he had already reached the seventh level of magic and was capable of creating such a powerful golem that managed to defeat a sword master with just one blow, something no other magician had accomplished before. She realized that her little son had grown into such a powerful magician without her knowledge. However, she also knew that the person L was fighting against was her father. And even though she couldn't forgive her father and brother for trying to kill L or subject him to brainwashing, she couldn't allow L to kill her father and brother either. She told L that he had taught them a lesson, and it should be enough. She didn't believe her father and brother would ever again hatch and execute such plans. In the comments, you can write how naive this mother is and how unbearable it is that she wants to stop L from killing them. However, L said that he couldn't comply with her request. He looked at Glutton and his grandfather and said that if he let them go, they would be the type of people who would come back for revenge. His mother said that might be true. But it still wouldn't be right to kill them. Furthermore, she explained to L that he still had his memory magic, with which he could prove their plans at any time, and therefore they couldn't seek revenge recklessly as long as he could use those memories against them. L contemplated and realized that his mother might be right. Additionally, he thought about how if he were to strip the Marquis of his ability to use magic, the entire kingdom would turn against them. That would mean putting his entire family in danger. L agreed with his mother and stated that he wouldn't harm her father and brother. He turned away from the fallen Marquis and told his family that they should leave this vile place as quickly as possible. Furthermore, L suggested to his mother that with her abilities and being ranked sixth in magic, they could find a place far away and lead a peaceful life. His mother agreed and desired exactly what her son wanted. Humbly and with shame, she acknowledged that L was right and had to admit that even though she was the adult between them, she was wrong. Under the full moon and the cloudy night, she had to admit her mistake in bringing L to the Marquis and said that everything was her fault, leading to the current situation. She looked into L's eyes and told him that while power might be important in life, the love within the family was much more crucial. L looked somewhat melancholy at his mother and thought about his family from his previous life but agreed with her statement that family was the most important. L pulled himself together and asked his two sisters if they wanted to come with them and continue to be part of this family. L's mother, Serena, and Cana were a bit puzzled as to why he would suddenly ask this when the answer was already clear. Nevertheless, Cana said she would, of course, stay with him and would go anywhere with him. Serena also said that she wanted to be with him and their new mother wherever they went. L's mother was delighted that her two adopted daughters wanted to stay with them and her son, and she looked quite happy. L approached his family and thanked them for their decision to accompany him. However, he still had something to do and turned around to summon his golden golem. It came directly and knelt before L, ready to receive further commands. L praised his golem for the outstanding work it had done on the battlefield and decided that it was time to give his golem an appropriate name. He named his golem, Tana, and it shone in golden brilliance, expressing gratitude to its master and creator for its name. Just as El was about to use his teleportation magic and disappear with his family, a man suddenly appeared behind him and said that he couldn't allow them to leave now. El immediately turned around, and Tana was ready to confront the stranger. With lightning speed, Tana parried the attack of the unknown person trying to stop El, while El used magic to protect his family as well. The attack was fierce, 
and Tana had some trouble stopping it. The colliding forces grew stronger and built up until they caused an explosion, kicking up some dust. L realized that this attack was truly powerful and that the assailant couldn't be a nobody. Laughing and smug, the prince emerged from behind Duke Klein, stating that he expected nothing less from him, the captain of the royal guards. L recognized him immediately, understanding that the person next to the prince was no ordinary individual. He knew he had to step up his game to avoid losing. He called on Tana to activate the third mode. The golem, just previously defending against another attack from Duke Klein to protect L and his family, broke another of its seals upon L's command, activating its third stage. Tana raised a hand and effortlessly blocked Duke Klein's attack. He even managed to push back the Duke and the Prince slightly. However, when Klein noticed that he was being forced into a defensive position, he halted his assault and curiously asked L who he was. He was amazed and acknowledged L's talent, but also pointed out that someone with such talent should normally fight on the kingdom's side. Klein explained to L that he had attacked the Einhardt family and their leaders, who were vital to the kingdom. This act was akin to declaring war directly against the kingdom. L listened to Duke Klein without appearing to resist. The Duke continued, stating that he didn't really want a conflict with him but felt he had no other choice given the circumstances. At this point, the prince interrupted and questioned what he was saying. Pointing at L, he asserted that they couldn't let these traitors escape so easily and should punish them with death to protect the dignity of their beloved kingdom. The prince greedily grinned, his mind solely focused on reaching his ultimate goal, making L's mother, Silfer, his own. L angrily clenched his fist, immediately recognizing the prince's true intentions and knowing that everything was merely a ploy to make his beloved mother his lover. As the moon slowly disappeared behind thick clouds, L told Duke Klein that he needed to apologize, but he had no intention of joining the kingdom. He stated, while pointing angrily at the prince, that he would destroy him now. He ordered Tana to keep Duke Klein busy until he could accomplish this, which the golem immediately understood and was ready to carry out. Tana channeled golden energy into her hand again and summoned the golden sword, which somehow always disappeared whenever another of its seals was broken. Duke Klein and Tana faced each other, preparing for battle. Klein told her that he was ready and she could attack first. L floated in the air, focusing his attention on the prince. He made it clear that he would be his opponent, impressively manipulating the mana around him to strengthen it for his next attack. With intense concentration on the battlefield and the prince, L stated that they should begin. This unsettled the prince. L also reminded him that he had already warned him not to stare at his mother with his dirty, vile eyes. Since the prince disregarded this warning, L couldn't forgive him. Silfer screamed her son's name from below, causing L to turn around and ask his mother what she wanted now. She pleaded with him to let it be and to walk away as it was too dangerous to confront and fight the prince. L attentively listened to his mother and reassured her that they shouldn't worry because he already had a plan. He explained that it would also be too dangerous to let the prince go unpunished. Then, he shifted his focus to the soldiers on the ground, along with the duke and the prince on the battlefield. He raised his hand and invoked his spell, Infinity Magic Arrow, once more. Many small arrows appeared in the sky under the symbol of infinity, targeting the prince and his guards. L knew that a warrior who had reached the rank of swordmaster had trained his body to act as armor and wouldn't behave like that of an ordinary person or mage. With a smooth gesture, L commanded the arrows of his magic to rain down on his opponents. The guards defended themselves by holding their hands above their heads and slightly ducking to fend off the arrows. However, L realized that this attack wasn't meant to cause significant harm but rather to disrupt their formation. Swiftly, he conjured a large hammer and attacked the prince to disorient him. The prince could only marvel as L suddenly appeared before him and struck him. With a powerful and critical hit, L swung his hammer, directly impacting the prince, sending him flying far away and visibly inflicting damage. In the end, the prince and his guards were lying on the ground, bleeding and groaning from the severe injuries they sustained. 
El rested his massive hammer on his shoulder, realizing that this attack should have caused significant internal wounds to the prince. He knew that external wounds could be easily healed with divine magic. But the inner wounds would take more time to successfully mend. Duke Klyon was still engaged in combat with Tana but still managed to ask, upon seeing the prince defeated, how he was doing. Duke Klyon wanted to help the prince but also realized that if he was distracted for even a second, he would be seriously endangered, as Tana was an honorable adversary for him. Tana gained the upper hand in the fight, pushing the duke further into a defensive position. Just as it seemed Tana would win the battle, El commanded her to stop and return to the interdimensional space. Tana immediately understood her master's command and signaled this with a brief upward glance from her eyes through the slit in her helmet. Tana glowed and was about to vanish into the interdimensional space when the duke yelled that he wouldn't let her escape so easily and launched another attack. Many small magical sword blades appeared around him, aiming at Tana, who was still in the process of vanishing. The duke's swords flew at lightning speed towards her and struck her all over her body. There was a critical hit on her arm, causing it to fall off and crash to the ground. The duke laughed with satisfaction as he realized that his attack had an effect on the golem. However, not even a full second later, Tana's arm reappeared on her body. She moved it around to ensure it was properly attached. The duke looked somewhat surprised and couldn't help but curse. Tana glowed brighter and vanished as El had ordered. Although the duke admitted defeat in this battle, he chuckled for a moment, sighed with relief, and had to admit that he thought he had her with the last attack, only to realize she had vanished with the blink of an eye. Then, the duke looked over at El, who held the memory coin in his hand. El extracted the memories from the coin and created a copy in the form of a small orb. He looked at the newly created orb and explained that he would destroy the coin but had made a copy of it before. As the unconscious prince lay in the background, in pain, bleeding, and groaning on the ground, El stated that everything he had done was contained within this memory magic. He emphasized that he wouldn't hesitate to spread this information throughout the kingdom or even the entire continent if the duke or his family ever tried to harm him again. His mother and sisters ran to him and were relieved that everything had turned out well and that he wasn't hurt. L turned to Duke Klyon and apologized for the disturbance and inconvenience. As he used his magic and the runes of his teleportation spell appeared around him, he told the duke that he hoped they would never meet as enemies again and bid him farewell. The duke could still hardly believe that L was truly the villain and could only stare in astonishment as he watched him teleport away with his family. Duke Klyon was not a bad person and also admitted that L was truly a genius, wishing he had met him under different circumstances. As he carefully observed the battlefield and saw the injured knights, he pondered how to explain the situation and plan his next steps. The incident at the Marquis residence was subsequently covered up. However, news of the appearance of a very young mage and his golden knight golem, as powerful as a grandmaster, spread across the entire continent, shocking all nations. It was a shocking debut for El in this world. So, some time passed, and El and his family settled into a new small cottage on the edge of a mountain, spending some time in peace and tranquility. Without any power-hungry tyrants. The sun shone, smoke rose from the chimney, and the overall atmosphere was extremely calm. El tapped his index finger on the table, contemplating what he would do next while trying to stow a book into the subspace bag. He realized that he had literally destroyed the Einhard estate, defeated his uncle and grandfather, and inflicted severe internal and external injuries on the prince. He acknowledged that he had committed these crimes and wouldn't be able to return to Banzark, where he originally intended to come with his mother, without causing further harm. L opened the window and saw the bright sun outside. He couldn't even blame the kingdom if they pursued and killed him here and now. However, he knew they would never do that because he still had his memory magic, which could prove their dark deeds. Moreover, as he stood by the window and enjoyed the tranquility, he realized that he had learned a lot during the fight. His spell casting time, the time he needed to prepare his spells, and his ability to combine spells were better than that of any other mage on the continent. 
He was also confident that he would become even stronger if he learned a few support spells. He also recognized the amazing potential of Tana, his golden knight golem. He recalled that he had managed to overpower even the Grandmaster Duke and briefly gain the upper hand. The last five years of hard work he had invested in his skills and his golem had not been in vain and would finally bear fruit. It was definitely worth putting so much effort into himself and his golem. He knew that if he could produce more of them, he might be able to conquer the whole world with such an army. However, he was also aware that it would take three years to create such a golem, and the cost of such production was very high and couldn't be easily borne. Additionally, L realized that the most important lesson he had learned from the battle against the Marquis and his son was that the power of a group exceeds that of an individual and that there were things he couldn't handle alone. In such cases, he had to accept help. After the fight, as rumors about L spread throughout the world, many nations began to hire people to search for him. L was sure that some of these individuals were not necessarily friendly and had evil intentions. He rested his face on his hands, contemplating that he would need to further develop himself before these people could reach him. However, he didn't yet know how to achieve that. Suddenly, there was a knock on the door, and as L turned around, his mother asked if she could come in. He said she could, inviting her into his room. She entered along with his two sisters, Serena and Kena. Serena and Kena looked relatively happy, but his mother seemed somewhat agitated and had a sad expression. L asked what was wrong, knowing that since the incident, everyone had been a bit awkward and needed time to digest what had happened. His mother nervously played with her hands and hesitantly asked her son how long he had been so strong. L explained that he had hidden his strength because he knew nobody would believe that he could have reached such a level at such a young age. He also told his mother that he had been afraid of putting her in danger if the wrong people found out how powerful he really was. He didn't want to reveal more to his family, not even that he had lived another life in a different world. So, L simply said that he was still her only son, despite having such incredible power. His mother believed him and softened her saddened face. She realized that, despite everything, he was still her son. The son she had raised and who came from her beloved husband. She apologized with a happy expression and said she was sorry for treating him differently without knowing he had his own reasons. Elle tried to lighten the mood further, jokingly wondering what she would think if he gained many fans by sharing and revealing his identity as a genius in magic. His mother laughed and told him to stay humble. With a smile on his face, L continued to joke around with his mother, telling her and his sisters that he had something important to discuss with them. They were curious and looked at their brother, asking what was so important that he wanted to discuss it with them. Due to the incident at the Einhardt family estate, which he was responsible for, L explained that they could no longer return to Banzark. He pointed to a spot on a map and said that he had been thinking about what they should do. He explained that there were a total of five kingdoms in the west of the Serdian continent, and many mage towers existed in that region. Furthermore, he continued, the west was divided into many smaller hundred nations, which, with a few exceptions, were mostly weak nations without many mage towers. L said with a radiant smile and full of excitement that he planned to create his own magical tower there. Kena was somewhat confused and asked if she had heard correctly, that he wanted to create his own magical tower. L explained to her that it would be a tower similar to the one they had in their hometown, where the tower master used to live. He further explained to his family that only level 7 mages would be able to create such a magical tower. Such a tower would be strong enough to kill thousands of soldiers in a war, should one break out. Consequently, nations would be willing to invest a lot of money in such a construction project. Kena marveled at the idea while her sister asked L where he intended to build such a tower. L pointed again to the map and showed his family a small place called Tolian Kingdom. Tolian Kingdom was a large place with fertile land, a large population, and a stronger military force than its neighboring countries. He raved that it was a strong nation, but it did not yet possess a mage tower. He also mentioned that the surrounding land was inhabited by monsters, 
and the locals suffered significant losses every year due to this fact, especially in a small place called Manticore Valley. L said that if they were to offer to destroy this place for the Tolian kingdom, they would surely appreciate the gesture. His mother asked if he had more to tell and contemplated what she would think of the proposal. L continued by saying that the king was a good person, and the aristocrats around him trusted and believed in him. However, he also admitted that the princes were having a dispute among themselves, which the king could not resolve. L's mother asked if this was a problem. To which L replied that it was neither good nor bad but irrelevant to his plan. He knew that the princes were mages interested in power but also mentioned that a mage tower would not usually get involved in political matters, so it didn't matter. The main problem they would need to address for his plan to work were the monsters living in the Manticore Valley and the nearby Orc Forest. El was sure that the military force of the Tolian Kingdom would be sufficient to deal with the Orc Forest, but if they were to focus all their forces there, they wouldn't be able to handle the Manticore Valley. So, El explained that he would take over this valley, and if he succeeded, it could expand the influence of the kingdom. Kena, El's mother, and Serena stood in the room, pondering. Kena gathered her courage and was the first to ask her brother if they could also find a master for her to teach her swordsmanship. El had to admit that this was something they should also pursue. While he could show her some breathing techniques, as he wasn't a master of swordsmanship, he couldn't provide further assistance. So, he told her that they would surely find a suitable teacher for her there, considering the presence of a powerful military force. Kena was overjoyed and thanked him. However, Serena also wanted to become stronger and asked her brother if he could help and continue to teach her. Folding her hands together. She explained that she had felt very weak during the events at the Einhardt family estate. Originally, she thought she could defend herself, but when she saw El fighting against the Marquis and his son, she realized that she wasn't as strong as she had imagined. With determination and ambition, she expressed her desire to become stronger. This surprised El but also made him radiant and happy. He wanted to fulfill his sister's request gladly. Their mother also stated that she wanted to become stronger and asked to be taught by him as well. Well, maybe you should start by using your brain, that would already help a lot, he joked. Everyone looked happily at El, sharing the common desire to become strong. He wanted to help them all and asked if they agreed, smiling at them. Afterward, it was time to leave their cozy home and prepare for the next adventure to travel to Tolian Kingdom. In the nearby forest, faint noises were heard. The king of Tolian kingdom was out with a guard and stopped in the middle of the path when he heard the sounds. Anxiously, they looked left and right to find the cause. One of the guards warned the king to be careful, informing him that the monster rate in this forest was higher than ever before. Worriedly, the king wondered if civilians would continue to be in danger under such circumstances and if there was no hero who could save them. Suddenly, a black and eerie shadow in the form of a devil appeared before them. Observing them. Nevertheless, the king and his guards continued their way, despite the dangerous forest and the noises. Eventually, they reached a cliff from where they had a beautiful view of the Tolian kingdom. The realm lay in the middle of the water, surrounded by a kind of small mountain with a small harbor and a bridge to the mainland. The king sat down at the edge of the cliff, deep in thought, when suddenly another man approached him from behind. It was Duke Lias, a friend of the king, who asked him what he was pondering, if he was worried, and if there were any problems. The king, looking troubled, explained to his friend Lias that he was thinking about his three sons. He described how the conflict between them over who should be his successor was worsening day by day. And he feared that one day his kingdom would suffer because of this strife. Lias knelt down to his majesty, trying to comfort him. He said that just as the rain falls to the ground and nourishes the earth, he was certain that this conflict between his sons would somehow strengthen and unite the kingdom. He further explained that he believed the king should appoint his third son, Prince Judmian, as the crown prince for the good of the kingdom. As he wanted to discuss whether he should choose the first prince, Prince Maxil, or the second prince, Prince Cran, as the crown prince, the king interrupted him with a sigh. 
He knew himself that Maxwell treated people like objects and his personality was anything but good. It was terrible and violent. He was also aware of his second son, Cran, who had similar qualities to Maxwell, though not as overtly displayed. He had to admit that neither of the two was suitable to be king. Instead, the king recognized that Judmian, his third son, was a warm-hearted and friendly leader whom his subjects deserved and whom he would prefer to appoint as king for their welfare. Unfortunately, 90% of the aristocrats supported either his first son, Maxel, or his second son, Cran. Some of Judmian's supporters included the highest swordmaster and leader of the royal guard, Captain Duke Lias, as well as the swordmaster of the capital city, Captain Count Lomo. This provided a balance between the three sons. As two leaders of the Order of Knights stood on Judmian's side. However, the king didn't even want to think about what would happen if the first and second princes were to go against their younger brother and try to overthrow him. The mere thought pained his head. Due to this succession conflict, the king couldn't focus as much on state affairs as he would have liked, and the monsters continued to pour out of the forest, attacking his subjects unabated. The king held his head and tried not to lose his composure amidst all the thoughts. He knew he had to try to handle state affairs while also keeping an eye on the monsters. Suddenly, the king realized he was talking to himself and wondered where his friend Duke Lias had gone. Startled, he turned around and saw Duke Lias and his guards tense before him, ready to defend his majesty. Cautionarily, Duke Lias drew his sword and urged the king to stay back and be cautious. The guards realized that they were surrounded. One of the guards asked if they were surrounded by monsters, to which another guard turned suspiciously and began to laugh dirtily. Suddenly, the treacherous guard attacked the one who had just asked the question. The king and Duke Lias were astonished. Duke Lias asked why he would do such a thing and why he had killed his own comrade. The treacherous guard claimed that they had been enemies from the beginning, and more hidden guards emerged from nearby bushes. Duke Lias bravely stood in front of his king and ordered the other guards to do everything to defend him. The treacherous guard told the king to wait a little longer and that it was only a matter of time before they would get their hands on him. She pointed her sword at him and declared that she wanted to kill him herself and would do anything to achieve that goal. The king realized that he had trusted his guards, who had turned out to be traitors. He knelt at the edge of the cliff and asked his god if he had abandoned him and his kingdom. Meanwhile, in the chambers of a magical tower, a tower master sat at a table and communicated with two other tower masters through their magic. Two magic-created screens with runes were floating before him. One of the mages on the other side of the screens asked why he had initiated this meeting when their master was not present. The one who had called the meeting and sat at the table was the magic tower master Karasman. He had a cool red beard and mustache, as well as red hair. The unfriendly mage on the other end of the line remarked that he hoped Karasman hadn't forgotten that they all had much to do and didn't really have time to attend this meeting. Karasman explained that their master had instructed him to hold this meeting and that he should pass on important information to both of them. He raised a finger and said that the first important piece of information was that the plan to kill the current king of Tolian kingdom in Manticore village was already underway. Once the king was dead, the first prince Maxel would take over the throne and everything else. Ryzen, one of the mages sitting at the other end of the screen, suggested that they should use their golems to rid the nearby monster land of monsters and use the military to subjugate the nearby other nations. Ryzen adjusted his glasses and said that this should be an easy task for the golems, as they were the strongest on the entire continent. Karasman continued and explained that their master also had news about a knight golem in the Blyard Kingdom. Ryzen was utterly astonished and could hardly believe his ears when Karasman said this. He asked what it meant and who else could possibly create such a knight golem if not him. Karasman explained that there was a major incident in the Einhardt family where a seventh-level mage and his knight golem played a crucial role. Ryzen was once again astonished, his eyes wide open. Karasman explained to the other two mages that the power emanating from the knight golem should be at least that of a grandmaster, and he also mentioned that this golem had its own consciousness. 
Ryzen was speechless and had to ponder for a moment, stroking his beard. He explained that if an Orharthon were gone, he wouldn't be able to create a night golem. Moreover, his regular golem would take around 30 days to create. Ryzen couldn't believe that someone else besides him was capable of creating night golems. And on the level of a grandmaster with its own consciousness no less. However, Karasman said that was only half the reason for concern because he knew that such a golem couldn't be created overnight. It would take several years to create such a powerful golem. Nevertheless, he said they couldn't just sit back and do nothing. Therefore, he tasked Ryzen with gathering information about this golem and asked if he understood. Ryzen wanted to search and do everything possible to find this person and speak to them personally. While the king was in an ambush and Karasman, Ryzen and another unknown mage were discussing their devious plans, our protagonist L just lay there on his wall and calmly relaxed. He realized that he was indeed in Tolian kingdom now, but he wondered how he could make contact with the king. He knew it wouldn't be a good idea to spread rumors about his presence, as it could draw attention from the Einhardt family and the Blyard kingdom, revealing his hiding place. He wanted to somehow meet and talk to the king in a normal and inconspicuous manner, but he couldn't come up with any ideas on how to achieve that. He turned on the wall and desperately wondered what he should do. El's mother stood with his sisters beside him and mentioned that she was hungry and suggested they look for a small place to eat together. El straightened up and agreed. Suddenly, he felt something, and it hit him like a lightning bolt. He wondered where this sudden surge of power was coming from. He recognized the wavelength of the energy and knew it had to be the power of a sword master. Quickly, he jumped up and realized that the power he felt was coming from the north. Since El had probably forgotten to speak and everything happened so quickly, his mother asked what was wrong with him. El skillfully ignored the question and noticed that the sudden surge of power was coming from the forest, where there shouldn't normally be any people. He also realized that this place was very close to the king's palace and wondered if the king might be somehow involved. El's mother continued to ask in bewilderment what was wrong with him and even called his name, but El only apologized and floated away. He told his family to go ahead and have their meal without him. Duke Lias and his loyal guards, who were not treacherous traitors, surrounded their king and did their best to defend him. However, Lias recognized that many enemies were taking advantage of the cover of darkness and using this opportunity to ambush the king. He knew that if the situation didn't change soon, there could be serious danger, and the king would die. Suddenly, one of the enemy knights attacked, shouting the king's name. Faced with the sword swinging towards him, the king wondered if this was his end. However, just in time, El created a shield in front of the king, who had rolled up behind him, deflecting the attack of the knight. The king looked around in astonishment, wondering what had just happened and what had protected him from the warrior's attack. El floated onto the battlefield and said he had no idea what was happening, but he didn't like the idea of someone being ambushed so treacherously in the cover of darkness. He found it to be a bad sign and didn't want to let the attackers simply escape. El looked down at the battlefield and asked the enemy soldiers if they needed a moment to come up with excuses. However, they remained in their fighting stance and said nothing. El thanked them for giving him the opportunity, but he also made it clear that they would still die. The king and his followers were puzzled and couldn't quite understand who El was, what he was going to do, and why he had appeared just now. One of the king's loyal knights shouted at El to please save his majesty. El was shocked to find out that he had just saved the king, while Lias took a more rational approach and told the knight not to act hastily, as El could also be an enemy. El looked at the king and realized that he was indeed King Lidolf of Tolian Kingdom. He turned his gaze to the enemy soldiers and said that he now fully understood the situation and had recognized the enemy knights who were after the king. He explained that he wouldn't spare them for such an act. El raised his hand and shaped a small orb with the swirling mana and the words, Misery and Destruction, which then expanded into a large portal behind him. Shortly after, one could see Tana's hands making their way through the portal and practically tearing it open. El summoned his Golden Knight Golem right at the beginning of the battle, 
standing behind him and ready to fight once again for his master. The king and his duke were astonished by this spectacle. While the king had heard the rumors, seeing L in action made it hard for him to believe that they were about a young boy. Nevertheless, he could feel an incredible amount of power emanating from L and wondered who this young mage was. L raised his hand again and created a small ice crystal, which he fired at the ground to freeze the enemy soldiers, hindering their escape and rendering them immobilized. He declared that he could defeat them all with a single blow and ordered Tana to proceed. However, he instructed her to spare some of the enemy knights so they could be interrogated later to find out who was behind this attack. Tana confirmed her master's command, while the king continued to be amazed and fascinated by El's strength, trying to grasp the extent of his magic and understand it. The enemy knights tried to break free from the ice and resist, but they couldn't escape, let alone move properly. Tana followed El's orders and rushed forward. As she ran, she reached out her hand, calling her golden sword to her, which appeared in her hand, enveloped in flames just as it had been on the Einhardt family's battlefield. Tana wasted no time and swung her sword horizontally from right to left, swiftly dispatching the enemy soldiers and creating a powerful recoil that killed them instantly. The king and his duke were once again astonished by the overwhelming power of El and his golem, trying to comprehend what had happened in that split second. El thanked his golden golem Tana and praised her for her excellent work, to which Tana bowed before him and expressed her gratitude. The king realized that this must be the mage the rumors were about. The highest mage in Tolian kingdom was currently only at the sixth level of magic, but if the king could win El over, he would finally have a mage of the seventh level in his kingdom. El approached the king and asked if he had been injured, introducing himself as El. The visibly relieved king thanked him for his help. El explained that it was nothing and that he had only taken care of a few bad guys. He also mentioned that he deliberately left some of them alive so he could interrogate them to find out who would do such a thing to him. He hoped that would settle the matter and that such ambushes could be minimized in the future. Meanwhile, the king's loyal guards were busy arresting the remaining traitors. The king was astonished that El not only saved his life but also had the foresight to think beyond that. He invited El to dine with him and emphasized that a simple verbal thank you would not be enough under these circumstances. El played along, pretending to consider the invitation, but ultimately accepted, which made the king very happy and gave him a radiant expression. The king explained that he would inform his mage about the invitation and would order him to deactivate the seal that prevented teleportation magic intrusion so that El could drop by during the day. El thanked him for that and then apologized, stating that he must leave now. He conjured a magical circle beneath him and prepared for teleportation magic. However, as he teleported away, leaving the king alone at the cliff in the forest, he added that he was looking forward to the meeting tomorrow. Duke Lias then approached his king, expressing his relief that things had turned out so well. He believed that the mage and the knight golem who had saved them were definitely involved in the incident at Einhardt. Additionally, Lias hoped that they could help with the monster problem they were currently facing. The king turned around and asked his friend if he also believed that El would manage to reach the eighth grade of magic, still feeling very joyful. He compared today's events to a refreshing rain on dry ground, with Duke Lias remarking that one could see it that way. Except for the fact that they had almost died. When El told his family about his little adventure, they were amazed that he had simply met the king. He explained that he had saved the king from an ambush in the forest and received an invitation to the royal palace. His mother could hardly believe that it had gone so well, but she was happy that her son would be meeting with the king. She asked El how she could win his support and wanted to hear his plan. Although Serena and Kana begged him to reveal the plan to them, El remained steadfast, explaining that he would share it with them later. Suddenly, two men approached their table. One of them hugged El's mother and flirted with his sisters, asking if they would like to spend some time with them. One of the men started touching Serena lightly, but El immediately intervened and politely asked him, with a smile, to keep his hands off his family. The man, who didn't quite grasp the situation, asked who El was. El became somewhat serious and repeated, with a firmer grip, that the man should leave his family alone. 
Finally, the man understood the message and assured that he would abide by El's wishes. Subsequently, the man and his friend left the inn they were in. Serena and Cana looked up to their brother, who had rescued them like a knight in golden armor, and felt a bit embarrassed. Their mother noticed this and had to hold back her grin. She knew that her two girls were a bit scared and that El had acted like a true gentleman in that moment. El himself was not aware of the situation, mumbled something to himself, and then said that the two of them should actually be strong enough to handle the situation on their own. This completely ruined the mood at the table for the women, and El's mother just shook her head. The next morning, which was as sunny as almost every day before, El said goodbye to his family as he had to prepare for the meeting with the king. His siblings and mother told him to take care and that they looked forward to seeing him later. Then El activated his teleportation magic and arrived at the king's grand estate. In the room where teleportation magic could bring someone, there sat a man who was annoyed that he had to unlock the seals protecting the estate from people entering by means of teleportation magic. He wondered which important person was coming that he had to do such a bothersome task. Bored, he sat in his chair, resting his face on one hand and crossing his legs, wondering how long it would take for the guests to arrive. Shortly after, however, he noticed movement in the middle of the room. He quickly jumped up and recognized that it was the mana of someone on the seventh level of magic. He was astonished that he would see someone so powerful right away. El appeared and successfully landed in the estate of his new king. The man who had been waiting for El and received him immediately asked if he was the one who had saved their king's life. El turned around and confirmed it, upon which the man approached him, hugged him with tears in his eyes, and said that there would finally be a mage of the seventh grade in the kingdom again. He was glad that he would no longer feel so burdened. El didn't understand the situation and wondered who this old man was and what was going on here. El was confused, cleared his throat, and indicated that he didn't quite understand the situation he was in and felt somewhat uncomfortable. The old man snapped back to reality, realizing he was becoming intrusive and letting his emotions take over. Immediately, he released L, rubbed the back of his head with one hand, and apologized for his intrusive behavior. He explained that he acted that way because L's mana was so incredible. L listened calmly to the older man, but downplayed the situation by ignoring it. Although the initial touch between them was now over, the older man couldn't simply ignore the fact that L was so young. He told L that he had never seen such a young seventh-class mage. The older man had a sparkle in his eyes and made it clear to L that he was fascinated by what he had already achieved at such a young age. L felt visibly uncomfortable being praised like this and wondered what the heck was going on with the older man and why he was gushing so much. In the awkward situation, L looked around the older man's room and discovered piles of books scattered haphazardly on the floor, open and chaotically distributed. As he examined the books more closely, he recognized that they were mainly about magic. He had to recall how, as a child, he had devoured every magical book. It took a while, but then the older man apologized again for his rude behavior. After the second apology, he mentioned that his majesty, the king, was already waiting for El, and he would like to lead him to him. Additionally, he modestly asked if they could talk about magic on the way. El had a gleam in his eyes, thrilled that there was another person besides him who had a passion for magic. As El set off with the older man to visit the king, he demonstrated some of his magic by channeling a blue, hot mana flame in his hand. The older man was beside himself when he saw El's demonstration. He couldn't believe that someone so young could channel powerful magic in their hand without any preparation or recitation of a spell. He told El that he was on a whole different level than the other seventh-class mages. As the two continued along the corridors of the king's castle, the older man pondered how this was possible and came up with many wild theories that made El smile. As they walked along the corridor, El smiled more and more. He enjoyed talking to the older man, and he had a lot of fun having this conversation. This was because the older man's passion was the same as El's, exploring and examining magic. Suddenly, El's eyes widened. 
He looked out of one of the windows of the palace and gazed down at the harbor. He had a beautiful view of the city. The water rustled, the waves were breaking at the harbor, the sun was shining, and a peaceful atmosphere settled over the entire city. El could see more precisely that this land was rich in food, the underground full of resources and treasures. While El looked out the window, contemplating the advantages of the Tolian kingdom and feeling the heat of the place, the older man pondered and mumbled again in front of El. This made El wonder why the older man was contemplating once again. To end the pondering, El handed the older man a small piece of paper with a magical theory he had concocted and put on paper while passing through the corridors of the castle. He explained to the older man that there were many similarities between the fields of magic and calculations. The older man eagerly and energetically took the piece of paper from El. Clearly excited, he examined the theory and was surprised that such a method even existed. He praised El again, expressing how valuable this was. He also mentioned that the method was actually quite simple but resulted in a coherent theory. As they continued their walk through the castle corridors, El explained that he didn't originally intend to make this theory public, but he wanted to show it to the older man because he liked him. However, El also made it clear by placing his index finger in front of his mouth that he should keep this theory a secret. The older, pinkish man thanked El for this. While El and the older man took their time and leisurely approached the king, he waited alone in a large room at a table. He supported his face with one hand while impatiently tapping the table with the other. The king said that Desalin, the pinkish older gentleman, was late again and wondered if he had been distracted by magic once more. Just as he spoke, a voice outside the door informed the king that his guest, El, was now here. The king immediately ordered to let him in, and Desalin opened the door, letting El into the room. El apologized very politely for his late arrival. The king happily stood up and was about to greet El when Desalin stepped in front of El and informed the king that El was the mage who would change the course of history. The king ordered Desalin to calm down and explain to him that he had also seen the greatness and strength of Sir El yesterday. He then asked Desalin to leave him and El alone. Desalin was somewhat surprised by this. However, aware of his position, Desalin apologized to his king and left him and El alone. El was a bit confused about why the king wanted to speak alone with him, and he now realized that he hadn't seen a single knight on the way to this room, and there was no knight present in this room either. El wondered if the king had done this intentionally so that he wouldn't feel too uncomfortable. When Desalin left the room, El thanked him for guiding him so well to his king and for the pleasant conversations on the way here. Desalin requested, in conclusion, that they should meet again, as he wanted to learn more about El's discoveries in magic. With a big, please, and a smile on his face, he bid farewell and closed the door behind him. Okay, people please write in the comments how cute Desalin is please haha ha, real sweet boy. The king found his wizard's behavior somewhat embarrassing and shook his head slightly and shamefully. When the two were alone in the room, El knelt down, bowed, and greeted the king with the utmost respect and as much courtesy as possible. However, before El could express his gratitude from the depths of his heart, the king touched El on the shoulder and addressed him as, Sir, before his name. While the king also knelt on both knees in front of El, he told him to please stand up and that he should be the one to express thanks. He repeated El's words verbatim and thanked him sincerely for saving him from danger yesterday. After this gratitude, the king clapped his hands a few times, after which servants and maids brought delicious food into the room. The king apologized for it possibly being a bit impolite, but the food would be served all at once. There were ribs, lobster, various types of fish and sauces, as well as other tasty dishes. Then the king said that El should please feel at ease, and they could talk freely. El smiled and realized that King Liedolf seemed to be a very considerate person, even about the smallest things. As they were eating, Liedolf subsequently asked El if he wanted some alcohol and explained that he had specifically prepared something from the most popular alcohol in his kingdom. El naturally agreed and held out a glass to the king, thanking him afterward. Since El recognized that the king treated him well, 
he wanted to be equally respectful and polite to him as the king was to him. This included treating the king with a lot of respect and speaking his mind freely. Without much hesitation, El directly told the king to his face that he believed he wanted him to build a magic tower in this land. At first, King Liedolf was astonished, and his face showed some shock. However, it didn't take long for the shocked expression to turn into a serious one, and he confirmed El's assumption. The king explained, though, that the tower was not just about consolidating his power but about protecting themselves from the monsters and their annual attacks. During which thousands up to ten thousand civilians lose their lives. The king also said that this was the main reason why he had asked El to visit him in his castle. Even though it was embarrassing, King Liedolf continued and explained to El the situation, that the kingdom was divided into three parts. He explained that the first and second princes had joined forces and collectively had more than half of the kingdom on their side. King Liedolf added that it wouldn't surprise him if there was an internal conflict within his kingdom at any moment. However, as the two princes were doing everything they could to secure their forces, the monsters in the west could rampage freely without drawing attention to the units. Liedolf also said that he would like to have a good kingdom where his subjects could live in peace and be protected. To achieve this, they would need to hunt down and eliminate the nearby monsters. Additionally, Liedolf explained to El that a magic tower could help prevent future wars with other nations. Lastly, Liedolf also expressed his desire for the third prince to take over as king, believing him to be a very warm and kind-hearted man. So, Liedolf pleaded with El to please settle in his kingdom, emphasizing that his subjects deserved this happiness. He practically begged him. El was surprised and amazed at how serious the king was about it. He realized that the king's eyes, as he pleaded, were full of determination, and the king's request was not aimed at gaining a personal advantage. Instead, it was focused on wanting the best for his subjects. El had a slight grin on his face. He was happy that he had made the right choice and that the king, in whose land he wanted to settle, was such a kind-hearted person. King Liedolf explained that he agreed with El and that he would do his best to help the Tolian kingdom. Liedolf thanked El for that and told him that he would also do everything to support him in creating a magic tower. However, El also stated that he had some conditions that needed to be met for him to help. One of them was that he needed three years to make the necessary preparations. Upon hearing this, Liedolf called out silently. He was surprised that three years would be needed and then added that they didn't have so much time. Liedolf explained to El that the territory of Count Luvius, one of the destroyed areas, would not survive another three years. El's expression changed, he seemed somewhat surprised, and the smile that was on his lips disappeared. King Liedolf further explained that they had enjoyed years of peace, thanks to an excellent magician. He continued that recently, some people had kidnapped this magician, and since then, the monsters had been steadily advancing into the territory of the Count, causing civilian losses to escalate. El suddenly widened his eyes upon hearing that someone had kidnapped a magician. He immediately thought that this might be the responsibility of the Marquis. King Liedolf went on to say that currently, Countess Rowland Luvius was managing things as skillfully as the former Count. He explained that she was the daughter of the former count and a genius with the sword and in territorial administration matters, but with a heavy heart, Liedolf also said that the monsters could completely destroy the area if they couldn't be stopped, and that would mean the end of the Luvius family. Unfortunately, El had to inform the king that he would have to stick to these three years because that was the time he needed to build a magical tower. However, as he stabbed into the juicy, well-cooked steak, he explained to the king with a smile that he would take care of things in the Manticore Gorge. Liedolf repeated El's words in disbelief, asking if he meant the Manticore Gorge, the land of death, and if it was really possible to deal with things there. El explained that it was possible and that he would need the three years to handle things in the Manticore Gorge. At the same time, El also asked how many raids there were exactly each year. Liedolf explained to him that there were 10,000 raids every year affecting his kingdom. In total, there should be about 15,000 manticores inhabiting the area in the gorge. 
L folded his hands in front of his face and thought out loud. He realized that 15,000 manticores would be a very large number that would require time and attention. In disbelief, King Liedolf, with wide open eyes, asked L if it was really possible to free and save his kingdom from the manticore gorge and its monsters. L told him that he must have forgotten that he was a seventh level magician. Additionally, L explained to the king with a smile on his face that he also had the trump card of a knight golem. Astonished, King Liedolf remembered that L was right and that he had almost forgotten, due to L's young age, that he was a seventh level magician and that he also had a knight golem accompanying him. As he looked at L's face again and saw the confidence and determination in his eyes, he knew that nothing was impossible for this young man. Liedolf once again pleaded with L to restore peace to the kingdom. L replied that he looked forward to the future with joyful anticipation and was excited to settle here. Then Delve stood up and apologized. King Liedolf asked L if he intended to leave now. L confirmed this with a grin on his face and said that he now knew what he had to do. He then thanked the king for the invitation and made his way to the door. Before he could leave, King Liedolf told him that he was welcome to visit him anytime and that he could come whenever it suited him. He also asked him how old he was exactly. L answered the king's question by revealing his age of seventeen and left. The king, who now had a smile on his face again, was impressed with L. He had to acknowledge that L, at the age of seventeen, was already very extraordinary and great. At the same time, he wondered if L would really be able to save his people from the Manticore Gorge. The Manticore Gorge was a canyon between two mountains, through which a small blue river flowed. In this forest and the gorge, approximately 15,000 manticores lived. Manticores were large, lion-like predatory cats with wings on their backs and a scorpion tail, usually having few enemies. However, in this place, there were beings that they held great respect for, and it was not uncommon for the smaller manticores to occasionally retract their tails when encountering a specimen of their kind twice their size. These specimens had particularly sharp and large teeth and were monstrously strong. This was a manticore king, recognizable by a red jewel on its forehead, granting it authority over all other manticores. The power of this manticore king was comparable to that of 100 normal manticores and even stronger than 100 at the expert level. It was entirely normal that during a manticore attack, villages simply vanished as if they had never existed. And right now, one of the villages was about to experience such a fate. This village was the small village of Ken. This small village lay on the right side between the two mountains in the forest crossed by the river. It was a small village surrounded by a small wooden wall. At the entrance and exit of the village, two watchtowers were positioned, protecting the village from attackers. To enter the village at all, one had to cross a small narrow bridge. This bridge was currently under attack by two manticores, and the villagers were desperately trying to defend themselves and fend them off. One of the villagers asked his comrade how they were supposed to stop two manticores at the same time. They needed all the men they had just for one. Despair was written all over the soldiers' faces. Nevertheless, another soldier shouted to his comrades that they must not let the manticores into the village under any circumstances. He stomped his right leg on the ground. Unleashing a large shockwave. Confidently, he told his comrades that anyone who could and wanted to fight was welcome to join him in the fight. His comrades then gained new courage, and they had expected nothing less from their captain, Miter. They were also impressed by his aura. They had to acknowledge what a talented swordsman their captain was and that he had already achieved a high rank in his late twenties. In the middle of the bridge, Captain, Miter, fought against a manticore slowly approaching. The aura of the manticore was dark and full of bloodthirsty energy. Miter's aura, on the other hand, was green and gentle, swirling around him. Suddenly, the manticore roared, showing its teeth to the brave soldiers. Captain Miter was not impressed, jumped into the air, and immediately attacked the manticore with his weapon. With full force, he hit the manticore's forehead with his weapon, giving it a headbutt. Unfazed by his own direct hit, 
Captain Mitre immediately ordered his men to attack the manticore before it could recover. All the soldiers on the bridge drew their bows and prepared for the assault. Without wasting any time, they shot arrows at the manticore that had previously paralyzed Captain Mitre, hitting it all over its body. Standing before the corpse of the manticore, Captain Mitre was sure that even such a monster wouldn't have survived such an attack. He then wanted to make sure to defeat the manticore with a final blow. He attacked the head of the second manticore with his lance, causing it to scream and fall to the ground. Captain Mitre was sure that the first wave of manticore attacks was now over. Captain Mitre was all the more surprised when he saw that behind the first two manticores, another one was hiding, roaring with an open mouth, and rushing towards him with two sharp horns. Captain Mitre realized that more and more manticores would come one after another. He turned to his comrades and soldiers, alerting them that another manticore had arrived, and they had to fend off the attack together once again. However, as he looked at the troop, he noticed that his soldiers were visibly exhausted and needed a break. Captain Mitre became somewhat puzzled because he had never seen such a large manticore alone in his life, let alone defeated one. It dawned on him that it would likely be too challenging to fend off the attack using only villagers as soldiers. Nevertheless, he didn't give up, and his grip tightened around his weapon. He realized that, despite the disadvantage, they had to repel the attack. Then he assumed his fighting stance and waited for the manticore to approach. It ran toward Mitre with fire in its mouth. Both opponents faced each other, preparing for the first strike, Captain Mitre with his spear and the manticore with fire in its mouth. The manticore was the first to launch a fireball at Captain Mitre. Subsequently, Captain Mitre rushed towards the manticore. When the two attacks collided, there was a loud explosion. The villagers held their hands in front of their bodies to fend off the immense shockwave. The villagers were also eager to see how the battle between the two would turn out. As the fire and smoke slowly cleared, the silhouette of Captain Mitre could be seen. He leaned on his weapon and knelt down. Completely out of breath, he wondered, as his gaze fell on the manticore in front of them, how it was possible to come out and scathe from such an attack. In doing so, he looked directly into the deep red eyes of the large predatory cat. Completely exhausted, he continued to support himself on his own weapon and faced his fate. While the manticore attacked Captain Mitre again, he wondered if this was now his end. However, with a single stroke, the manticore was split into four and defeated, causing the manticore to fall to the ground in front of Captain Mitre. Captain Mitre and the villagers were astonished, wondering who could effortlessly defeat such a beast. While the unbelievers looked at the corpse of the manticore, a person emerged from the water, wearing a red robe and red gloves. It was Cana, who, right after defeating the manticore, informed El that she had successfully completed her mission. She stood impressively in front of Captain Mitre and the villagers, who examined her closely. They were surprised that their savior was a girl who didn't even look like she had reached the age of twenty. At first glance, they also recognized that this girl was extremely talented in handling a sword. L, who followed Kana, congratulated her on the successfully completed job and told her that they would definitely need to find a new master in the future. These praising words were too much for Kana, who then turned red. Embarrassed, she said that this task had not been difficult for her but was still shy and thanked L for his kind words. After Kana sorted out her thoughts and processed her brother's words of praise, L turned to Captain Mitre and the villagers, greeting them. They were still astonished and couldn't yet realize what was happening right before their eyes. L explained to them that they had not come to harm them. But rather, he introduced himself as the magician who wants to provide them all with a pleasant life and will soon rule the land. L had a cheerful smile on his face and tried to convey the message as kindly as possible. However, this news shocked Captain Mitre, who then tightened the grip on his weapon, trembling, and asked what L meant by that. Completely frightened, he straightened up, aimed the weapon at L, and asked why this land should soon belong to him. Kana also reached for Mitre's weapon and asked how he dared to point his sword at her brother. She channeled her entire red aura expressing her anger at this act. 
she asked Captain Mitre how he could be so rude to L and yelled at him. Mitre was quite astonished, swallowed, and had to consider the impressive, incredibly dense aura unfolding before him. He also had to admit that, although his opponent seemed to be young, her spirit and determination were amazing. Suddenly, L shouted from behind Kana to stop and touched her on the shoulder to pull her out of her anger and rage. L explained to her that they were outsiders, and it was entirely normal for the villagers to react that way from their perspective. Kana turned around, looked L in the face, and let the matter rest. She turned to Captain Mitre and gave him a final warning to please mind his manners in the future. Then L turned to the villagers and said that he probably hadn't communicated it correctly. He explained to the villagers that he planned to build his magical tower here after driving away all the manticores from the surroundings. The villagers on the bridge whispered to each other and couldn't believe what they were hearing. It was clear to them that L's plan was to build a magical tower here, and he must be a seventh-level magician who would then protect this place. Some wanted to believe this, while others questioned this intention. Captain Mitre didn't hesitate to ask L directly what would happen to them according to his plans. L immediately recognized that the person in front of him must be the leader of this village. He explained to Captain Mitre that they should just live as they have been. This surprised Captain Mitre, and he widened his eyes, visibly astonished by the words coming from L's mouth. L further explained to Captain Mitre and the villagers that he planned to rid the entire land around them of the manticores, and this should mean that their village could continue to expand and use more land without the risk of being attacked. He also explained that he did not want to be an evil ruler and would by no means increase taxes but mostly intended to leave everything as it was. Additionally, L explained his wishes, which aligned with the king's wishes, a happy life for everyone. Captain Mitre couldn't believe what he heard. His eyes widened, his mouth hung open as he had to first comprehend what L had just said. The remaining villagers on the bridge were also stunned, trying to process what they were hearing from L. Suddenly, another massive paw stomped on the ground, and another manticore became visible behind L. L recognized this immediately and turned around. Quickly, he formed a magical circle beneath him and called out to the villagers to stay calm. Behind him, another portal opened to a different dimension, from which three large iron golems emerged. They stood impressively behind L, who became serious, and ordered his golems to take care of the villagers' problem. A slit in one of the golems' helmets opened, and L realized that the command was accepted. Immediately, the iron golem rushed toward the manticore. Tiny in comparison, raised its right hand, and crushed the small creature. As if Captain Mitre hadn't been astonished enough, he was left speechless watching L manipulate the manticore. His gaze straight ahead, the iron golem executed L's command, kneeling before its master and awaiting further instructions. With a smile, L turned to the captain and asked if he would now trust him. The surprised expression on Captain Mitre's face changed. As the leader of the village, he couldn't make hasty decisions and had to be guided by his feelings. He recognized that their safety was guaranteed with such golems around them. Moreover, he saw in El an extremely powerful magician and trusted that he could make the Manticore Gorge a place where people could live again. He placed his hand over his chest and apologized to El. El extended his hand to Captain Mitre and said that his behavior only proved that he was a good leader, and there was no shame in expecting something suspicious when meeting someone for the first time. Captain Mitre thanked him for the kind words and shook hands. However, Captain Mitre became serious again and said that they needed to quickly go to the other side of the small village to defend against the other manticores. Smiling, L reassured him that there was no need to worry and that the fear was unfounded. While L and Kana took care of this side, L's mother and his other sister Serna, with L's golden golem knight Tana, took care of the manticores on the other side of the village. L's mother and Serna were repeatedly amazed at how strong Tana was and widened their eyes as they witnessed the spectacle of Tana defeating the manticores. At the end of the battle, Tana basked in the sunlight. L asked Captain Mitre if he could gather the representatives of the village so that he could announce his plans. 
Several hours passed until our group and the villagers found themselves in a building at a table in the middle of the village. As El looked around, he was somewhat surprised. He had expected several old village leaders to come, but most of those speaking for the village were young men, all with large, well-trained muscles. On closer inspection, El realized that they all had the same aura temperature. He wondered if there was a specific reason for this. After forming his initial impression, El stood up and warmly greeted everyone. He introduced himself by name and wasted no time in getting straight to his observations. He asked the villagers if they had all learned the same sword technique, citing the almost identical aura and a strength that could not come from the regular training of ordinary villagers. The villagers and Captain Miter were immediately taken aback by El's speech. El also inquired about what such talented individuals were doing in a place like this. Captain Miter thought for a moment and looked at the ground. Then he turned his gaze back to El and explained that he actually expected nothing less from him. El couldn't easily be kept in the dark or fooled. He also praised El's keen eyes and explained that they were actually knights of Baron Jamier, the same Baron Jamier known for his sword technique, who became a swordmaster at the age of thirty. Captain Miter continued, visibly distressed and saddened, with his head lowered. As the battle for the crown intensified, there were many attempts to sway the Baron to their side. El's mother looked at the concerned village leader with a mother's love. She could see in his eyes that this topic was not easy for him, and the pain still ran deep. Captain Miter continued to explain that despite all efforts to win the Baron to their side, they failed because he turned down all offers. The real trouble began when the season arrived for the land to be attacked by monsters, and no one was willing to help the poor Baron. El and his mother listened attentively to Captain Miter's story, with the narration particularly affecting El's mother. Miter went on to report that the Baron fought alongside 5,000 soldiers, but it was not enough and led to the annihilation of his entire family. With tears in his eyes, Captain Miter recounted that at that time, they were knights on probation, and the Baron told them to flee and survive. The other villagers at the table also had tears in their eyes and continued their captain's story. They added that after fleeing, they did not want to go to the aristocrats who had abandoned their beloved Baron. That was why they settled in this place. El's mother continued to listen to the story, becoming sadder as she witnessed the soldier's heavy fate. El, on the other hand, listened attentively to the story but was not as deeply moved as his mother. He knew exactly how the soldiers must have felt, but he did not understand why they did not simply travel to another land. With their skills as knights, they should have been able to obtain the title of a knight and not expose their family to such a dangerous situation. However, as El pondered this, he knew that he had to reconsider his own thoughts. He realized that every person had their own ideals and that the circumstances in which these people lived were different from his own. He looked down at his hands and became aware that he needed to solve their situation first to understand their mindset and the differences. He looked at the representatives again and explained to them that it was easy for him to deal with the monsters, and that was not the main problem. Furthermore, he looked at his sisters and then back at Captain Miter, continuing his explanation of his plans. He explained that his first goal was to address the leaders of the manticores due to their dense population. This surprised the villagers, who couldn't believe what they had just heard. El continued, stating that once he had everything organized, he wanted the villagers to help him. Captain Miter was equally astonished by El's plan and asked him if it was even possible to defeat the manticore king. El, full of confidence, spoke to the villagers and assured them that he would keep his word and show them how to defeat such a beast, a beast twice the size of the normal version, with a red jewel on its forehead, wings, and a scorpion tail. After El had initially settled his affairs with the villagers, he immediately moved on to his next step, happily heading to a place he hadn't visited in a while. Standing on a cliff, he looked down at the city where he had started his journey. The sun rose on the horizon, casting a golden glow over the city. El stood exactly where he had once looked down on the city with his mother, it was the kingdom of Banzar Kashia, where the Dibel store was located. It appeared unchanged, just as it was when El had left the kingdom. 
Daibel sat at a table, signing important documents brought to him by his secretary. One by one, he signed, processed them, and then handed them back to his secretary to handle the rest. Since gaining the right to sell magical stones and L, the fame of his small store had rapidly risen. He thought of L, considering him a crucial customer and business partner. Daibel also reminisced about watching L grow up and witnessing his entire development. Lost in his thoughts about L, he hoped that L was doing well and wished him all the best for the future. He also recalled recently reading in the newspaper that the residence of the esteemed Marquis Einhardt had exploded. This immediately made him wonder if L had something to do with it. His surprise was evident as he read the article. Before L left the kingdom, he had inquired with Dibel about Marquis Einhardt. Dibel hoped that the information he had provided L hadn't led him to destroy the residence. He couldn't find any information about the explosion, no matter whom he asked. Folding his hands together, he hoped that L was safe and living somewhere secure. Lost in thoughts of L, Daibel's secretary had to call his name several times, growing louder each time, until he snapped back to reality. Completely bewildered, he asked his secretary how long she had been standing there. She replied that she had been calling his name for quite a while. She then informed him that one of the important customers he had just talked about was suddenly standing outside his door. Daibel was utterly surprised and repeated if he had understood correctly what his secretary had just said. She confirmed it and escorted the high-ranking customer into Daibel's premises. L mentioned that it had been a while since they last saw each other, wearing an ecstatic expression and a smile on his face, completely astonished, L's name was conveyed. L wasted no time and straightforwardly stated his purpose, which was to discuss a few matters with Daibel. However, Daibel didn't address what L had said. Instead, he rushed towards him, shaking him all over and asking if he was safe and if he had any injuries. He naturally inquired about L's siblings and his mother, making sure they were all okay. He explained that he had heard something significant had happened at the Marquis' estate and couldn't curb his curiosity. Daibel told L that he had been quite disturbed since he heard about it. Almost unable to think about anything else, considering it might have something to do with L and he could be the reason for the explosion. L, still in Daibel's grip, was somewhat surprised but eventually reassured him. L thanked him for his concern and explained that everyone was fine. He then said with a smile that it felt good when someone cared about him. Daibel released his hold on L, adjusted his glasses hanging on a chain around his neck, and apologized for letting his emotions run wild. He explained that he reacted that way because he had known L since he was seven years old and that L meant a lot to him. Daibel then gestured to a seat and asked L to please sit down. He cleared his throat, took a seat opposite L, and asked him what he came for and what there was to discuss. L wanted to be honest from the start and told him that he planned to build a magical tower. This astonished Daibel again, and he repeated L's words in disbelief. Additionally, through L's plans, he realized that the news he had read in the newspaper could connect the explosion to L. L confirmed this and mentioned that, although it might be hard to believe, he was now a seventh-level mage. This news hit Daibel like a lightning bolt, and he couldn't stop being amazed. With wide open eyes, he told L that since he first saw him at a young age, he had felt that he was someone very important and extraordinary. However, he never thought that in his twenties, L would already grow into a seventh-level mage. Daibel then asked L where he planned to build a magical tower. L told him that he planned to build it in the Manticorn Gorge. Once again, Daibel repeated L's words incredulously. He asked if he understood correctly and if L really intended to build his tower in one of the three restricted areas of the continent, specifically in the monster-filled Manticorn region, however, L only responded with a smile, affirming that he meant exactly that and Daibel had understood everything correctly. Daibel had to admit to himself that he had assessed L correctly, as an unpredictable person whose next moves couldn't be predicted. In any other land, someone planning to build a magical tower would be welcomed with open arms. This would imply that L had the freedom to choose any good location to settle. 
Thus, it seemed illogical to Daibel that El would choose to build a magical tower in the land of monsters. Deep down, however, Daibel knew he shouldn't doubt El's decision, as he was sure El had a larger plan that was not yet apparent to him. So, he simply told El that he agreed and thought it was a good idea. This surprised El, who was a bit confused, stating that he hadn't explained everything yet and wondered why he was already getting approval from Daibel. Daibel, sitting across from El, said that everything El did was new and exciting. And he was eagerly anticipating where his new journey would take him. He wanted to know what plan El had next. El smiled at Daibel's trust and then proceeded to explain his next plans. As Daibel had suspected, El's plans were indeed exciting, and he was confident that, if successful, the business would become one of the best on the entire continent. Daibel also mentioned that he wanted to start recruiting the people necessary for the construction of the magical tower and asked El when would be the best time to have them ready. El told him that the sooner he could find the people, the better. However, with a mixed expression on his face, he also asked if it would be challenging to find such individuals. Daibel answered honestly, also with a mixed expression, that it might be somewhat difficult to find people willing to work on a magical tower, especially in an area where the Manticore King resides. Upon hearing this, the mixed feelings disappeared from El's face, and with confidence, he said that this problem would no longer exist. In the Manticore Gorge, there was a small river with crystal clear water, into which a waterfall flowed. Surrounding the area were many green trees, and a gentle breeze wafted through. Almost no one ventured to this little shaded spot in the gorge, as it was the territory of the Manticore King, who was taking a nap at the edge of the river. A few of his subjects also made themselves comfortable nearby. Resting, however, an astonishing and dreadful unknown energy roused the Manticore King from his nap. He yawned, revealing his sharp and pointed teeth, stretched out, and let out a terrifying roar as his first response, indicating to all creatures in his vicinity the foul mood he was in due to this disturbance. As the Manticore King rose, he reached an impressive height of six meters, surrounded by a dark aura. His eyes glowed at least as red as the jewel on his forehead, and his combat level surpassed that of a swordmaster. After taking a few minutes to wake up and stretch, he began running as fast as possible toward the source of the unknown energy, a stormy expression on his face. Normally, Manticore kings had several subjects in their vicinity protecting and observing their territory. However, this Manticore king was different, he had great confidence in his own strength, believing that nothing and no one could kill him. That was why he was so eager to locate the mysterious energy that disturbed his senses and made him doubt his strength. With full speed, the large cat ran faster and faster, leaping over obstacles, ready to confront his adversary when he arrived at the sight of the mysterious energy. Upon arrival, he saw three magical iron golems controlled by L. One stood at the front, the other two a step behind. To demonstrate his power, the Manticore King roared thunderously again. In response, El appeared on the shoulder of one of the golems, stating that the king had now fallen into his trap. It was no surprise to El, as he knew from the beginning that the king was nothing more than a monster. However, it was also not surprising that the king was a monster, to have so many other manticores under one's command, one had to be a genuine monster to lead such a herd. El also sensed the dense dark aura emanating from the king. It was so intense that even El had to shield himself and acknowledge the potential danger of the situation. Yet, despite the inherent danger, El's adventurous spirit took over again, and he wanted to discover the origin of this dark aura. Standing up from his sitting position, El looked at his opponent, ready to begin uncovering the source of the dark aura. However, the large cat, not willing to engage in a non-combat position, hissed in response, prepared to defend itself and its territory. Without saying a word, one of the large iron golems on El's side charged toward the wild cat to teach it some manners. It swung its right hand, about to deliver a powerful blow to the cat. However, before the strike could land, the manticore defended itself with its scorpion-like tail, deflecting the attack. This even astonished El, who had to acknowledge the manticore's incredibly fast reflexes. 
not only were the reflexes quick, but the iron tail managed to seriously damage the armor of the iron golem, rendering it incapacitated. Recognizing the situation, El immediately sent his other two golems to attack the manticore together. This time, one of the golems even managed to land a punch to the manticore's face. However, it seemed to have little effect on the cat, as the manticore effortlessly defended against the attack with its iron skin. L realized that the attacks were not strong enough to penetrate this iron skin. Aware of his absurd strength, the manticore, not giving L and his golems any time to rest, prepared for a counterattack. It bit into the armor of the iron golems and defeated a second one by freeing the golem from one of its arms. This golem fell to the ground, making it clear that El's opponent wouldn't be easy. The Manticore was a true king who had often defended his territory and proven his position. Even though two of the three iron golems had already been defeated, the third golem continued to charge forward, attempting to attack the Manticore from behind. However, the Manticore noticed this sneak attack and once again managed to fend it off. Using its hind legs, it struck the last three iron golems in the face, defeating them as well, leaving them on the ground with broken armor. Viewed from above, the manticore, surrounded by the three iron golem corpses, stood firmly on the battlefield, reaffirming its position as the ruler of the area. To prove his strength to El, he roared again, creating a frenzied shockwave and shouting at him. El had to admit that this manticore king was much stronger than he had initially thought. He looked over at his golems and realized that their regeneration speed was too slow, leading him to conclude that the wild cat's attacks were quite powerful. Aware of his situation, El intervened and intended to summon Tana, his golden golem, into the fight. However, before it could be summoned, the manticore seized the opportunity and attacked with one of its front claws. El was shocked that he had miscalculated in this situation and was struck by the king's mighty blow being thrown backward. Helplessly, El was thrown across the forest by the manticore's blow and landed on the ground. The manticore wasted no time and leaned over El, causing him to slowly dissolve. The manticore then looked upward, sensing El's presence there. El needed a moment to catch his breath and was relieved that he had initially led a phantom fight against the manticore king, allowing him to safely observe everything from above. Otherwise, the battle might have already come to an end. El initially wanted to finish the fight with his normal golems and would have been content to do so. However, since the Manticore King was a king for a reason, he had to get serious. Since his phantom earlier hadn't had the opportunity to summon Tana. The original now performed this task. Behind El, a magical circle opened, and beneath him on the rock, a portal to another dimension appeared. Tana leaped out, ready to confront the Cat King. El spoke down to Tana, commanding her to engage in this battle without her sword and to initiate Plan B. Tana confirmed the command and prepared to face the beast. Swiftly, she charged forward, intending to land a blow on the wild cat like the first Iron Golem. However, unlike the Iron Golem, the Manticore King dodged this time, avoiding the attacks. After a successful dodge, the Manticore King leaped forward with its two front claws, attempting to attack Tana as well. However, Tana managed to evade the attack without taking a hit. She then took another approach, attempting to counterattack. Unfortunately, the Manticore dodged her counter, causing her attack to miss once again. Unfortunately, Tana found herself in an unfavorable position afterward, with her back to the Manticore King. However, she managed to turn around at the last moment when the Manticore King was ready to attack again. Unlike the previous occasions when he relied on his physical superiority, the Manticore King initiated a different attack this time. He opened his mouth and unleashed a powerful burst of dark aura in the form of a beam towards Tana, who tried to shield herself from the attack behind her hands. El was surprised that even Tana was having trouble fighting against this Manticore King. However, he also knew that his golden golem had not yet begun to fight seriously. El signaled to Tana that it was time to stop playing and to fight seriously now. Her eyes lit up, and she began to get serious. After the Manticore King's attack subsided, 
Tana raised her right arm and began storing a massive amount of fiery aura in her fist, of course, the Manticore King was not willing to let this happen and quickly charged towards his opponent. However, Tana had already gathered enough aura in her fist and, much like Gone from Hunter x Hunter, unleashed a powerful strike that directly hit the large wild cat. The Manticore King was thrown backward through the air and landed on the ground. Thanks to Tana's forceful blow. In contrast, Tana stood unharmed before him, ready to finish the job. Seizing the opportunity, Tana jumped onto the body of the Manticore King, knelt down, and intended to end the cat's life. However, when El spoke, saying that it was enough and that he wanted her to stop, both Tana and the Manticore King looked at him in surprise. El stated that there was no reason to take the Manticore King's life. Even the large wild cat, surprised by this, sat before El and appeared like a well-behaved kitten. God, I wish my cats were that sweet. This surprised El as well, who didn't know what was happening. After this battle, it engulfed our protagonist back into the small village of Ken. Which he had previously saved from the two manticores. Captain Miter couldn't believe what was unfolding before his eyes and was left in awe. While the manticore king, still in a normal state and towering at six meters, snuggled up to his new owner, seeking attention, El, equally surprised as Captain Miter, emotionlessly informed him that he had taken care of the Manticore King's problem. Even after a few minutes, Captain Miter couldn't believe what he saw and thought about the potential destruction if such a massive monster were to rampage here. However, El assured him that he had the situation under control and suggested Captain Miter see his new pet as nothing more than a gigantic cat. He invited Captain Miter to gently pet it. With a broad grin on its face, the Manticore King eagerly looked forward to a nice petting session. Captain Miter, however, still harbored serious doubts about casually petting such a large kitty. But before he could contemplate it further, the Manticore King licked Captain Miter across the face, trying to show that there was no need to fear him anymore. After that, the Manticore King had a very peaceful expression, and Captain Miter asked El what he planned to do with this monster now. El explained to Miter once again that the Manticore King was at least as strong as a semi-grandmaster rank knight and had the ability to command other lower-level Manticores. He planned to use his new pet to make his life easier and command the other Manticores, while the drool and saliva of the cat dripped down onto Captain Miter, he understood what El had in mind and had to admit that it was a good idea. El then informed the captain that he would now begin the construction of a magical tower to make the land safer for him and the villagers, allowing them to live in peace and tranquility. With the realization that he could finally start implementing his plans, El was as happy as his new pet, sporting a wide grin on his face. Three months had passed since the Manticore King disappeared from the Manticore Gorge. The construction of the magical tower was underway and the entire process had gone relatively smoothly so far. Inside the magical tower, a teleportation portal had been created, directly linking Dybul's shop to the magical tower. Thanks to the people Dybul had hired, the expensive materials for the tower could be transported quickly. While the diligent workers were busy building the tower, El's mother and sisters assisted with provisions. It didn't take long for the outer facade of the magical tower to slowly take shape. It was a large golden tower, unmatched in its grandeur, extending several floors into the sky. Occasionally, people approached the vicinity of the large golden magical tower, looked up in disbelief, and wondered what on earth this enormous building was. Most were uncertain about the nature of the structure, often labeling it simply as a large warehouse. However, a crucial part of El's plans had now commenced, running parallel to the construction of his magical tower. The first step was to capture and relocate the smaller manticores. Many vanished on their own after the disappearance of their king, dispersing into nearby forests El used his magic to capture the remaining smaller cats and transported them to another dimension. As this was no easy task and fundamentally changed life in the land, Many people were fascinated by the success of El's plan, bringing him great happiness. Gradually, fewer manticores circled around El's magical tower. And the attacks from these dangerous wild cats nearly dropped to zero. 
it became possible to build more houses in the immediate vicinity of the magical tower. Before long, a large city with 15,000 inhabitants peacefully emerged around the magical tower, El's mother and his siblings also noticed this fact and witnessed the peaceful life that was previously not possible. Together, they sat at a table and discussed how, if they hadn't experienced it themselves, they would never have believed that this territory had previously been inhabited by wild wildcats that had terrified the people here. While Serna and El's mother talked about the prosperity of the city, Kena pointed out that their plans had not been completely executed. El agreed with his red-haired sister, stating that there was still a lot to do before they were finished. Holding a cup of coffee, Serna asked what the next plan was for all of them. El, who was also sipping his coffee and waiting for it to cool a bit, explained to his family that the plans from now on would cost a lot of money, and their top priority should be to raise funds to continue building his magical tower. He also told his family, while drinking his coffee, that he was now going to meet a very important person. This news surprised Serna and Kena, trembling, they wondered who their brother could mean by an important person, understanding as if he might be visiting a lover who could potentially be competition. Serna noted that she had never seen her brother like this before and wondered who on earth he could be visiting that he would talk about in such a way. Meanwhile, El's mother also sat at the table, sipping coffee and visibly pleased that some peace had settled around her family, allowing them to enjoy life now. The sea occasionally brought small waves to a beach, splashing onto the beautiful golden sandy shore. The water was crystal clear, with only a few small stones scattered on the beach. El walked along the shore with his family, stating that he needed to introduce them to someone important. While his sister Serna said she couldn't wait to meet the person who was so important to him. Only their mother had a slight grin on her face. Because she was the only one who understood how their two daughters, as well as their only son, felt and what their words truly meant. Startled, Serna and Kena turned to their mother and asked why she was laughing. El's mother apologized only for her laughter and let it go. The family walked along the beach together, repeatedly wondering where this important person could be. However, there was nothing else to be seen on the entire beach except for occasional seaweed and a few barrels full of seafood. The group could not discern more than a simple beach, El turned around and asked his family if this wasn't simply incredible, explaining that he found this beach particularly cool. He elaborated that this was the western side of the Tolian kingdom, known for its seafood. Additionally, El lamented that, unfortunately, this area had few or no magicians, making it a very poor territory unable to properly sell the delicious seafood. As El explained this to his family, he suddenly remembered that he had forgotten to tell them who actually owned this territory. However, before he could reveal the name, the earth suddenly shook, and a significant tremor spread. The family's gazes turned towards the source of the tremor, wondering what could cause such a noise. Over a few trees, they saw a large black cloud rising from the middle of the forest, realizing that this was the source of the tremor. In the midst of the forest, there was a large wall, and a few archers were trying to prevent some orcs from breaching their walls. They drew their bows and aimed at the attacking large green pigs. Before the orcs could jump to the wall, the guards shot their arrows down. However, the arrows were deflected by the large green orcs, who then drew their weapons and launched their attack. One of the orcs jumped right to the wall and held onto it, climbing up. There were only a few inches left to prevent the orc from reaching the wall. The commander of the guards recognized this and ordered his soldiers to pour some oil over the area, causing the orc to lose its grip and fall. Unfortunately, his soldiers had to inform him that they had already used all their oil and had none left. While the commander contemplated what defense strategy remained, the large pig got closer to its goal. Suddenly, a voice rang out, saying that she would take care of it, shocking the commander as he looked to his right. A person appeared with a slightly yellow cloak, resembling a last-minute savior. It was Rowlin, who had authority over this territory. Rowlin had lightly pink hair, red eyes, and wore a blue top, sort of riding pants, and boots. A sword hung from her belt on the left side. 
Confidently, she spoke to her soldiers, instructing them to cover her. They immediately jumped onto the wall, taunted the orc below, and then leaped off the wall to charge directly at the area. In midair, Rowlin drew her sword and dispatched the orc as if it were nothing. Afterward, she mentioned that orcs didn't know when to give up, and that was a commonality that would connect them. As she continued to fall down the wall, she aimed for her next target, asking the other orc if he was upset that she defeated his comrade. Before Rowlin touched the ground, her grip on her sword tightened, enveloping it with an aura. She then swung the sword, defeating the other orc with a single blow. Taking a brief moment to catch her breath below, she apologized to her defeated opponents for her victory and explained to them that losing wasn't one of her hobbies. The soldiers holding the bridge cheered for their leader who had successfully defeated the two attackers. Suddenly, Rowlin noticed something behind her and turned around in shock, only to find another orc making its way onto the wall. This orc had managed to reach the top and was about to strike one of the soldiers with its club. The soldier was so shocked by the orc that he was paralyzed and couldn't move in the face of his impending death. As the orc saw its chance and prepared to eliminate the soldier, a fireball flew from behind, igniting the orc before it could cause greater harm. Rowlin looked up and recognized that this fireball seemed to be a sign of magic, wondering where it came from. As before, Elle suddenly emerged and apologized for possibly startling her, still holding some residual magic from the fireball in his palm. Smiling, he mentioned that he had found exactly the person he had been looking for from the beginning, looking at Rowlin. While El had sprinted ahead to assist Rowlin, his siblings and his mother were busy running through the dense forest. Leading the way was Serna, wondering where the heck her brother was, followed by Cana and their mother, amazed that their son could run through this thick forest as if it were nothing. Eventually, Serna managed to navigate through the dense forest and emerged into a clearing. Along with her sister and mother. She was overjoyed to finally be out of the forest thicket. The first thing Elle's mother wondered was if they saw their son. Their gazes shifted to Elle and became somewhat alarmed. Elle was just saying to Rowlin that he would like to talk to her, as his sisters also looked at Rowlin. Both Serna and Kana wondered, seeing their mother's shocked expression, if this pretty woman was the one their brother meant as the important person, and if Elle might mean love when referring to this important person. Rowlin pointed her sword at Elle, asking what he meant by wanting to talk and reminding him that this was their first meeting. She also warned Elle not to make a wrong move. Unfazed and emotionless. Elle admitted that he probably made a mistake and explained that he was just excited to finally see her in person. He then introduced himself with a smile, telling Rowland that he was a mage from the Tolian kingdom and that he had come today to discuss something with them. However, Rowlin wore no smile and questioned Elle about why she should believe him, displaying a very hostile expression. In response, Elle unleashed his magic, creating a swirling stream of his magic toward Rowlin. Sensing Elle's mana, Rowlin had to acknowledge that the mana she felt was on a completely different level and that this strength couldn't come from an ordinary mage. Realizing that Elle was likely not lying and telling the truth. She sheathed her sword, placed her hand on her chest, apologized to Elle, explaining that she had been somewhat rude but only wanted to protect her territory, and then asked for forgiveness. Afterwards, Rowlin suggested continuing the conversation in another location and invited Elle, Serna, Cana, and their mother to Count Luvius's residence. The residence was situated on a cliff, offering an impressive view of the Mirror Blue Sea. Upon arriving at the residence, Rowlin served her guests tea. While she apologized for it not being particularly expensive tea, the protagonists weren't bothered as the tea was delicious. Elle's mother even praised the aroma of the tea, expressing surprise at how good it was. Nevertheless, Rowlin apologized again for not being able to offer her guests more comforts. Unlike his mother, Elle was more skeptical. He recognized that the tea was good but also knew that it could be easily purchased, and there was nothing particularly extravagant in the castle. Even Rowland's attire was plain and simple. L realized that the financial situation of this territory was worse than he initially thought, Rowland directly asked her guests why they had come to visit her today. 
L responded and explained that this territory, governed by Count Luvius, had been attacked not only by orcs as earlier mentioned but also by manticores. However, he assured her that she no longer needed to worry about it. Surprised, Rowland asked L if he would help her, to which L replied that they no longer needed assistance. This puzzled Rowlin, who wondered why they no longer needed help against such monsters. L explained that he had already taken care of most of the manticores himself and that he had built a magical tower in a city in the former Manticore Gorge, preventing any further attacks on this territory. The news shocked Rowlin, who was visibly amazed and speechless. Even seconds later, she remained silent, sitting in a state of shock. L attempted several times to address the Countess, but she remained in a state of shock. L's mother recognized that it must be a state of shock. A few seconds later, Rowlin apologized for the brief interruption and snapped out of it. Although still somewhat skeptical, she had to admit that she had seen fewer manticores than usual lately, making her more inclined to believe L. L responded that soon all the usual manticores would disappear. Slowly, Rowland's eyes filled with tears, and she thanked L, stating that this was one of the best pieces of news she had heard in years. She could hardly find words of thanks, let alone a way to express her gratitude. L was shocked by the gratitude he received, even though he had not yet come to the main point of his conversation. He thought about what he actually wanted to tell her but was relieved that he could help once again. Eager to see how Rowlin would react when he told her about his plans to strengthen her family throughout the kingdom, L couldn't answer yet when L's mother spoke up. She explained that L's father was from the Luvius family and that they were mainly here because L seemed very concerned about belonging to this family. The mother further explained that L's father was Rion Luvius, making the two of them likely cousins. These revelations astonished Rowlin. Rowlin confirmed that Rian Luvius was indeed part of her family. She explained that Rian had protected this territory from monsters until the day he was abducted and reported missing. Rowlin was once again shocked by this news and needed a moment to process that Rian had a son. Relieved that Rowlin took this news well, El expressed his belief that the fact of his father made them family. He also explained that when someone in his family was going through a tough time, he believed they should help each other. Serna, Kena, and El's mother listened attentively to El's warm and heartfelt words. As the waves of the sea crashed against the rocks, and the sound of the sea permeated the castle walls, El assured Rowland that with his help, she could continue protecting the people in her territory from further harm. Once again, tears streamed down Rowland's cheeks, and she apologized for showing a vulnerable side of herself. Encouragingly, El's mother said that she thought Rowland was an exceptionally cool person. Even if she shed tears at the moment. However, Rowland disagreed, insisting that she be addressed by her first name, as people usually referred to her with her title as Countess out of courtesy. El's mother, being particularly empathetic, gladly accepted the offer and introduced herself by her first name, Silfer. Serna, Kena, and El also introduced themselves once again, all wearing happy expressions, glad that their family member seemed to be a nice person. As a token of gratitude, Rowlin asked if it would be okay to invite the family to a very famous place in the Luvius territory and then inquired if they liked the sea. Excitedly, the three girls confirmed that they heard correctly and looked forward to a trip to the sea. Rowlin winked at the three women, mentioning that the weather outside was beautiful, and they could take a little excursion. The water was crystal clear, as always, and gentle waves rolled up and down the shore. As El's mother, Serna, and Cana walked along the beach, they once again marveled at the beauty of the sea. While the three women enjoyed the cool water and splashed around, Rowland explained to El that the sea was the only place in the entire territory they could boast about. El looked at one of the barrels and asked Rowlin if the sea was always so clear and deep in this location and if there should be plenty of seafood. Rowlin looked somewhat surprised at El but confirmed his assumption. She also glanced at the barrel overflowing with seaweed and explained to El that they had so much seafood that they couldn't consume it all, so they stored some in barrels like these, additionally, they hadn't found a good way to export them. 
As always, L directly asked Rowlin what she would think about selling him all the excess seafood. Rowlin would be somewhat surprised about what L would do with all the seafood and asked him if he was serious and what he intended to do with it. He explained to her that she had more seafood, that it would be better for him, and that she wouldn't have to worry about any transport costs or logistics. He also explained that all the seafood could be transported in a magic box. Which would be easy, and asked her to please accept his offer. Smiling, Rowlin recognized that there was a specific plan behind her cousin's expression and asked him if she was right. However, she also accepted Elle's request and agreed to supply him with all the excess seafood in the future. Elle was overjoyed to hear that his request had a positive outcome. In this world, potions are mainly used to amplify the energy of one's own body and harness the regenerative power of the body to heal wounds, for example. A main ingredient in such a regeneration potion is the blood of a manticore. To use this blood, the temple employs a special purification method to cleanse it and make it usable for production. However, there are unfortunately far too few potions in the kingdoms, nowhere near the quantity needed to heal all the injured. The main issue is the blood of a manticore, which cannot be easily delivered on demand. This resulted in a bitter day to hold auctions in the marketplaces for this ingredient. Accordingly, the temple was astonished when Dybal informed one of the temple knights in the Dajek Kingdom's Reynard Church that he possessed a whopping 300,000 bottles of highly sought after manticore blood. When the priest heard Dybal's claim, unbelieving as he was, he wanted to hear it again and asked for confirmation. Dybal told the priest, named Virek, that he knew a person who had such a quantity of blood. He also asked priest Virek how much of the amount he could take. Virek considered for a moment and then said that his church, powerful in holy magic, could use at most 10,000 to 30,000 bottles of this blood. Dybal then sighed, he hadn't expected the church to need so little and had anticipated a quantity around 100,000 bottles. This, in turn, surprised the priest, the priest had to react quickly and thought that a quantity of 100,000 bottles, while extremely large, could be manageable if he could mobilize nearby churches and collaborate with them. Additionally, he saw this as his golden opportunity to increase his influence and make substantial profits from dealing with Dybal. Not surprisingly, Driven by his greed, priest Virek changed his mind and told Dybal that he would gladly take 100,000 bottles of the blood. Dybal skillfully tried to solidify the priest's decision by expressing surprise and asking if it was really okay for him to suddenly order so much. To further play his role as a traitor, Dybal began explaining that this blood would also be highly sought after by other churches on the continent, proposing a price of 300,000 gold coins without a discount. Without much negotiation, the priest accepted Dybal's extremely lucrative offer and thanked him. However, Virek couldn't hide his curiosity and asked in the end who would provide such a valuable material in such quantity. Smiling, Dybal stated that the person in question was, in simple terms, the greatest genius of their time, thinking of El. El stood at the top of his magical tower, looking down at the city that had developed around it. As his gaze wandered over the city, he couldn't believe that this area was the notorious Manticore Gorge. He looked at the small warehouse next to his magical tower, where workers were currently transporting crates containing the valuable Manticore blood, ensuring the city's income remained stable. He recalled how, after capturing the Manticores, he transported them to his interdimensional space using his magic. He fed them with the seafood he received from his cousin. After the manticores had something to eat, the people of the city extracted their blood. While initially, some of the smaller manticores objected to the villagers taking their blood, El resolved this with the help of a new pet in the manticore kingdom. Before long, a true symbiosis developed between the manticores and the villagers. Thanks to the manticores' special and unique regenerative ability, they quickly regenerated their own blood, creating a continuous cycle. Through this cycle and symbiosis, a true friendship emerged, along with the opportunity for the village to generate enormous profits. While El still stood atop his tower, he reflected on the fact that not many people were aware of the magical tower now present in the Manticore Gorge. 
Since the transportation of goods occurred through a teleportation portal, even the nearby roads showed no signs of a particularly large amount of resources being transported to create such a tower. Nevertheless, there were rumors occasionally circulating that a new magical tower was being formed, one that would rival the other magical towers in most cities. El knew, however, that he had to act very cautiously to avoid jeopardizing the peace he had established. While standing thoughtfully on his tower, he heard someone rushing into his room urgently. Swiftly reacting, he teleported back into his room through a small portal. Just as he arrived, Kana burst through the door, loudly calling his name. Kana looked genuinely alarmed and agitated. Naturally, El wanted to know what was going on, so he asked his sister what was new and why she was in such a hurry. With tears streaming down her eyes, Kana cried and said that something was wrong with her sister. A cold shiver ran down El's spine, and he couldn't believe what he had just heard. Alongside Kana, he ran down the corridor, opened the door to Serna's room, and called her name. Upon entering the room, Serna lay in her bed, with their mother already sitting by the bedside, tending to her daughter. Serna had an elevated body temperature, was sweating, and could barely breathe. El promptly asked his mother if she was sick and what was wrong with her. His mother replied that she had no idea what had happened and implored her son to use his magic to find out what was happening with his sister. Aware of his mother's serious expression and Serna's labored breathing, El touched her wrist and tried to use his magic to discern what was happening within her. He was astonished and wide-eyed when he realized that the mana inside her body was slowly dissipating. He also recognized that something else was beginning to develop within her. At first, he couldn't determine whether it was a dark aura like that of a demon or the holy aura of heaven. After a while, he explained to his mother and Cana that, if he was correct, the new strength in Serna's body was a holy power. He also said that they had made a mistake, and now the entire continent would be after his sister. El's mother and Cana couldn't believe what El had just discovered. Furthermore, El stated that they should not waste any time because certain people might have already become aware of this event. He quickly instructed his sister, Kana, to take care of Serena, to which she immediately agreed. He then explained to his family that he needed to create a barrier around the village immediately. His mother asked if it had to be done right away, and El confirmed, assuring them not to worry and that he wouldn't be home for a while. After that, he disappeared through a portal leaving his family alone in Serena's room as he returned to the magical tower. Wondering how long it would take to erect a barrier around the entire city, he was aware that it should not matter if it took a bit more time, he had to ensure he did it correctly. El had a determination in his eyes signaling that he must protect his sister at any cost. Immediately, he raised his hand, unleashing his magic. Below him, a magical circle appeared instantly, swirling around him as if dancing. A large beam of magic shot into the sky, splitting at the top to form a barrier. The magic cascaded like a vast glass dome around the city. Meanwhile, in the Holy Kingdom of Gaia, in the Vatican, a high priest announced that the day they had been waiting for had arrived. This anticipation dated back 300 years, to the first time they received a prophecy. Alongside the elder priests, a young apprentice knelt, eagerly listening to his master's words. Together, they gazed at a large, brightly glowing source of mana that provided them with a prophecy about darkness. The mana source conveyed that the time had come to be joyful yet fearful and that the world bathed in a constant flow of change. Additionally, the elder and younger priests marveled as the prophecy continued revealing that there was a place that had never been understood and that a beauty as bright as light would emerge there to fill every dark place with light. The prophecy also pointed out finding a flower at this location, unmistakably referring to Cerna. The elder priest asked his younger colleague, Artemos, if he understood the prophecy, and the younger priest explained that the prophecy could mean the Levetan Plateau, where the souls of darkness existed. He further explained that the mention of the flow could be about magic. Continuing to convey his interpretation of the prophecy, sentence by sentence, he suggested that the prophecy might announce a new saint. His master found his interpretation perfect and praised his student for it. 
Subsequently, he tasked them with announcing the revelation of the saint and declaring that a new saint would appear on their continent. They were instructed to collaborate with the Tolian kingdom and its knights, he then said that the appearance of a new saint was the will of God, and his disciples should put all his devotion into fulfilling these tasks. Completely euphoric and blinded by the prophecy, he also made it clear to his student that the Holy Kingdom currently possessed the strongest power of all time and that the arrival of a new saint had been expected for over five hundred years. Meanwhile, Cerna visibly suffered, her body temperature rising, and breathing becoming increasingly difficult. Cana had tears in her eyes as she watched her sister in such pain, hoping that she would overcome it all. In contrast, El's mother prayed for her daughter to pull through. El continued with the plan to erect a barrier to protect his sister. Like a good, loving mother would, El's mother, who stroked the strands from her daughter's face, touched her cheek, and hoped that she would soon feel better, anticipating the time when they could have fun together again. El, who was back in the room by now, explained to his family that, in the meantime, the mana in Serena's body was slowly but surely being replaced by holy power. He also reminded them that, Unlike other ordinary mages or knights, Serna had an enormous amount of mana in her body. Due to this immense amount of mana, an equally massive amount of holy power had to be channeled into her, and this quantity was responsible for the intense pain she was currently experiencing. L also stated that they could not stop this process, and there was nothing they could do to prevent Serna from becoming a saint. He knew that the Holy Kingdom would inform everyone about the birth of a new saint, and it was only a matter of time before they found Cerna. Cana knew that this holy kingdom, which revered the gods, would spare no effort to take her sister into their custody, El's mother also knew that a saint had no freedoms and that, in principle, it would make no difference whether she were a saint or in hell. She absolutely did not want such a fate for her daughter, and she would do everything in her power to ensure that her beloved daughter would not lead such an unhappy life. When Cana sensed her mother's loving thoughts, she made the decision to do everything she could to protect her precious sister. L, too, wanted to do everything to save his beloved family member from such a fate, and he reassured his mother and sister that they would be able to protect Serna. Suddenly, a small sound filled the room, drawing closer to L until it transformed into a magical letter. As L looked down at the letter, he recognized that it seemed to be from the royal palace. Curious, El's mother asked what the royal palace wanted and if anything special had happened. While El read the letter, he explained to his mother that the royal palace wanted him to attend the royal conference. Skeptical, his mother asked why he, of all people, should participate in the royal conference, to which El replied that he had no idea why. His only guess was that they might want him to officially announce that he had built a new magic tower and that he would declare his alliance with the third prince to strengthen the Essen faction. However, El also knew that magic towers traditionally held a neutral stance regarding a kingdom, and this invitation potentially would not bring any changes to his plans. Worried and sad, El's mother looked up at him and asked what he was planning again. Somewhat self-satisfied, he looked down, then set off, telling his mother and sisters that he would return soon and that they should please take care of Serna in the meantime. In conclusion, El's mother wished him a safe journey and asked him to return in one piece. El headed to his cousin's residence. It was still without valuable furnishings and quite simple. El immediately recognized that his cousin's territory was much more stable than it had been a few days ago. Raulin said that it had only been possible to have such a stable territory because El had helped her and thanked him once again. However, she was curious about why El had visited her today, as she couldn't believe that he would simply stroll around her territory without an ulterior motive. To which El asked her if he was that easy to read, Raulin responded with a sobering look, stating that even though they hadn't known each other for long, everyone would think that El never did anything without ulterior motives. L, once again, wanted to be direct and asked Rowlin if she wouldn't want them to attend the royal conference together to bring the Luvius family a step closer to world politics. This news surprised Rowlin, who asked if she understood L correctly. L said that he believed, with her skills and the support of a magic tower, she could be capable of restoring the Luvius family to an important and influential noble status. 
he suggested that their financial difficulties could be alleviated with the export of seafood. Furthermore, Elle explained to Rowland that she was still famous for being a sword expert at such a young age and that she had a group of knights who followed her. If these knights decided to fight under the name of the Luvius family, their political power would become even stronger. All of this would contribute to the Luvius family restoring its honor. Rowland grasped Elle's words. She thought for a moment but doubted that, even if her family continued to grow steadily, they would still not be on par with other families. Elle asked her if she might be referring to the Tarendel family, to which Rowland widened her eyes and asked why he specifically mentioned that family for comparison. Elle explained that this was a famous story, and he had heard that the second son of that family persistently proposed marriage. Moreover, they took advantage of the fact that the Luvius family had recently been under monster attacks to continue pressuring them to accept the marriage proposal. However, L also pointed out that this family was the reason monsters could keep infiltrating the Luvius family's territory. Rowland had to control herself and squeezed her hands slightly. She knew that the Tarendel family was an arrogant and shameless family. Yet, she also knew that the family had a higher status than hers and exploited that fact. Ashamed of her own situation, she looked down at her hands, prompting Elle to say that the time had come for her to declare the true strength of her own family and stand up against this unfair treatment. He also sensed that Rowland wanted to seize her chance, to change and no longer passively watch as her family continued to lose honor, but to slowly rebuild that honor. To reaffirm this and to continue encouraging her, Elle mentioned that he was a seventh-level mage and recently acquired a magic tower. He emphasized that he was on the same level and social standing as the Tarendel family, just not in a kingdom but across the entire continent, in this kingdom, he might even manage to achieve a higher status and ensure that no further harm comes to the Luvius family. Rowland looked moodily at Elle and asked him why he was being so warm and kind to her. She then shouted loudly, questioning whether it might be because he had some ulterior motives. L denied this and told her not to trivialize the whole situation. He explained that they were cousins and that she should stop looking at him sexually. She admitted she misunderstood and apologized for her behavior. L, however, understood that due to the many difficult situations Rowlin had been through. It was hard for her to accept goodwill and believe in the innocence of people. This was also a reason why he felt compassion for her as she had been on her own for so long. He was all the more pleased that he could now lend her a helping hand. Afterward, L took his leave and bid farewell to Rowlin. He reminded her that it would start tomorrow, and he would pick her up for the conference using teleportation. Until then, she should take care of everything else. L teased her a bit, joking that she actually thought he wanted something sexual from her. Rowlin apologized once again, while L just made light of his little joke. Meanwhile, an important meeting was taking place in the castle. And a fist was forcefully slammed onto a table. An older man with a funny beard and thinning hair asked the conference what they intended to do as the second prince's faction was in danger. He also explained that the plan to weaken the first prince's faction had failed, and the third prince's faction had even gained more power. He reiterated to everyone present that if this plan continued to run this way, they would inevitably lose power. He asked the group of older gentlemen if anyone might have an idea to prevent this. However, the old gentleman at the table just looked down and remained silent. The older man with the funny beard raised his voice once again, asking for ideas. A hand went up. And another of the gentlemen began to speak. He looked like me when I make these videos, with mega dark circles and way too little sleep. So, please give me a like and leave a comment. The older man said he had an idea and wanted to share it at the instruction of the man with the funny beard, the person in question was Marquis Brilkend. Marquis Brilkend reiterated the fact that the first prince's sphere of influence remained stable while the third prince's influence expanded. However, he also emphasized that there was no cause for concern. Furthermore, he stressed that they still possessed a formidable military force. He then whispered his diabolical plan, leaving the other dignitaries at the table astonished. Finding it hard to believe what they had just heard. 
The man with the funny beard, on the other hand, had to acknowledge that he expected nothing less from Marquis Brilkend. He deemed the method effective and was speechless at the cleverness of Marquis Brilkend's idea. Marquis Brilkend expressed gratitude for the commendation and pledged to work diligently to implement his plan so they could achieve their goal. The man with the funny beard then stated that they belonged there as well. Since Serena's mana began to dissipate and was replaced by holy power, two months had already passed. The immense amount of holy power in her body must have been noticed in the Holy Kingdom, and her approximate location was likely known. However, Bell also had to consider that he needed to pursue his other plans. Therefore, accompanied by his cousin Rowlin, he went to the capital to participate in the Tolian Conference. Overwhelmed by the sight of the capital, both stood on the streets, impressed by what they saw. In front of them rose a grand castle on a hill, while the people of the capital went about their daily lives. Elle asked Rowlin if she had ever seen such beautiful streets before. Turning to her for confirmation. However, Rowlin was completely overwhelmed by the sight of the capital and stood there motionless. Concerned, Elle asked Rowlin if something was wrong and why she wasn't responding. She replied that she was simply overwhelmed by the grand and beautiful streets and had been startled by him. This surprised Elle. When he mentioned that, despite being the countess of this kingdom, she had never been to the capital before, she explained that she had never been here because she was always busy with work in her territory. This made Elle aware once again of the heavy burden his cousin had been carrying alone for so long and how long she had been dealing with it alone. To cheer her up, he suggested that since they were already here, they could take a little exploration tour of the city. This, in turn, amazed Rowlin, who turned happily to Elle and asked if that was okay. Elle grabbed her wrist and pulled her with a smile into the streets of the capital to explore. And so, gradually, it became evening, clouds gathered, the sun sank behind the horizon, and the stars illuminated a nearby inn where Elle and Rowland planned to spend the night. Both entered the inn and were still completely overwhelmed by the impressions of the beautiful and large capital. Elle had to admit that it felt good to relax and have fun, to which Rowland agreed, thanking him for the beautiful time. Overjoyed, Rowland looked at Elle, thinking about how wonderful it would be to show the people from her territory this exceedingly magnificent capital as well. However, when suddenly her name was called, and she was summoned, her expression changed, as if she had fallen into a trauma. Elle realized that the one calling her was Locke. Locke immediately asked Rowland with which other man she was traveling, and in the same breath, he insulted him. Locke immediately realized that L was not a trained sword artist instructed in the art of the sword. He immediately asked why she was traveling with a third-rate magician, insinuating that she was only interested in younger men. Furthermore, he shouted through the entire entrance hall of the inn, asking if L was the reason why she had rejected his marriage proposal until now. Without giving Rowlin or Elle a chance to explain, he approached both and grumbled close to Elle's face. Locke became angrier and insulted Elle more and more, who stood there completely bewildered, wondering what all of this meant. Locke, however, did not let up. He pointed at Elle with his right hand and ordered him to reveal his identity. Even when Rowlin told him to be careful and keep his mouth shut since he had no idea, he ignored this and continued his show. He pointed at L and said that if he had nothing to hide, he could simply say who he was. He also claimed that if L were a magician, he would be in a lower class and weaker than himself. When Rowland then mentioned what he suddenly had against a lower class and that he was talking quite foolishly and embarrassingly, Locke became even angrier despite his furious state. But the angrier Locke became, the more self-confidence Rowland gained. She said with an audacious expression in her eyes directly to Locke's face that he was nothing more than the second oldest son of the Marquis and still had no title himself. She could not forgive him for being so rude to her as a countess. Rowland also emphasized that he should now slowly realize how great the difference between their statuses actually was. In conclusion, she said that he should learn the laws of the land before trying to be condescending to someone with a higher position than himself. This self-confidence and these very harsh words shocked Locke, 
after which he stood motionless and did not utter another word. He then apologized to Rowlin and turned back to L. While they left Locke standing, Rowlin explained to L that this person was the second oldest son of Marquis Terendel, after which L realized that he was the one who had repeatedly tried to propose to Rowlin. When Locke came to his senses, his face changed again to the angry expression from before. He turned around and looked at L and Rowlin with hatred and jealousy. As Rowlin and L were about to set off, Rowlin said loudly enough for Locke to hear that they should go on their way since she felt bad due to all the negativity spread by Locke. To further provoke Locke, L agreed to the statement. Left alone with his anger, Locke clenched his fist and seated. He reflected on all he had done to win countries for himself and remembered how many times she had rejected him just because she was with L. Nevertheless, he did not want to rely on that and swore revenge on L, even if it would happen at the upcoming conference. It grew darker, and gradually later, clouds drifted over the city, and the once starry sky became sporadically visible. The king stood with Duke Lias on his balcony, looking down on the city together. He told Duke Lias that he was glad the issue with the Manticore Gorge had been resolved so well and asked what his friend Duke Lias thought of it. Duke Lias agreed with the king and said they owed it all to L, the magician who owned the tower. The duke also praised the golems, which had played a significant role in defeating the monsters from the Manticore Gorge. Duke Lias was still excited that a golem was as strong and powerful as a knight of the Grandmaster rank. He praised L for being a truly amazing magician and compared him to an onion. King Liedolf turned around and asked if he had misheard or if the duke had really compared L to a simple onion. Duke Lias explained to his king that he expected endless possibilities from L's abilities and admired L for his unconventional and unusual ideas. L was not a simple magician, but the more one discovered about him, the more complex he seemed to be, almost like an onion. The king then began to laugh and said that this could be a joke from his father. When the duke made a dad joke about water, asking if he meant a well, King Liedolf did not respond and only said that he was very grateful that a magician like El had helped his kingdom, and he looked forward to El participating in the conference tomorrow. Duke Lias asked Liedolf if he really believed that El would comply with his request. As it was heard everywhere that a magical tower should not interfere in domestic affairs. King Liedolf asked the duke if he really doubted him and reminded him that even though El was young, his abilities surpassed those of his age. Additionally, while leaning on the railing, he explained that El knew very well how he would affect his surroundings and that as a king, he could rely on him. He deduced that when he had supported him and accepted his offer to build the magical tower in his kingdom, it was a decision to support him in his struggle for the throne. The next day, the conference began, with many aristocrats already in attendance, including Locke, who had seemingly attempted to propose to Rowland repeatedly before. They all sat at a small table. This conference occurred four times a year, and any aristocrat who had earned the title in the traditional way could participate and invite up to two direct descendants. To initiate the conference on that day, King Liedolf greeted the aristocrats. Rowland sat not directly at the table but on the edge of the conference with some of the other men. The king said that this conference, without a specific theme as usual, should begin, and he invited the aristocrats at the table to present their ideas for the kingdom's development. It didn't take long before the man with the funny beard spoke up, stating that he had something to propose. He began by saying that now that the monsters that had previously endangered them were dead, the kingdom drew hope from beginners. He also explained that he believed the kingdom was now at the highest peak of power it had ever reached, having defeated the monsters with minimal losses, and last year's harvest was truly excellent. All of this was the reason why this year had been the best in decades. The other aristocrats at the table murmured in agreement as the man with the funny beard continued to elaborate on his point. He said that this was probably the best opportunity to expand their influence a bit. According to him, it was now extremely important to convince the surrounding nations of their strength. So, he suggested that their idea should be to raid the kingdom of Hessen. The king, as well as the other aristocrats, were somewhat surprised by this idea from Tujimbalir, the man with the funny beard. However, 
Tujin Balir continued with his explanation, the kingdom of Hessen had stolen from them for several decades, blaming the mountain bandits afterward. When he revealed that they had recently received information that this kingdom disguised its soldiers as mountain bandits to steal food, the other aristocrats at the edge of the conference room were equally astonished. Tujin Balir explained that there were clear evidence justifying a raid, not only for the sake of revenge but also to demonstrate their newfound strength to neighboring nations. All the aristocrats turned their attention to Duke Tujinbalir. Since this duke was the leader of the second prince, the aristocrats aligned with the first prince were particularly shocked. However, unlike the aristocrats, King Liedolf maintained composure, although he was somewhat shocked by this news. He stated that such an action would need serious consideration, and he wanted to contemplate how other nations would react in his place. Blinded by the desire for revenge, Duke Tujimbalir reassured the king that there was no need to worry since no one could withstand an overwhelming power attack. He explained that the aristocrats on his side could provide a total army of 20,000 men, and if the king gave his approval, he would immediately send them all to the kingdom of Hessen. However, King Liedolf knew what Duke Tujimbalir intended, and the proposal made at the beginning of the conference was quite tempting. If they were to take over the kingdom of Hessen, the influence of their own kingdom would benefit and increase exponentially. Duke Tujinbalir also mentioned that, if the order were given, he would propose the second prince as the supreme commander. His greed and cunning were still evident as he explained that while the first prince must protect the kingdom, he thought it would be a good idea for the second prince to prove himself and gain some experience. Objectively, the kingdom of Hessen was not a crucial nation for the Tolian kingdom, but it held significance. If such a raid were successful and the two kingdoms merged, it would be the first step in expanding and providing access to other kingdoms. Additionally, leading such an assault would bring the second prince one step closer to the throne. When Duke Tujimbalir finished speaking, another aristocrat with light brown hair interrupted him. He disagreed with his colleague and argued that they had few losses last year thanks to him and his soldiers. However, he could not guarantee that this year would be equally successful. He proposed that, instead of raiding other kingdoms, they should focus on strengthening the influence of their own kingdom and prepare for the upcoming monster invasion. He emphasized that this was the only way to protect their nation and citizens. King Liedolf listened attentively as the aristocrat with light brown hair expressed his concerns and arguments. He knew that Marquis Tarendel, the leader of the first prince's faction, did not want the second prince to receive praise and attention through Duke Tujinbalir's planned action. On one side were the followers of the first prince, while on the other side, the second prince's faction was represented. In the middle was King Liedolf, pondering and wondering why both sides couldn't work together. He explained that he had heard the concerns of both parties but also clarified that the reason for today's conference was different. King Liedolf wanted to introduce the aristocrats to a special magician and ask this magician to enter the room. Slowly, a door opened, and the magician entered. L introduced himself to the aristocrats. Barely had he placed a hand on the table today when someone stood up. This surprised Rowland directly. Not even a few seconds had passed since L had introduced himself when Locke, the second son of the Tarendel family, stood up. He insulted L and loudly claimed that he himself had thought L was a magician from the Livius family. Meanwhile, L moved to the king's side and simply stood there, while the other nobles looked shocked at Locke and asked what this reaction to the announcement of a magician meant. Even Marquis Tarendel, Locke's father, was surprised by his son's reaction and asked him if something was wrong and why he was reacting so suddenly out of nowhere. Locke pointed at L, who still showed no sign of disturbance and just stood there. Locke also said that he had something against L that he needed to tell them. He went on to say that he had seen L last night at a hotel in the capital and that he had behaved outrageously there. He placed his hand on his chest and told everyone that L was a third-rate magician who had insulted him there. He also mentioned that it was publicly known that he had been proposing to Countess Luvius for a while, and L had interfered to prevent him from marrying her. 
While his father stood shocked beside him, Locke continued to tell that even though he didn't have a title yet, he was a significant and important personality in the kingdom. Furthermore, he was the second son of the Tarendel family, not to mention that he also came from noble blood. He then asked the gathering how he could forgive El and maintain his pride as a noble when he had so obviously insulted and degraded him. Subsequently, Locke turned directly to the king and requested him, under no circumstances, to trust El but to punish him immediately. This surprised Liedolf, as he had not expected such a reaction to El's introduction. The conference fell silent for a brief moment. During which Locke continued to glare at El with the same intense hatred as their first encounter. Locke was so consumed by his hatred that he could only think about his nobility and believe that those who stood in his way should know their place in society. He felt that these people deserved special punishment. Over time, it became increasingly difficult for El to suppress his laughter, and a small grin slowly escaped him. King Liedolf cleared his throat before the situation could potentially escalate further and told the aristocrats that everyone, especially Locke, should please calm down. Pointing to El, King Liedolf stated that this young man was one of the greatest strengths to propel their kingdom forward and secure their future. Finally, he reintroduced El as the owner of the magical tower. The king's words stirred the crowd, and the aristocratic men, once again shocked, wondered if they had heard correctly. Like the nobles currently debating the order of the heir to the throne, the appearance of a seventh-level magician was like a wild card that could reshuffle the dice and bring victory to their faction. Some of the noble individuals recognized that a magical tower could only be created by a magician of the seventh level or higher and wondered if this young man was indeed such a magician. Because if this were true, said another noble, L would be on the same level as a marquis. L's grin continued to spread across his face. As if he had been waiting for this moment. With a smile, he raised his hand to the sky and told the noble people that if they had any doubts, he would be happy to give them a little taste of his power. As he spoke, he channeled his mana around him, and a blue magical circle appeared beneath him. He prepared to unleash his magic. Above the heads of the aristocrats in the middle of the room, a small magical pool of mana appeared, which, after a few seconds, split into smaller sparks of mana, enveloping the surroundings in El's mana. The nobles in the room were fascinated by this spectacle, marveling at how beautifully the mana spread throughout the space. However, they also realized that this mana was a massive amount. And the air around them became increasingly dense. Their doubts about El possibly being an imposter were suddenly blown away. Even Marquis Tarendel, as well as his son Locke, marveled at the small spectacle and were surprised by El's impressive power. When El saw that his little demonstration had the desired effect, he was pleased that his plan had succeeded and looked confidently into the still astonished crowd of nobles. King Liedolf suddenly burst into laughter and said that once again, El had performed extraordinary magic, praising him for it. This caused El to lose eye contact with the front and look down at the king. Liedolf looked up at El over his shoulder and told him that it seemed like all the nobles now believed in him. And he might think that the presentation was enough. El understood the words of his king and interrupted his magic, causing the sparks in the air to turn into tiny particles, sprinkling down like fairy dust on the noble aristocrats. Locke, now realizing what he had just uttered and the powerful magician he had confronted, became frightened. The hand with which he had confidently pointed at El just moments ago was now cautiously and fearfully drawn close to his body. El recognized this and thought that his demonstration had probably been enough and hoped that Locke would leave his cousin Rowlan alone in the future. However, he also realized that if this wasn't enough, he would not be so kind and would not hold back in the future. Locke became increasingly aware of the situation as he looked at El's face. Even his own father had to acknowledge the mess his son had made and dared not take sides, as it could mean that El would now decide against the prince's side. Thus, the Marquis turned his face away from his son. El realized that he would ruin the atmosphere at this table and that, thanks to him, further discussion might not be possible. So, he stated this directly and made it clear that he would now leave. 
King Liedolf apologized for it and regretted that L had made the whole journey to this conference for this reason. As L walked toward the door through which he had entered, he said that it was okay. Before opening the door to leave the room, he looked back at the king and all the nobles and told them that he looked forward to the future with them. Then he closed the door behind him. After L's performance, Rowland couldn't help but laugh, knowing that L had planned everything exactly as it unfolded and that the plan had once again completely succeeded. King Liedolf reiterated that L was the savior of their kingdom and currently the most important person in the land. He also told them that he would like them all to approach him with the utmost gratitude they can muster. Without needing to say it, everyone felt that Prince Judmian, the third prince, supported by the hidden power of the royal family, had the highest chances of becoming the next king. Moreover, it was clear to everyone that the king, openly advocating that the master of the magic tower was the most important person, would benefit King Liedolf from the growing power of the master of the magic tower, which in turn would strengthen the power of Prince Judmian, supported by the king. This was particularly understood by Marquis Terendel, who supported the first prince, and Duke Tujinbalier, who supported the second prince. Both knew that they had to be especially cautious and act cleverly if they wanted their faction to end up on the throne. King Liedolf announced that they would need to reconcile and discuss the matter of the Hessen kingdom and the power of the magic tower master together. And that's why the whole topic would be postponed for the time being. This announcement surprised Duke Tujinbalier, who had not expected such an outcome. Then King Liedolf asked if there was anything else on their agenda, to which no one said anything. Liedolf became a bit more serious and, with his royal authority, said that if this was the case and no one had anything more, they could end the conference here. He also made it clear to everyone that if they had further questions about L, they should save them for the next conference. After that, the king left the room and went on his way. He walked alone along a small narrow corridor and knocked on a door at the end, leading to Princess Elisa's study room. A very feminine, bright voice from the room asked who was knocking at the door, to which Liedolf said it was him. Princess Elise happily said that her father could come in. He directly opened the door and then said that he had finally found her and that this must be the place where she was. He looked at his daughter Elise, who sat in a leather chair in front of a bookshelf, reading a book alone. He knew that his daughter loved books above all else. King Liedolf entered the room and said that she was now seventeen years old and the smartest and wisest princess far and wide, and that's why he had always trusted her. Elise thanked him for the compliment, and she immediately knew what her father was getting at. She also had no fear of directly asking him. King Liedolf faced the challenging task of convincing Princess Elise to undertake a significant action for the good of the kingdom's future. This action involved marrying El. Through this union, not only would a strong family unit be formed, but also a measurable power would transfer to the king. Thus, he could ensure that his third son would ascend the throne. King Liedolf repeatedly appealed to his daughter to understand that these were symbols of their kingdom and that they could become a powerful nation through this. He also explained to her that he would attend the party tomorrow and why she shouldn't just take the opportunity to get to know him then. Finally, he told her that he believed she would like El if she saw him just once. King Liedolf also explained to his daughter that as a father, he believed marrying a master of a magic tower would be good for her. As a dutiful daughter, Princess Elise agreed and said that if he wanted, she would have a conversation with El tomorrow. She also expressed, with a radiant smile on her face as the moonlight shone on her body, that she was already curious about what El might be like. Since King Liedolf noticed that his daughter was not entirely averse to the idea, he looked somewhat relieved, turned around, and wanted to leave his daughter in peace. He told her that he would see her at the party tomorrow. Princess Elise thanked him and said she also looked forward to seeing him at the party tomorrow. She took the book she had just read with her to one of the countless bookshelves in the room and put it back in its place. She thought about the Master L of the Golden Tower, whose symbol was gold, and wondered as she looked up at the moon what L might be like. The next day, some guests were already gathered in the royal party hall, and L and his cousin Rowland were gradually making their way to the event. 
L asked Rowlin why she had laughed back then, to which she replied that she thought everything was going according to L's plan and that he had planned everything just like that. L explained to her that his intention was that people could be convinced much faster with actions than with words, and that his demonstration was meant to ensure that they would not act recklessly against him in the future. L also noticed something about Rowland's clothing, prompting him to address it. She asked what he had with her clothing and wanted to know what L had to criticize. L explained to her that she was wearing the uniform of a knight instead of a dress, and why she did that on this day and at this event. However, she only replied that she was not here to seduce a man in a dress and that there was nothing wrong with wearing her uniform. This time, Rowlin allowed herself a joke and asked Elle if he had hoped to see her today in a sexy dress. However, Elle didn't taste his own medicine, and he didn't find the joke as amusing. Afterward, he wanted to accompany her today, and they entered the party hall of the castle together. It was a grand, colorful party that couldn't be more magnificent, and the royal fragrance, as well as a regal atmosphere, filled the room. The entire hall was teeming with younger noble aristocrats eagerly waiting to meet Elle. Such was the fame of the person behind the position of the tower's master. Barely had Elle and Rowland taken a few steps into the colorful magnificent hall when people turned to look at them, trying to strike up a conversation. For Rowland, it was like a dream. Just a few weeks ago. She was a small countess in her own little territory, and now she stood at the center of politics, greeted by the highest nobles. She could never have dreamed that these aristocrats would approach her. She looked over to L and was quite sure that they actually wanted to build a more familiar relationship with him than with her. Nevertheless, she also recognized the opportunity to revive the name of her family here, with all that it entailed, even if it meant sacrificing everything. She greeted the young aristocrats and introduced herself. L looked over to Rowlin, hoping that this would be a good opportunity for her to restore her name. After a brief welcome to the guests already in the hall, it was announced that the king would now arrive. He entered the room with his daughter Princess Elise and took his seat on his throne. The king announced to the guests, all holding a red wine in their hands, that this party today was a welcome party for the tower master they had all been waiting for. He also announced that this master was present today, and they should all welcome him. The king then said they could now begin the party with a toast in honor of L. L was somewhat surprised as he did not know that he would now speak to the guests and propose a toast. He looked over to the guests, assumed a formal posture, introduced himself again, and thanked them for hosting a party in his honor. Then, he raised his two hands, brought them together in the middle, and conjured many small orange cherry blossoms into the surroundings. A kind of small rose storm spread in the hall, and many cherry blossoms fluttered around. The guests were visibly delighted and enjoyed the little spectacle. In conclusion, L once again expressed his hope that everyone had a great time today. Apart from the fact that small cherry blossoms floated throughout the entire hall, L's spell also achieved something else. The stressed thoughts of the nobles, fighting each other to see their party on the throne, eased somewhat, and their nerves relaxed. When L saw that the king and the princess could relax thanks to his magic, he looked overjoyed. However, he didn't feel very comfortable in the hall, where all eyes were on him. So, L went to one of the outer balconies. Leaned against the railing, and looked out into the night sky. He sighed and thought that places where many people gathered were always extremely exhausting for him. He just couldn't get used to so many eyes on him. In this life, however, he had the added challenge that those many eyes might be from nobles of different families. After these thoughts, he took a deep breath. At that moment, another person approached from behind. She exclaimed that she had found him now and smiled. Curious, Elle turned around and recognized that it was Princess Elise. She, in turn, was surprised that he recognized her. As polite as appropriate, Elle said that there was no other option for him but to recognize the princess of the kingdom in which he lived. Princess Elise said it was an honor to meet a magical tower master. She continued that due to Elle's wit, she thinks he already knows why she visited today. 
L listened silently for the moment and then said that he thought His Majesty, the King, had spoken to her about a potential marriage. He also mentioned that he knew she was a very intelligent and wise woman as a princess and that she had rejected many possible suitors in the past. That might be a reason why she would initiate the conversation first. The princess confirmed his intuition and praised him for being truly amazing. However, Princess Elise also clarified that she was not only here to fulfill her father's request. She explained to Elle that she wanted to get to know him and found him interesting. This surprised Elle even more, and he asked if he had heard correctly. Princess Elise told him that she had heard they were the same age and that he had already reached the seventh level of magic. That, she said, was no reason not to engage in a conversation with such a person. This shocked Elle even more, and he noticed that the vibe of this conversation had completely changed. The conversation started with the princess fulfilling her father's request, but it shifted towards her own curiosity as she asked Elle how on earth he acquired such abilities. The princess looked at Elle with bright eyes, eagerly awaiting his response. Elle scratched his cheek and told her that she might not believe him. But he had taught himself everything. The princess was taken aback and said she thought geniuses were just born as geniuses. However, Elle looked at the princess and, with a clear expression, stated that he was not a genius and that it was an absurd assumption. He believed that whether he was in the seventh or eighth grade of magic, he was ultimately just himself and by no means a genius. He also said that he was just one of the many people in this world, and there was no difference between him and others. For a brief moment, Princess Elise fell silent. She then said that she was actually just curious, wondering if he thought differently than everyone else, given that he had reached the level of an archmage at such a young age. She continued to explain that she was the princess of the Tolian kingdom, a woman with duties and rights but not the ability to do whatever she pleased. She also told Elle that, for now, she was restraining her own will, even though she knew it wouldn't ultimately help the royal family. At the end of the day, she would have to marry someone for the sake of her family, and this marriage was also a duty to her country. When Elle said that this wasn't true, Princess Elise widened her eyes. With a calm yet pained expression, he uttered wise words that there were many other things she could do for the kingdom that had nothing to do with marriage. He advised her not to worry about such things. Emphasizing that the most important thing was to do what the princess truly wished for, and even sacrificing oneself was never a beautiful act. Princess Elise was increasingly amazed as she listened to Elle's words. He also expressed his willingness to help her find her own path. Finally, Elle said he hoped she understood him correctly and suggested they go back to the party together. Elle then walked past the princess back into the hall, leaving her there to sort out her thoughts. Princess Elise appreciated Elle for not simply playing along with her father's game and had to acknowledge that he was a truly special person who seemed to understand her. As Elle left the princess alone, he hoped that she had understood his words. When he returned to the party, he glanced to the side and asked what his cousin Rowlin was doing there. Rowlin explained that she was taking a short break and claimed not to have overheard Elle's conversation with the princess, although she had, of course. Elle wanted to convey something to Rowlin and told her not to think he was being presumptuous. However, he hoped that Rowlin could persuade the group of nobles gathered around her to join the faction of the third prince. Rowlin then asked if Elle believed that her joining the faction of the third prince could stabilize the triangular structure of the kingdom. Elle explained that she understood everything correctly. He further elaborated that currently. The factions of the first and second princes had more influence than that of the third prince, and strengthening the third prince's faction could rebalance the system. Rowlin smiled and said she would do anything Elle told her, as she fully trusted him, and he just had to say the word. Elle thanked Rowlin with a handshake, to which she replied that she was the one who should be thanking him. In a nearby forest on the same night, the stars illuminated the sky, and clouds once again gathered. A figure wearing a robe ascended a small cliff and spoke about reaching the Tolian kingdom. This was the place High Priest Artemos had instructed them to find. Along with a few other priests. 
Revealed to be the Radiance Knights, they were there to carry out the mission to search for the Holy One. The next day, King Liedolfa's shouting echoed throughout the entire castle. He asked if he understood correctly that the Holy One, foretold by the Oracle, was born in his kingdom and sought confirmation from Priest Bolak. Standing with a self-satisfied and feigned grin before His Majesty the King, Priest Bolak confirmed that the King had understood correctly and asked him if he could not imagine anything more delightful. King Liedolf, however, asked Priest Bolak if he was sure he was interpreting the Oracle's prophecy correctly. Bolak explained to the King that if they were wrong, another faction of the Holy Church would search the surrounding nations. Nevertheless, the Church was confident, and all signs pointed to Liedolf's kingdom. King Liedolf had to think for a moment, he rubbed his face, pondering whether the Holy One could truly be in his kingdom and what this would mean for him. If the Holy One were indeed in his kingdom, it would mean that the power intended to emanate from the Holy Kingdom would significantly increase. Currently, although the Holy Kingdom had roughly the same sized army in territory as his, it was already much stronger, possessing the power of one of the ten grandmasters. Even other nations could not easily contend with the Holy Kingdom. Therefore, King Liedolf concluded that it would be better to assist the Holy Kingdom in its mission to find the Holy One. He asked Priest Bolak how he could contribute to their cause. However, Priest Bolak said they currently did not need real help as they could control the Holy One with their strength. What they needed more was a leader who could bring the Holy Knights to the location dictated by the Oracle. King Liedolf was somewhat surprised that the priest had merely requested a leader and asked her the land was that the Oracle had predicted. Priest Bolak narrowed his eyes slightly and said that the place they needed to go would be near a Levetan plateau and have rugged terrain. He thought it might be a location near the monster land in the west of the continent. Liedolf immediately knew which place he was referring to and asked if that was really the case. However, King Liedolf also explained to the priest that the place he meant was a very dangerous location, and the journey there would be challenging. He bid farewell to the priest, left, and said he would send someone tomorrow to guide him and his comrades to the mentioned place, however, he should rest for the journey today. Priest Bolak thanked the king for his cooperation and waved after him. As the king left his throne room and once again walked along a small corridor, he had to think about the troubles he was in. Immediately, King Liedolf deduced that the Holy One had a connection to El and that they would certainly not surrender. If this were the case, he knew he had to warn El immediately that the Holy Kingdom was after him. As he continued down the corridor, he called for his loyal friend Desalin and asked where he was. Hastily, he opened a double door and found Desalin comfortably sitting at the table, enjoying his lunch with a few delicious dumplings. Liedolf immediately rushed to Desalin, interrupted his meal, and ordered him to connect him promptly with the magical communication line to the magic tower. Before Desalin could ask questions, Liedolf pointed out that a significant storm was brewing, and they had no time to wait. It took quite a while to establish the entire barrier over the entire Manticord Valley. L, who was on the seventh level of magic, had to work with his mother Clifer continuously on this barrier for over a year. But in the end, the result was impressive. When L and his mother checked the results of their work, they were confident that they could now live safely, and the barrier should withstand many attacks. Using the strong erosion because it was in the ground, they subsequently overlaid the barrier to make it even stronger. So that, once the mana flow, now flowing through the barrier, would be disturbed by other magicians besides El and his mother, they should feel a significant impairment in their magic. Other magicians in this area cannot properly manifest their entire magic. As El and his mother inspected the barrier, his mother praised him for becoming more incredible every day and that the barrier they created together was truly impressive. El wanted to reassure her and told his mother that even if they shouldn't encounter any problems in the near future, it would be better to be cautious. As fate would have it, at that moment, his sister Kena came running and called frantically for El. As his sister ran towards him, El asked what was going on. Kena wrote while running that he had received a magical message and that he should come quickly. El and his mother were somewhat surprised by the message and wanted to quickly follow up to check what the magical message was about. 
El ordered his mother to please retreat to the magic tower to rest for a bit and then quickly teleported away. However, her maternal instincts told her that something didn't feel right, and she began to worry. El, who had teleported directly to the tower, was in his office, looking at a mirror where he saw his reflection. He walked up to the mirror, stretched out his hand, and received the message from King Liedolf, who appeared in the mirror. King Liedolf mentioned that it had been a while since they last saw each other and explained to El that it was an emergency. Curious, El asked what was going on, speculating that it must be the Holy Kingdom wanting something from King Liedolf. Shocked, Liedolf asked how El would know that again. El replied that he had already heard that the Holy Kingdom had invaded nearby territories and was exploring them. The king, curious, asked El if what he heard was true and if there was a new saint in his kingdom. El confirmed this truthfully. The king then made it clear that if the saint was with them, he would not be able to avoid a conflict with the Holy Kingdom. Additionally, King Liedolf asked El if he already had another plan for this, as the Holy Kingdom had people with a strong army who would not hesitate to resort to death. El had to control his emotions and clenched his fist. He explained to the king that the saint was a member of his family and that his plan definitely did not involve handing the family member over to the Holy Kingdom just like that. El also explained the process of how a saint is born, that one day, a normal female magician loses all her mana and overflows with holy magic. He emphasized that they were just as surprised as everyone else. El told King Liedolf that they could not simply hand over a family member just because they now had a lot of holy magic within them. He said that the king would surely understand this if he knew how they had lived so far. El recounted the tragic past of his sister Serna, who led a terrible life as a slave until he and his mother took her in. He also explained to the king that his mother would not accept that her daughter should lead the life of a saint. Despite hearing the story, King Liedolf reiterated that on the other side was the Holy Kingdom, a powerful nation with countless holy soldiers who were so strong that even an empire would struggle to contend with them. Even El, who was on the seventh level of magic, should not have an easy task with them. El shouted down to the ground that even if that were the case, he would definitely not give up and had the confidence to protect his sister. He looked up and said that if he couldn't protect someone close to him, he couldn't consider that person part of his family either. The king was surprised by El's commitment to protect his sister. El continued by asking if he could pose a question to the king and requested that the king maintain a neutral standpoint until the issue was resolved. The king asked if that was all, to which El responded with a simple yes. He explained that if the king took a neutral standpoint, he could promise not to engage in any conflict with the Holy Kingdom and that he would overcome the difficulties. The king understood this and was also cautious not to reveal the location of El's magic tower. As the king spoke further, El listened attentively. The king mentioned that from the kingdom's perspective, they couldn't ignore a search request from the Holy Kingdom, and it wasn't easy to find a time-related solution to the magic tower. El responded that he was aware of this problem and that unfortunately, if the Holy Kingdom searched thoroughly, they would find it sooner or later. However, according to his calculations, this should take at least another month, and he was determined to solve the issues by then. The king understood and concluded by asking El to remember that he was a valuable ally of his kingdom. Even if the king couldn't directly support him now, he hoped that El would be safe. El thanked him deeply touched that someone other than his family would be concerned about him. After bidding farewell to the king, who disappeared from the mirror, El turned around and walked to a large window in his room. He opened it and looked down at the city he had built. Clenching his fist, he reaffirmed what he truly wanted and what his current goals were. As the city sparkled in the radiant sunlight, El more than ever wanted to protect his family and those who were important to him, no matter the cost. The priest who had informed the king that a new saint was born in his kingdom made his way to Rowlan's estate to continue the search for his saint. Rowlan and the priest were in a room, and Rowlan apologized for keeping him waiting. They sat across from each other at a large round table where El had previously sat with his family. Rowlan warmly welcomed the priest, 
expressing that it was an honor to receive him as the Countess of the Luvius family. She added that she had heard he had a long journey and hoped it hadn't been too strenuous. The priest, leaning on the table in front of him, explained to her that he had been traveling for a month. At the same time, he thought about having a good feeling regarding the guide the king had provided for him. He recalled how the guide told him that the village he was looking for was in this direction, pointing in that direction. However, the priest doubted and asked the guide if this was indeed the right direction, actually thinking he had to go in the opposite direction. The guide assured him, though, that his direction was the correct one, as he was born and raised in this kingdom and knew it better than anyone else. The guide emphasized that he could trust him, and he would lead the priest in the right direction to the saint. As the priest continued to ponder, he concluded that his doubts were unfounded since the guide had led him to this estate and was personally endorsed by the king. Raulan politely inquired about the reason the priest would visit one of the pillars of the holy kingdom. The priest explained that she must have already heard about it and that he was currently in search of the saint who must be present in the Tolian kingdom. He added that he would be very grateful if they could assist him. Raulan said that she would be more than willing to contribute in any way to help find the saint. The priest explained to her that the oracle had mentioned the saint being in a place overflowing with magic and that this place was also situated on a plateau, where the surroundings might be somewhat unpleasant. He asked Raulan if she had any idea where such a place could be. Raulan thought for a moment and told the priest that the environment they were in was permeated with a significant amount of magic everywhere making it not particularly safe. Upon hearing this, the priest became more specific and directly asked if she was aware of the rumors about a new magic tower being constructed in the area. However, Rowland pretended not to know exactly where the magic tower was and explained that she had only heard rumors about it herself. The priest became more curious and continued to question Rowland. He told her that he had already searched the surroundings but hadn't found it yet. He speculated that the tower might be near the Manticore Gorge. Rowland's act weakened slightly, and she began to feel a bit nervous upon hearing the words, Manticore Gorge. She told the priest that under no circumstances should he venture alone to such a dangerous place, as he would undoubtedly find nothing there. However, the priest, recognizing Rowland's charade, asked her if it wasn't strange that despite being in the area for a month, he hadn't come across such a monster even once. He questioned whether it might be possible that all the monsters had miraculously disappeared for some reason. Rowland was shocked, and in the face of the priest's discovery, she couldn't provide a direct answer. She continued to play along and told the high priest that it was just because he was lucky and truly talented. She explained that it was surely because he left his divine power and used and needed to overwhelm the monsters around him, forcing them to flee early. The grin gradually forming on the priest's lips widened. However, he too understood the art of acting and didn't show anything. He put a hand behind his head, thanked his goddess, and told Rowland that he felt a bit embarrassed that she thought so highly of him when he probably just had luck. Then he stood up, informed her that his inquiry would conclude here, and declared that he would now explore the wild areas around Linda's territory himself. He apologized for taking up her time and continued on his way with the royal guide. When the guide asked where they were going, the priest explained that the saint could be found in the magic tower in the Manticore Gorge. With his goal so close in mind, greed reflected on his face, eager to finally locate the saint of his church. He was confident that they now knew the approximate location, and it would be easy to track her down. The priest reiterated to the guide that finding the saint was their ultimate mission, one they must successfully accomplish under all circumstances. As the two headed towards the Manticore Gorge, Rowland watched him from the window. She had to admit that her acting was obvious, but she was still happy that her plan worked, and the priest reacted just as she wanted. She turned around, glad that her part of luring the priest into the Manticore Gorge and then finding him was successfully completed. She hoped El was equally successful with his plan as she was with hers. The priest mobilized his followers in the vicinity and set out with them towards the tower. One of the followers pointed out that there were no monsters in sight for miles. But they should still not neglect their cover. 
The priest, in response to one of his followers asking why someone would build a tower in such a place, replied, telling his follower that the tower master constructing a tower here must either be a giant idiot or a ludicrous daredevil. He, however, didn't care as long as they could successfully complete the mission. When the group arrived at a small rocky cliff, the high priest proclaimed that he believed this to be the entrance and that the tower would be behind this wall. He concluded by giving his people permission to kill anyone who dared to rebel. L, who overheard this, told him that it was not a nice gesture and how terrible the priest's statement was. Additionally, he asked if the servants of the god should really be so cruel. L then made it clear to him that they should treat ordinary people as kindly as they treat their own god. The priest, who was at the bottom of the cliff, did not know that L was the tower master and asked who L actually was. However, L smiled and said that he would ask him the same question and why people from the Holy Land would come into his land without permission. The priest was surprised and asked him if he heard correctly that the land belonged to him. Suddenly, the priest understood the meaning of L's words and widened his eyes. Looking up at L, he asked if he was the golden master of the tower. Again, L laughed and mockingly asked the priest what would happen if he were. Incredulously, the priest did not understand the situation he was in and could only think about whether it was even possible for someone so young to be the master of a tower. He immediately thought of rumors that a young magician was responsible for significant losses suffered by the Einhardt family from the Blyard kingdom. According to the rumors, a young magician titled as a genius had the ability to elevate a golem to the rank of a grandmaster level knight and, together with this golem, fight his enemies as a seventh level magician. He wondered if the person in the rumors was coincidentally the same person who had created a magical tower here. Suddenly, the priest's demeanor changed, and he politely asked El if he could ask him something. He explained his situation, mentioning that he had come from far away from the Holy Kingdom to find the saint and asked if this saint would be in the magic tower. El's facial expression changed, and he became serious. He explained to the priest that the saint was here and under his protection. The priest was very pleased to hear this news and finally find the saint. However, when El informed him that he would not surrender the saint, his expression changed again. With wide open eyes, he asked El what that would mean. El explained to him that the saint was his fiancé. This shocked the priest once again. The priest couldn't believe that the saint, considered the noblest and purest of all beings in the world, would be in any way associated with the opposite gender. Accordingly, the priest became angry and refused to believe El's statement. He shouted out that this would never happen, and he would do everything to prevent it. The priest pointed at El and told his followers that even if El were truly a seventh-level magician, he couldn't bypass the anti-magic spell of the holy armor, and he should attack the saint. The priest then commanded his followers to start and bring back the saint by all means. His followers raised their fists and were determined to carry out this task in the name of the deity. El just shook his head, expecting such behavior from the Holy Church. He knew people would react this way if he announced that the saint had a fiancé. El conjured a small black hole beneath him and reappeared in front of the priests and his followers through another black hole. The priest angrily asked how El dared to appear before him in such an arrogant manner. Immediately, he ordered his followers to attack El, and they all rushed at El, who stood unarmed with his hands down. However, before they could get even a few meters closer, a magical circle began to glow green beneath them, and red flashes shot up. This made El laugh again. While the priests were bound within the magical green circle of El, he raised his hand forward and conjured his powerful spell, Black Mist. Instantly, the enchanted spell flew towards the group of priests, who were unaware of what was happening. They were immediately enveloped in a dark cloud of mist and could see nothing. The leader of the priests turned to his followers and asked what kind of mist it was. His disciples also looked down, confused, and asked you as well about the nature of this magic, as they had never seen anything like it before. The leader of the priests believed it to be a trap set by the tower master. He angrily questioned why his subordinates had not taken action against this black mist and ordered them to use their anti-magic abilities immediately. 
one of the disciples accepted the command and stated that they should not forget their mission. Subsequently, all the priests raised their hands to the sky and cast their enchanting light, creating an aura of light that gradually fought and dispelled the black mist of El. El was pleased that the priests had the idea to combat his darkness with light but wanted to engage in a more serious battle and demonstrate the true power of his dark mist to the priests. El raised his hand to the sky again and conjured his black mist once more, this time in a much stronger version. The light created by the priests to combat the black mist instantly extinguished, and a large black pillar of darkness rose instead. As a result, the priests were once again drawn into the darkness. Some of the priests pulled into the black mist by El were seasoned magicians who had mastered magic but could do nothing against the magic that blocked their senses. El reached into his pocket, pulled out a small pair of glasses, put them on, and smilingly stepped into the darkness as well. The black mist caused the holy knights to lose all their senses and become instantly confused. The priests recognized their situation and the fact that they could not rely on their senses but were reluctant to simply retreat. One of the stronger priests turned to his comrades and told them not to fear panic, as they were in an illusion. He also ordered them to pull themselves together and activate the blessing of light once again. The priests tried once more to raise their hands and cast the spell. Initially, it seemed as if the spell would take effect again, dispelling the darkness just like the first time. However, this time, the priests visibly struggled to maintain their spell. One of the priests asked their leader why he wouldn't support them and why their holiness wouldn't also apply the blessing. They increasingly had difficulty sustaining the spell and were thus struggling in the battle. Eventually, they had to concede, lacking the strength to cast the spell. One by one, the priests faced this difficulty. Desperately waiting for their leader, the archpriest Bolak, to come to their aid. Meanwhile, on the other side of the magical tower, El's soldiers, whom he had met while saving the village, were already waiting for their deployment. They impatiently looked towards the city, anticipating El's return. Captain Miter told his comrades that El would return any moment now, bringing an end to their wait. Immediately afterward, a voice announced that she was back. The soldiers turned their gaze to El, who was carrying one of the priests on his shoulders, it was the leader, Bolak. El tossed the unconscious Bolak to the ground. Miter asked his master if he was the one after his sister, the holy mistress, and then if they should take care of him. El looked down sadly and told his soldiers to observe everything for the time being. The entire group of soldiers then knelt down, assuring their master that they understood this instruction. Furthermore, they pledged obedience to El's will, regardless of what might come. This surprised El immediately, as he hadn't expected such a reaction. Seeing the disbelief on his face, one of the soldiers explained that he had heard correctly and that they would swear eternal loyalty to him. However, this soldier also asked El something that puzzled him. He looked at El and asked if they could then win, as he had in mind that they would rise against the Holy Kingdom if they continued to try to hide and protect the Holy One from them. However, El just smiled and said that they could certainly win this battle, as he has no intention of losing, and losing is something he wouldn't know. He then raised his right hand, moved it a few times in the air, and magically made a few glasses and a pair of handcuffs rain from nowhere in front of the soldiers on the ground. He handed the items to his soldiers and explained that these were artifacts that, when worn, could neutralize the effect of his black mist. Additionally, he explained that the handcuffs could seal the power of holy magic. When Captain Miter received the bag of artifacts and the explanation, he was completely surprised. El instructed him to use these items to capture the remaining knights of the Holy Kingdom still within his black mist. El further explained that once these handcuffs were applied, the warriors would have only the strength of an ordinary man. Equipped with El's artifacts, the soldiers set off and prepared to carry out the mission. Everyone was highly motivated and entered the midst of the black mist. In the midst of the fog, the soldiers could see the silhouettes of the enemy knights. They were completely exhausted on the ground and had no idea where they were. It came as a bolt from the blue to the enemy soldiers when they were suddenly apprehended by the soldiers on El's side. 
They cursed but still couldn't do anything as they were in the midst of the mist. Even when a desperate enemy soldier mustered all his remaining strength and tried to launch an attack by blindly rushing forward, he was immediately stopped and dispatched by Captain Mitre. He went down, visibly angry, biting his teeth and cursing. He could barely keep his eyes open and saw Captain Mitre placing the handcuffs on his hands. He knew he couldn't give up here but had no strength left to keep his eyes open. When Captain Mitre and his soldiers finished capturing all the men from the Holy Kingdom, he handed them over to L. L explained to Captain Mitre that he was just glad that everything had proceeded without further complications. Additionally, L instructed Captain Mitre that he should treat the captured knights as carefully and gently as possible, ensuring that they did not get injured. L was aware that the real war was about to begin, and he knew that the Holy Kingdom would not remain idle if their soldiers were captured. Two weeks had passed since then, and by now, the Holy Kingdom had learned that their soldiers had been captured. As a consequence, there was a meeting to discuss the next steps. The high authorities of the kingdom sat in a beautiful, large white chapel at a round table, directly in front of an altar. The eldest priest informed his subordinates that two weeks had passed since Archpriest Bolak had set out for the village of the Manticore Kingdom. They had had no contact with the troops since then, and he knew something must be wrong if there had been no contact for so long. The other priests at the table whispered and speculated about what might have happened. One of them openly said that due to the worries he had, he could hardly rest, let alone sleep, and he hoped nothing terrible had happened to his friend. The elder priest said that according to the last message he received, a new magical tower had appeared in the territory he wanted to scout, and it seemed that the tower master had taken the Holy One into custody. The remaining priests at the table were suddenly astonished and desperately repeated their leader's words. He confirmed his statement but had to admit they didn't know how accurate the information was. Nevertheless, those were the last words he had received. One of the priests said that regardless of the circumstances, the fact remained that people from the Holy Kingdom were currently missing. He came up with the idea of sending a search party and asked what the other priests thought. Subsequently, a heart priest stood up and asked his master for permission to speak. The elder chief priest simply nodded, indicating to the younger one that he had the right to speak. The younger priest explained to the gathered priests that the current situation was not an easy matter. He emphasized once again that if a saint were to appear after hundreds of years, it must be the plan of a great deity they had heard and directly led them to the saint. Since this was a fact, they should put all efforts into carrying out the divine will. Therefore, he considered his colleague's proposal to send a search party inappropriate. The other priests at the table were taken aback, surprised that one of their own was taking the lead. The priest continued and suggested sending one of the holy knights with the silver cross. Even his master was astonished and wore an incredulous expression. He asked if he meant Duke Dyard. Duke Dyard and the Knights of the Silver Cross constituted about 30% of the royal army of the Holy Kingdom and possessed immense strength. Additionally, Dyard was one of the Grand Masters on the continent, capable of defeating dozens of sword masters in a single battle. He was the pride of the kingdom and its most formidable weapon. After the elder chief priest regained his composure, he inquired about the other's thoughts on the idea of sending Duke Dyard. A few priests immediately agreed, wanting to set an example. They intended to demonstrate the strength of their kingdom and show that it was not worthwhile to fight against them. Once the senior high priest received agreement from the others, he slammed both hands on the table and gave the command to gather Duke Dyard and the Knights of the Silver Cross and set them in motion. The greed to soon have the saint in their hands filled his face, and the order to unleash the Holy Kingdom's military force heightened his emotions and anticipation even more. However, not satisfied with this, he also announced that various heart priests should accompany Duke to support him. This statement once again shocked some of the priests at the table who did not understand why the entire military force would be sent at once. The elder priest explained that the saint, now in his custody, possessed great power, and they would have to directly shatter this immense power this time to save the saint. 
the priests at the table were just as enthusiastic as their master and understood the intention. To make it clear to everyone once again, the elder priest reiterated that they must demonstrate the strength of the holy kingdom in this attack. He raised his hand up to the sky and declared that whoever withdrew sealed their own doom. In response, all the other priests at the table bowed, placed their hands on their chests, and began to pray. While the priests of the Holy Kingdom contemplated their next steps, El spent his time seeking out his good friend Dibel. El told Dibel the whole story, leaving him quite astonished and disbelieving of what he had just heard. Self-satisfied, El smiled and was surprised that Dibel was surprised. Dibel couldn't believe that El had the saint in his custody and was also holding the priests of the Holy Kingdom hostage. He asked what El planned to do next. But El just smiled. Dibel couldn't fathom the whole situation and slapped himself in the face. He asked El what he was planning and what the whole thing meant. And why he would make the Holy Kingdom an enemy when one usually tries to avoid any conflict with them. El set down his teacup and told Dibel that unfortunately, this situation was necessary, and he wouldn't allow his beloved sister to be taken away by the Holy Kingdom. With anger in his eyes and determination, he told El that he wouldn't just sit idly by if someone tried to take something important away from him, in this case, the Holy Kingdom. Dibel wanted to know again what El's exact plans were. El knew that the Holy Kingdom would now reorganize its military force and subsequently send another troop to attack him. Folding his hands together, El explained to Dibel that if it came to that, he would try to negotiate with them and had no intention of relying solely on violence. Dibel then asked El if he had an alternative plan. El made it clear, however, that he still had hostages in his control, and this would be a good reason for the other side to comply with his demands, rendering the need for another plan unnecessary. Dibel sighed and explained to El that it didn't seem like he was involved in this plan and, frankly, he didn't want to be. Even though Dibel didn't want to be directly involved, he told El that he would be willing to do something behind the scenes if asked. El explained to Dibel that this was precisely why he had come and wanted to ask him for a favor. He said that now, with hostages in their possession, they needed to provide for more people, and he wanted Dibel to organize more food. Additionally, El told Dibel that he should slowly start cutting off the supply of manticore blood. Shocked by this request, Dibel asked why he should stop the supply of manticore blood. El just smiled and explained that he had his reasons, upon which Dibel understood and intended to follow the instructions given to him. Meanwhile, in the Holy Kingdom, preparations were progressing quite swiftly. The Silver Cross Knights were always ready for battle, so the preparations only took three days, plus an additional two days for the Duke to prepare for this war. The Duke had long dark brown hair and, like the other knights, wore armor. The elder priest thanked him once again for the prompt appearance and explained that the saint was entrusted to him, to which the duke assured him that he would do his best to carry out this mission successfully. The elder priest also mentioned that the mission the duke and the knights were to carry out was of crucial importance. However, he also stated that the task of the three high priests was equally important and not easy to accomplish. He hoped that everyone would return safely without suffering significant harm. The three priests accompanying the duke and the knights to support them understood the command, thanked their leader, and assured him that he could trust them, and they would successfully complete the mission of rescuing their comrades and bringing back the saint. When the tasks were clearly assigned by the high priest, Duke Dyard stepped forward and cast his teleportation spell. Behind him, a magical circle appeared, and the air around him and his knights began to circulate and glow strongly. The entire square became brighter and windier. Duke Dyard and his knight's destination was the Methane Plain, located between the Manticore Valley and the mountainous region of Count Rubius. More precisely, it was the original part of Count Rubius's territory, which eventually became known as the Abandoned Plain due to the Manticores streaming from the valley. Duke Dyard made it clear to his Silver Cross knights that their missing comrades were fine until they entered the Manticore Gorge. Therefore, he didn't want to waste any time and planned to proceed directly to the Manticore Gorge without pause. The captain of the knights confirmed the orders, and together with Duke Dyard, 
they all raised their fists to the sky and shouted for their deity. With determination, they marched towards the Manticore Gorge. Upon reaching the entrance of the Manticore Gorge, a misty atmosphere prevailed. Duke Dyard recognized that this fog and the nature of the surroundings acted like a natural fortress, preventing them from attacking. The captain of the night suggested sending some paladins into the village first to explore and gather intelligence. Duke Dyard liked the idea and agreed. The captain of the knights immediately turned around to send some of his men, while he himself would wait here. Six master-level paladins and fifteen regular paladins were sent for reconnaissance, but no matter how much time passed, none of them returned. In disbelief, the captain wondered what was happening and why his men didn't come back. Duke Dyard realized that the fog surrounding them possessed an unusual power. To find out what was going on, he decided to go in himself and investigate. Just as he was about to set off, the captain followed him like a small dog, warning that it could be dangerous even for a grandmaster. Duke Dyard simply turned to the remaining knights and commanded them to follow him very carefully and step by step. He then asked if they all understood. The knights confirmed with a, yes, sir, and followed him. The further Duke Dyard went into the mist with his troop, the harder it became, even for him, to see his hand in front of his face. He moved like a blind man, step by step forward, hands in front of his body to make sure he wouldn't suddenly run into a rock. Suddenly, Duke Dyard was startled and turned around. He realized he had lost his comrades and loudly called out where his knights had gone. He drew his weapon, shaped like a hammer, from his back and wanted to dispel the fog first while calling the name of his deity. With full force, Duke Dyard slammed the hammer on the ground in front of him, creating a very large shockwave that surrounded him and displaced the mist. As the fog gradually cleared, El's golden magical tower and the scattered city appeared. Duke Dyard was completely surprised by what he saw and didn't want to believe it at first. He looked at the city in front of him and couldn't believe that something like this would exist in the Manticore Gorge. From the background, there was a faint cursing, and someone said that it had to come to this and there was no other choice. Duke Dyard heard this and turned around instantly. He saw his men wandering around confused like zombies. Shocked and unbelieving, he looked at his knights and wondered what on earth was happening. The voice that had just cursed regretfully explained that he couldn't get rid of the fog so quickly and that it would have been nicer if he had wasted some time with them. Duke Dyard then turned around again to identify the owner of this voice. He saw El standing there, already waiting for him. El smiled and explained that he seemed to have missed the opportunity to capture the Silver Cross Knights and the three High Priests, and that Duke Dyard appeared to be one of the Grand Masters. Duke Dyard didn't know what was happening and looked somewhat confused, holding his weapon in one hand. El bowed politely, greeted him, introduced himself, and explained that he was the new Power Master of the Golden Tower. Angrily, Duke Dyard asked El if he had created this mist which he confirmed with a smile. El explained that Duke Dyard and his knights probably hadn't come out of goodwill, and there was nothing wrong with wanting to defend oneself. Duke Dyard became somewhat angry, muttering and grinding his teeth. However, El didn't let it go unnoticed and provoked him by asking how long he would keep staring at him so angrily. Duke Dyard admitted that their intention was not solely one of goodwill. He wanted to be honest and directly asked El if he was the one holding the sanctity captive. El just smiled and explained that it seemed that way. Duke Dyard then got angry and shouted at El, veins becoming visible on his forehead. El explained that the person bearing the name of sanctity was a member of his family, and he couldn't care less about the title of sanctity. Duke Dyard said he could understand, but tried to explain to El that a family member was still their sanctity and ordinary people couldn't rebel against the will of God. El raised his voice, asking Duke Dyard what exactly the will of God was and what mere mortals were. However, Duke Dyard ignored El's question, stating that one didn't have to submit to the fate of the gods in the end, one had to ripen it with some violence. He raised his hammer into the air, infusing it with some of his aura, turning the hammer a golden color. Seeing this, 
L had to admit that this little spectacle was quite impressive. However, he also had a golden secret weapon, so he summoned his golden knight golem, which came running at high speed and charged directly at Duke Dyer to tackle him head on. Thanks to the force of the golem, Duke Dyer was pushed backward but managed to fend off the attack and avoid direct damage. L then raised a small orb to the sky and invoked his spell, Pleiades. Then a large golden arrow appeared above L, ready to fly directly towards Duke Dyer and pierce him. The arrow that L conjured immediately shot towards Duke Dyer. However, Duke Dyer saw the attack coming, managed to swing his own golden hammer at the last moment. Deflecting L's arrow by knocking it down in the nick of time, and it fell at his feet on the ground. Even though Duke Dyer had successfully defended against L's attack, he had to acknowledge that there was a tremendous power behind the assault. However, L just stood there and arrogantly stated that he only intended to scare Duke Dyer a bit and hadn't expected him to be so frightened by a simple attack. Duke Dyer turned to his knights and asked them if they were just going to stand there or if they intended to join the fight. The knights, grouped in a light blue formation, explained that they couldn't move anymore, as there seemed to be a barrier around them. This surprised Duke Dyer, who had not noticed it before, and made him angrier. However, L explained to him that this barrier was to prevent the small fry from getting accidentally hurt. Additionally, L pointed to a rock ledge and told Duke Dyer that the fifty knights he had sent earlier had also received not a single scratch. Furious, Duke Dyer turned to L and complained about the audacity of this situation. L then said that he sounded like an old man. When Duke Dyer heard L calling him an old man, he became even angrier, his eyes reddened, and the vein on his forehead became more visible. Grumbling with the knights behind him, he just stared at L, who explained that, as Duke Dyer could currently see, there was no one there to help him. L also mentioned that the panic Duke Dyer was experiencing was visibly apparent and that this panic would make him sad. He explained that this was the price the reactions to the actions of the Holy Kingdom brought with them. Duke Dyer repeated the question about what he meant by the price and said that L would be the one to pay it soon. However, when L said, would it really come to that? Duke Dyer became even angrier. L smiled, raised his index finger to his mouth, and asked what he would think of a little bet. Duke Dyer asked what L intended with a bet, to which he explained that the golem that had attacked him, his masterpiece. The Golden Knight, was on the same level as a Grandmaster in terms of abilities. L laid out the terms of the bet, stating that in the case of his victory, his people would be released, while in the case of the golem's victory, Duke Dyer himself would become one of his prisoners. Duke Dyer burst into laughter, loudly declaring it to be ridiculous. Filled with confidence and arrogance, he found the idea amusing that he could become a prisoner himself, asking if he was allowed to shatter the golem L was so proud of into a thousand pieces. L just smiled and said that before he thought about that, Duke Dyer should worry about his own life first. Duke Dyer, unwilling to waste any time, immediately launched an attack. He raised his golden hammer once again, swirling it in the air, releasing such tremendous energy that even L had to shield his face with his hand. Duke Dyer could no longer restrain his bloodlust and eagerness for battle, his face displaying a visible grin of joy and the desire for revenge. L raised his hand forward and commanded Tana to destroy the target. Tana identified the target and confirmed the destruction order. Without wasting time, she drew her sword and took the fight seriously. Tana struck directly forward with her sword, interrupting Duke Dyer's swirling. The two intense attacks collided, kicking up a lot of dust. Tana managed to dodge the subsequent attacks. But her own attacks were also repeatedly blocked. Duke Dyer wanted to unleash another massive attack, and once again, the Duke's hammer and Tana's sword clashed. The knights in L's blue barriers couldn't believe what they were seeing. They were utterly astonished that their leader was fighting someone equally strong. Even Duke Dyer had to admit that L's golem was extremely impressive. And that the power of the golem was indeed comparable to that of a grandmaster. However, this only made Duke Dyer angrier, and his grip on his weapon tightened. 
He hurled his golden hammer upward again, letting out a loud scream, causing his golden hammer to shine brightly. Even the soldiers wondered what was suddenly happening. The hammer began to shed its outermost golden layer. L, also blinded by the light, wondered what was happening. As the golden layer of the hammer fell off, a slightly darker, black hammer emerged. This was a sacred relic named the Divine Hammer that destroys evil. It was one of the three sacred relics, housing immense authority incapable of annihilating anything not divine. L was speechless, and for the first time, he was genuinely amazed by an unforeseen turn of events. Duke Dyard was surprised that L had immediately recognized his weapon and praised him for having sharp eyes. He also explained that he didn't want to use this weapon unless it was absolutely necessary. L recognized the critical situation he was in and had to quickly come up with a new plan. Even the Knights of the Silver Cross had never seen this weapon, or rather, this sacred relic of the divine, and were amazed by the tremendous power it emanated. On the continent, there are three types of sacred relics, the three great sacred relics, the five great sacred swords, and the five great demons, considered the strongest forces on the continent. This includes the divine hammer that destroys evil, which harbors immense authority to eradicate anything non-divine. L realized that this hammer was created to neutralize an aura blade and make the magic of a seventh-class magician disappear without a trace. Duke Dyard whirled his hammer in the air again and told L that the fact he had compelled him to use this weapon was an acknowledgement of his strength. However, Duke Dyard also said, as he approached L and his golem, that this was now the end. He attacked Tana with his hammer, but she managed to evade at the last moment, avoiding a direct hit. Yet, one could distinctly feel that, although a direct hit hadn't occurred, the aura of the hammer had changed, and the hammer had unleashed its true power. Due to Duke Dyard's attack, a small crater had now formed on the battlefield, and L had to once again acknowledge the incredible strength of Duke Dyard and the hammer. However, Duke Dyard wasn't giving L's golem time to rest, he yelled and went straight into the next attack. As a precautionary measure, Tana instinctively withdrew upon hearing Duke Dyard shout. He was visibly pleased that the golem showed such fear and retreated with a simple shout. Duke Dyard found it admirable to believe that Tana could still contend with him in a fight and asked El what he would do now since this was the last chance he had. Once again, Duke Dyard prepared for an attack, leaped into the air, and was about to deliver a final blow to Tana. El commanded Tana to dodge, and she did, narrowly escaping the devastating attack. Duke Dyard's attack dislodged many smaller rocks in the vicinity, sending them flying. Amidst the chaos and the golem still in a defensive stance, El issued the command to create more distance. Tana transitioned into long-range mode, and El confirmed the command. Green energy salvos from Tana now targeted Duke Dyard, who easily blocked them. Duke Dyard then prepared to counterattack with his hammer, swung it powerfully once, and threw it towards El. Seeing this, El had to admit that he had once again underestimated Duke Dyard, closed his eyes, and reluctantly stated that, since Duke Dyard had played dirty, he would do the same. L extended his hand forward, causing Tana to vanish. Duke Dyard turned around, diverting his attention from L, and asked her the golden golem had gone. However, Tana reappeared behind Duke Dyard, who turned once again. He wondered if it was magic. L explained that this was his trump card, never expecting Duke Dyer to bring out a divine war hammer. This infuriated Duke Dyer again, and he wanted to give it his all and land a direct hit this time. However, L suggested they should end this fight here, as it was pointless to continue. L contemplated that it wouldn't be easy to overpower Duke, considering he possessed a holy relic and seemed capable of easily keeping up with and even overwhelming Tana, despite her being in the last mode. Duke Dyard remarked to L that he remained arrogant to the end. In response, L displayed goodwill, stating that he would release Duke Dyard's people and ensure they were without major injuries. He also released the second barrier holding the first fifty people he had captured. Duke Dyard immediately commanded the leader of the Silver Cross Knights to take care of everything. Which the leader promptly executed. Subsequently, 
Duke Dyard asked El if he had another priest named Bolak, as the knights were out in the world. However, El, who had already shown goodwill with the release, this time stated that he wouldn't reveal this fact. Duke Dyard then expressed his frustration, stating that he would curse the sly grin on El's face. El casually asked why Duke Dyard would get so angry over a simple smile, to which Duke Dyard shouted at El's face that while he might go home empty-handed this time, he would make sure to take the saint with him next time. As Duke Dyard turned away, El remarked that it wouldn't be an easy task. While Duke Dyard and the Silver Cross Knights slowly walked away, El watched them and concluded that he needed a weapon that could match the saint. At the headquarters of the Silver Cross Knights, they took a short break, and everyone appeared visibly exhausted. The leader of the knights recognized that his subordinates were physically sound but lacked strength, likely suffering from internal injuries. Duke Dyard acknowledged that he was dealing with a formidable opponent. Meanwhile, the commander of the knights explained that it would take at least a month to heal the internal injuries and return to their original strength. This news infuriated Duke Dyard. He gnashed his teeth once again, and personally, I'm now afraid they might explode in his head. Meanwhile, in the desert realm of Dezek, one of the five great realms, at the temple of the Reynard goddess sect, the largest holy site, a significant incident occurred. Recently, the Reynard temple received a massive supply of manticore blood via the Jebel trading post. The priests processed this blood into potions, yielding tremendous profits. Archbishop Bolak, who ordered this, gained massive support within the sect. But now, as the regular supply of manticore blood suddenly became scarce, Archbishop Bolak found himself in an unexpected dilemma. When someone informed the Archbishop that the quantity of manticore blood was diminishing, he naturally panicked. He wanted to know why the blood supply was reaching its limits and urgently wanted to talk to Dybul about it. When he arrived at Dybul's shop, the two sat at a table and drank tea. However, the Archbishop didn't want to waste time and directly wanted to learn the reasons behind the drastic reduction in manticore blood supply. Dybul remained calm, telling the Archbishop that there was no need to panic and that he should have some of his tea to calm down. Smiling, Dybul mentioned that the tea was really excellent. The Archbishop attempted to compose himself and took a sip of the tea. While blowing on it as it was still very hot, he asked again if Dybul could tell him the reason for the delivery failures. Dybul explained that the truth was that there had been a few complications. Curious, the archbishop inquired about the complications and what might have caused them. Dybul adjusted his glasses, which hung on a golden chain around his neck, and said that it was a secret that couldn't be easily disclosed. The archbishop then asked Dybul if they had secrets from each other, emphasizing that they were in this together. Dybul said that if the archbishop could promise to keep the secret, he would tell him. As the archbishop was naturally cornered, he stated that, of course, he could keep this secret and wanted to hear Dybul's secret. Dybul said that the Reynard Temple would never receive manticore blood again. However, the archbishop deemed this impossible and pleaded with Dybul to lie to him. Dybul assured him that he wouldn't lie and explained the situation. He clarified that the blood he had came from the Manticore Gorge, owned by a seventh-class mage who had settled there. Dybul further explained that he captured the Manticores there and extracted their blood. The Archbishop listened intently. Dybul elaborated that he had a contract with the Tower Master, who was responsible for the blood supply across the entire continent. Additionally, Dybul informed the Archbishop that this Tower Master had recently gotten involved in some problems. Naturally, the archbishop wanted to know what problems the tower master had encountered. Leaning over to the archbishop, Dybul whispered in his ear that the tower master, by settling there, had accepted the protection of the Holy Virgin. When the archbishop learned about the protection the tower master had taken, he was shocked. Even with the explanation that this conflict between the tower master and the Holy Kingdom could escalate further, the archbishop had to swallow hard and didn't know what to do. Dybul asked if this event wasn't so unusual that it was almost unbelievable. The archbishop also found it incredible and couldn't believe it. 
Daibel explained that it was normal to be shocked and that he himself was quite shocked after learning everything. The will of the Holy Kingdom is akin to the will of the goddess Gaia, and when the Holy Kingdom moves, many other nations that believe in the goddess Gaia would follow. This immense power surpasses even that of the other empires. Therefore, the Archbishop was understandably very tense. Once the Archbishop had somewhat composed himself, he turned his gaze back to Dibel and asked what would happen with the blood supply, emphasizing that this was a serious problem. However, Dibel just smiled and said that he was well aware that it was a problem. Curiously, the Archbishop asked if Dibel had found another solution. Dibel explained that there was no reason to worry and mentioned that the Tower Master was more powerful than the Archbishop might think. The Archbishop, taking a sip and wincing at the once too hot tea, rubbed his temples, attempting to calm and relax himself. Dibel expressed his confusion about why the Archbishop had such great fear of the Holy Kingdom and questioned whether the Church of his deity was not an influential force as well. The Archbishop, stating he didn't fully understand due to lacking details, emphasized that the Holy Kingdom was much more potent than his church. Dibel clapped his hands and proposed the idea of the Archbishop's church joining forces with them. The Archbishop's gaze shifted towards Dibel, who then questioned if the Reynard church was just one among many. Raising his hand, Dibel asked if there weren't five major churches in the vast kingdom. The Archbishop acknowledged this, and in that moment, he contemplated whether uniting the churches could be a possibility to oppose the Holy Kingdom. Dibel realized that his plan to plant the idea of uniting the churches had succeeded. The Archbishop stated he understood and that he would immediately report to the Grand Chancellor to initiate the plan. Dibel added that if everything went smoothly, he would supply Reynard with 150,000 soldiers for the next three months. Upon hearing this, the Archbishop beamed and expressed his gratitude to Dibel. Meanwhile, in the Holy Kingdom of Gaia, the oldest priest slammed his hand on the table once again. He inquired about what in the world had happened. They were holding a conference with other priests, all seated around a large round table, except for the three priests accompanying Duke Dyer. Some priests wondered how this could happen, while others questioned what they could do now. The oldest priest tossed a few papers into the air, asking if they had not all carefully read the message. He couldn't comprehend the fuss over a holy virgin and why they were receiving a warning. He also wondered, along with everyone else at the table, since when they had become so arrogant towards him. Another priest at the table even mentioned that they had cautiously asked the owner of the blue magical tower for support, but he never expected to receive such a response. Another priest, already on the verge of despair, stated that everything was very confusing and wondered why even the dispatched archbishops and paladins remained silent. The oldest priest asked one of the other archbishops, who was also present during the announcement of the prophecy, if he understood why the five great empires were giving such a response. However, he was equally clueless and mentioned that the Holy Virgin could have a positive effect on the five great empires. Another priest agreed with this and suggested that they should also consider the money they could earn with the Holy Virgin and pilgrimages. The priest who was present at the prophecy agreed with his colleague, stating that the kingdom's decision was incomprehensible, no matter how one looked at it. The oldest priest asked what exactly he meant and threw the idea into the room that someone might be pressuring them into this decision. The younger priest explained that this was precisely what he thought, that the five churches in the five great empires might be planning something. After the thoughts were voiced, silence fell. After a few seconds, the oldest priest could not believe that the idea he heard was so plausible, and he asked the others at the table why the five churches would do such a thing. The younger priest said he wasn't sure himself, but one thing was quite clear. The oldest priest wanted to know what that thing was. The younger priest explained that it seemed the five churches were afraid that if they handed over the Holy Virgin, the influence of their church would become even stronger. When the young priest announced his idea, the others couldn't believe it and made a big uproar. The young priest continued, saying that the five churches were probably afraid that if they handed over the Holy Virgin, the power of the goddess Gaia would increase, and therefore, they were trying to exploit this event to their advantage. 
As this idea seemed so logical, even the oldest priest believed, after the explanation of the younger priest, that he had to sit down and digest everything. However, he knew that this idea was not a confirmed action. The oldest priest knew that the five churches owed obedience to the words of the Holy Kingdom. Yet, he also knew that they were secretly distrustful and resistant to these words. A priest at the table suggested that it might be just as the younger priest had explained earlier. He also said that it would be understandable for the five churches to fear that their influence might disappear due to the appearance of the Holy Virgin. Furthermore, he found it very disconcerting that the five great kingdoms hesitated after the Holy Virgin was chosen. The oldest priest also found this fact of hesitation very problematic, and his understanding was no different from his comrades. He then asked the group whether it was actually possible to communicate with Duke Dyard again. At the headquarters of the Silver Cross Knights, Duke Dyard and a few high archpriests, as well as the commander of the knights, were discussing their situation. Duke Dyard looked down at the soldiers still lying on the ground, struggling with their internal injuries. One of the archpriests recognized that the soldiers were in an extremely dangerous situation. Duke Dyard asked the third commander if he had by now informed the Holy Kingdom about their situation. The response was that sending someone was too dangerous, so he had sent a carrier pigeon. This worried Duke Dyard as he had not received a response yet. Suddenly, a bird appeared out of nowhere and landed in the hands of the commander. He was relieved to finally have received a response from the Holy Kingdom. Duke Dyard immediately took the note and was astonished after reading it.